San Francisco is a global capital of innovation and modern technology. But it's a timeless appeal that makes it so unique. While futuristic self-driven cars are already becoming a thing here, the city invented cable cars about 150 years ago. They are still running and they are a national historic landmark. A charming cable car ride up and down the narrow streets is the quintessential San Francisco experience. Now while we get a move on in one of these, every move matters at Shack 15. Magnus Carlsen looking unstoppable in his ride to the finish line. Welcome to the Melwater Champions Chest of Finals. Unbelievable how he finds that move. We've got to call that prank style. He's going to win the tournament. He's going to show the checkmate to us. Wow. He's taken Whoa. it. He's done it. Magnus really looking happy with himself. It's going to be checkmate. Magnus shaking his head. Has, uh, oh, look at the bar. Three seconds. One second. Three seconds. Oh, wow. Whoa, okay, crazy tactics. This is just one of the most yeah. beautiful games I've ever seen. This is a dude of movies and it directs. Wow, he's going straight for the kill. He is out to win this tournament. This is so difficult. Whoa! <gasps> oh. No way! Whoa. Whoa! What is Anish Giri doing here? Oh! He's just given up his night for a pawn. Is this, I mean, either this is genius or it's a mouse slip. Wait, 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 wait. This, this move is doing? breaking the rules. Magnus Carlsen is furious. What is happening? It's a big day for Magnus Carlsen, not only in the Tour Finals, because today the world's number one own official new app is launching. It's called the Magnus Chess Academy, and it is now available for you to download in Apple Store. And uh, you can check more uh, on this new very cool app on uh, Magnus, uh, playmagnus.com. Now for Magnus in the Tour Final, it's going very well, especially after an exciting day four in the Tour Finals. One uh, second, did it make a move? He captures a pawn. The Black Knight did recapture a pawn. White gives a check, but Black's king is safe enough for now. This is one check, but the king is driven actually back where it wants to go, driven back to safety. But now Magnus is going after the White King. Finally, the counterattack begins. Look at the Black Queen. A diagonal has opened up. She wants to jump into G3. That would be a deadly check, leading to checkmate. Giri, all down to a couple of seconds, but it looks like he just resigned or let his clock run out. Giri gives up. Magnus takes the win. Look how many squares these bishops cover, uh, these two pieces alone. They cover all these squares, even though they're sitting on the first rank. He does! Wow. Oh, 
Oh no, actually, um, Anisha's in serious trouble. Yeah, this game over, that pawn is just indefensible. You cannot defend that pawn. And uh, goodness me, it's death by two bishops here. Yeah. It's over, Anish Giri loses the second game as well. Does what? It take takes a pawn. a pawn. It makes no <laughs> logical sense. The only thing I can justify this pawn capture with is maybe later, long term he wants to use his knight on this square, but Black's covering that square with his own knight. Look at Black's pieces, suddenly they're pouring forward. Okay, Black Ooh. has not just one winning move. That's the big shock. Black has three winning moves. Capitulation on the second rank. Breakthrough and checkmate is coming. Okay, everything disappears and... At Magnus. the very end, <laughs> Black's going to be a few pawns up. Yeah, he's so clinical. He's not giving Anish a single chance. And bearing in mind that Anish is in a must-win situation, he's just put that nail in the coffin. Anish throws in the towel and resigns. Day four was just perfect for Magnus Carlsen, who is now in sole lead in the Tour Finals with three days to go and to guide you through all the action coming up as always international master Ivan Kauska and grandmaster David Howell and David how will you rate Magnus's performance so far in the tournament it's simply been top draw especially the last couple of days this is Magnus in top form this is why he's the world number one why he evening as world champion for so long it was a bit of a slow start for him a few blunders here and there but he ground out the wins and he's just built up so much momentum he's going to be hard to stop now yeah but Yamaka, we have seen excitement, turnarounds, ups and downs, both for Magnus and other players in the other majors this mm -hmm. season. So what do you expect from the weekend coming up here? Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of excitement. And you're right, this is where the money rounds start yeah. to kick in because here it's starting to get important. Nerves are going to start jangling. And I'm expecting the players actually to do those slip-ups. Mm. No one can play perfectly 100% of the time. But that is almost what Magnus Carlsen has uh, done, and especially yesterday. Let's take a look at the results from round four. Magnus Carlsen up against a big rival in Ishgiri, but he won three games in a row there, Magnus, to win that match and take all three points after a short day against an Ishgiri. Jan Christoph Duda, he was in shared lead with Magnus heading into day four, but he lost that match to Liam Le yesterday. So he is now three points behind Magnus. Wesley So, that was an exciting match between him and Prague in San Francisco. It ended up with a win for Wesley So and Arjun Ergaisi, scoring his first three points in the tournament, winning the match against Shakriad Mamadiarov. So let's take a look at the standings now, remember, with three matches to play for each of the eight players in the tour finals. Magnus Carlsen with 12 points. That's a perfect score. He has even won seven games in a row now. Magnus Carlsen, so three points behind him. Jan Christoph Duda. What is it about for Duda now, David, to get back in it? Duda has to somehow recover from yesterday. He does have the solace that in the final day, on the final round, he will play Magnus, so he'll have a chance to balance out their head-to-head -head scores there. He'll have a chance to catch up, but he needs to keep pace. If he loses another match, then he knows his fate is out of his own hands and Magnus will be unstoppable. So Duda, yeah, he simply needs to win. And we saw Liam Le on seven points, five points behind Magnus Carlsen. Is there chances for Liam to win the tournament still, Ivanka? Ah, uh, you know, he has to do some more fighting. And in this case, he actually is going to play Magnus Carlsen today. So if he manages to beat Magnus, then there is a chance. Never say never. But of course, the champ, that's, that's the first obstacle to overcome. Yeah. And let's take a look at the matches coming up here on day five in the Tour Finals. It's a very important one for young Christoph Duda. He needs to win now to get back in fighting for tournament victory. He faces Pragnananda sitting in San Francisco. Wesley So coming from a big win yesterday against Prague. Today up against Mamad Yarov, who has been struggling over the last few days. Arjun Eregaisi, he's coming from a match win yesterday. Today playing Anish Giri. We're sitting in San Francisco. We will follow game one between Magnus Carlsen and Liam Le. Liam Le, he is the one that caused the big upset for Duda yesterday. Can he do the same for Magnus today, David? He's capable. There is some history there. Liam has already beaten Magnus in one of the majors of this season here in Oslo. And uh, he will need to repeat that fate. However, his score against Magnus is not great overall. So uh, it's still an uphill challenge. He's still definitely the underdog today. 
What do you expect from that match, Ivanka, with Magnus against Guillaume? Well, I expect Liam to go hard, actually, and uh, play aggressively. The most important thing for Liam is actually to hold his nerve. He has to be calm. He can't let the nerves start to kick off. And, uh, well, Magnus will do what Magnus does best. He's just going to play with harmonious pieces. Mm. And you can always count on Liam Le. He has made it to every single knockout stage in the tournaments he has played this season. And he has come close to winning a couple of tournaments as well. But this last move from Liam, really nice. Liam, he's being ruthless at the moment. Wow, Ooh. Liam has just sacrificed material. Obviously, Liam must be nervous. He knows that uh, if he wins this, he wins the tournament. Wow, Liam, Liam he, uh, he just keeps up playing his uh, fantastically impressive uh, chess. Liam is actually up on material and he's up big time. Ooh, whoa, playing with fire here, so advancing brave. his king. Liam Le wins the match against world champion Magnus Carlsen on a bad day for Magnus. What a great day for Liam Le winning two games here. Such a likeable guy, Liam Le, and that was a huge match win for him. Winning two games against Magnus Carlsen in the Oslo Esports Cup, first major of the season. What happened there, David? Yeah, simply Liam was on fire, but Magnus wasn't at his best. We should mention Magnus was ill, uh, unwell during that matchup. Uh, during the whole tournament there in Oslo, actually, he wasn't 100%. But you still need to be uh, playing superbly well to beat Magnus, even when he's not at his best. And we saw Liam actually play a couple of really perfect games, really nice games to finish Magnus off, showing killer instinct, which is actually quite hard to do against uh, the great, against Magnus. Yeah. He definitely had that killer instinct as well yesterday, Liam, beating Duda, who had a perfect uh, match score heading into that uh, match against Liam. So what is it about Liam's style? What kind of player is he, Ivanka? Uh, he likes uh, aggressive positions. He always starts solidly. He always likes to push pawns. And he's not averse to those complications. So I find his style very refreshing, very exciting. Now, I'm really, really loving how Magnus is going to handle that because Man Magnus tends to meet that with solid play. Yeah. And David uh, did mention that match between Liam and Magnus in the Oslo Esports Cup, which uh, Liam won. With Magnus, uh, he was sick, feeling under the weather. And even if online rapid chess usually is very fast and very fun, sometimes it can be a little slow. This Does is he know very it's strange. Is Magnus Carlsen asleep? No, I, I think he's he must be recalling some variation that he's looked at. I say that and I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> I'm not sure. He can't, he can't have just fallen asleep at the board. I mean, uh, uh, it's been like that for uh, two minutes now. Should we go and give him a shove? Look at the breathing. His hand, okay, the breathing does show. <laughs> Sorry. His hand is in the mouse though. Do you sleep with the hand rested like that? Well, Magnus would. Oh, yeah. It's the most natural position. He couldn't have just yeah. walked in and fallen asleep. But if you're really tired, it's back to oh, oh, No, yeah. but did you see he had that, yeah, yeah. you know, when you wake up? <laughs> yeah, you have that. He was asleep. <laughs> I don't think we've seen that too much. Magnus asleep. Yeah, I mean that's once in a lifetime type of uh, type of scenes for Magnus. Uh, yeah, I mean it's not because the position was boring; it's just because he had uh, some other stuff going on. Uh, I don't think we'll see that today. Magnus looks fresher and determined to win. Definitely, he needs to stay awake to have a chance to beat uh, Liam Le, who is a great chess player. Yesterday, Magnus definitely wasn't asleep. He had a perfect day against Anish Giri, but today Anish is back at Shack 15, ready to uh, give it a go for a match win. Anish, looking forward to playing against Arjun today? Yeah, I didn't really think of the interview or what I'm going to say, but uh, the thing is, yesterday I didn't do the interview, and uh, I think that was the, the bad luck, so I, I decided to just do the interview. But I didn't think of anything smart to say, so... Is that the only reason you're showing up here right That's now? basically why I'm here, so all the, yeah, the best wishes to all the viewers. And... All right, thank you. We'll let you get back to the games then. <laughs> Thanks, good luck. Wesley, you're up against Shark today. Is it fair to call this a clash of styles? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Well, you know, a, a little bit here and a little bit there. Like we have some similarities, but also a lot of differences. Like he generally sticks to his openings with white, with his 1d4 Queen's Gambit. Uh, but at the same time, he's a very uncompromising player. I've actually played 
Mami Yerba many times. I think his prime was back in 2018, where he was number two in the world and reached a rating of 2820. So uh, he's a very strong player. Uh, right now he's gotten uh, a bit older and he's not as strong as he used to be, but he's still a very powerful player. Is it fun to play a creative player like Shakriar Mamadarov? <laughs> yeah, certainly. I actually, I think we're pretty good friends. Like we've got pretty good relations. We played a lot in St. Louis, also in the Grand Chester. We played in the Fisher Random. You know, we had a lot of fun analyzing and talking and uh, you know, he's a, he's a great guy, a great player to be with. We both love chess and, you know, we just both love discussing chess. Uh, at the same time, he's very unpredictable. So I, I can't say exactly for sure what to predict today. Like he lost two matches in a row, which were pretty bad matches for him. Uh, but a different Shaq could show up today. <laughs> we're looking forward to a thrilling match. All the best, Wesley. Thank you. Thank you. Wesley, so one of four players sitting in San Francisco. It's going to be 12 o'clock when they start the first games. In 15 seconds, we're going to follow the first one between tournament leader Magnus Carlsen against Liam Le sitting in St. Louis. It's 2 o'clock for Liam when the games start. 12 o'clock for the players inside Shaq 15. Magnus Carlsen will start out with the white pieces today against Liam. So, Yovanka, what do you expect from game one? Oh, <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely going to set the pace of the whole match. If there's a decisive game, then whoever wins that, that is going to be the favourite. And uh, there we see the players getting ready. And I love the way how Liam always looks so chill. I say that. <laughs> he starts uh, just uh, with his arms in. But he looks ready in uh, that very cool office of his in St. Louis. We have to mention Magnus Carlsen on 12 points. That's a perfect score. He is tournament leader. Five points behind him on seven points is Liam Le. And if Liam wins the match today in the rapid portion to gain three points, he will be on 10 points. Only two points behind Magnus with uh, how many matches to play? Two matches to play after today. <laughs> <laughs> if they go to uh, Blitz tie breaks, if they are tied in the rapid portion, then the winner in tie breaks gets two points, the loser one point. Here we go, this is game one with Magnus and Liam. This is game one and it's a very classical opening from Magnus. None of the free freewheeling, freestyling type of uh, kind of experimental play that we've seen from him throughout the tour this season. It's the Spanish opening and it's not just the Spanish, it's the open Spanish that is indicated by this last move. Black's Knight capturing a pawn in the center and Magnus pauses. Uh, he will have considered this. This is quite a trendy variation nowadays and Liam has played this before as far as I know. But uh, yeah, Magnus, how well has he done his homework? The lines here, the variations tend to be very forcing. Definitely. I can remember Liam playing this when he was in a must-win situation oh. in the Oslo eSports. Mm -hmm. And did he win? No. Ah. It was a draw. Yeah, that was in the final day, uh, yep. in the final round, oh. when Liam, if he had won that game, would have won the whole tournament uh, against Jordan Van Furies that game. That is true. So this is, what, six months ago now, uh, maybe even more, but uh, Liam has played this. Magnus looking out the window, apparently, and uh, he's just trying to recall what he wanted to do. Magnus probably has two or three different ideas against this opening, but which one will be the most surprising for Liam? That's the question he's asking himself. So when Magnus is looking that way, that is recalling, and the other way is uh, yeah. calculating? Normally, if a player looks to the left, that is regarded as uh, memorizing. If you look to the right, that's uh, kind of, that's a new area. That side of the brain tends to be kind of coming up with stuff, creative side. That's so um, cool. At least that's what I've uh, heard. And talking of being creative, this is not the main line. White nearly never goes for this at the top level nowadays, because if you look at what's happened, yes, White has regained the pawn that was sacrificed, but suddenly Black has the bishop pair. And uh, once Black's knight moves away and blocks this central file, Black is rock solid. I'm so surprised at this choice. It feels like Magnus, maybe not expecting this opening, just decided to play it safe. Yeah, I can, I can see that it's not the most popular line, but it has been played before. Um, I've seen that Alexander Grishuk did draw with the white pieces against Grigori Oparin in uh, 2020. But um, this position until the last move kind of looked like another opening, mm -hmm. like the Berlin variation somehow. Yeah. 
Exactly. And uh, compared to those lines of the Berlin, not the end game uh, of the Berlin that we talk about sometimes, but uh, those other lines there, black doesn't have the bishop pair. And here, <laughs> yes, there's a small um, there's a small issue long term with black's pawn structure. There's doubled C pawns, but that is not a factor at the moment. And white has to compensate for the fact that black has those two bishops by playing dynamically, actively and speeding things up. That's what Magnus is doing with this pawn push. I can pretty much guarantee that Liam has not studied this recently, at least. Um, Any time I've looked at the opening, uh, at the open Spanish, uh, I've gone in a different direction. I've never, ever considered this for white, just because it looks relatively unambitious. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, black has actually a whole range of options in this particular position. The most popular move is actually to kick back the white knight, pick up the f pawn, move it one square forward. Another line which actually doesn't score well with black is actually to put the bishop on the f6 square. Uh, alternatively, the bishop can relocate itself to d6. Mm -hmm. But the most, uh, the best variation according to the numbers is actually to attack the knight. Yeah, with the pawn. Yeah, I think all of these three moves, right, they are to do with kicking this knight back or at least trying to exchange it off. Uh, but kicking the knight back it does make a lot of sense. You've got to be 100% uh, sure about these types of moves because you do create weaknesses. White's knight doesn't have too many safe retreats. It will step back most likely to this square. And uh, now suddenly the black knight in the middle of the board is a bit loose. It might get kicked by a pawn. It's, uh, it's still a while before black can feel fully safe. And OK, we do see this position on the board now. And Liam decides to move his rook across. The whole idea is to drop his bishop back perhaps on the next move or move it out of the way. And then the black rook will nicely defend its own knight. Yeah, solid start to this one. Uh, again, I'm not too impressed, I've got to say, from Magnus's opening. I wanted to see something more uncompromising, just something which will challenge black a bit more. But uh, still a lot of life left. Magnus now, he'll bring his knight out, he'll move his queen up somewhere and swing his rook across. And uh, from there, white is still very active with the remaining pieces on the board. Yeah. And we do see Liam retreat, getting ready to bring the black bishop out. Mm -hmm. All right, we have mentioned it is a very big day today for Magnus Carlsen. His very own new official app is launching today, the Magnus Chess Academy. Uh, today only avail available for iOS and an Apple Store. Will be available for Android as well very shortly. But head to playmagnus.com if you want to learn more or to Apple Store and download this very cool app because we will have a challenge for the viewers today. Yeah, we do. We're asking everyone to download the app and play the game Ace in the Sleeve. And you'll start off at level one. And this, of course, you can download this app for free at playmagnus.com. But we want to know how you did yeah. on this particular challenge. Yes. And uh, we do have some surprises in store. But first of all, let's see how you get on before those surprises, yeah. those little secrets get revealed. And remember, tweet us using the hashtag ChessChamps. You know, take a screen grab of yourself playing the, the challenge. Yeah. Show us your scores. Yeah. Tell us what you think. Did you find it easy? Is it hard? We want to know. I tried it. So level one was quite easy. I did that. Uh, I did good at the level one. I was very happy with myself. But there are in total 12 levels. Mm. So we want to know how many levels can you do? What, when do you start really struggling? Test it. It's, it's a super fun way to learn chess. I really loved it. This is a this is definitely an app that you can get hooked on. I bet you as well, David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I had a yeah, if I had iOS, I would <laughs> download it and uh, get hooked. I did actually have the opportunity a few days ago before it was released to try out level 12 and yeah, it's testing. But yeah. I, I agree with you, Kai. It's addictive. It's like the gamer in me wants to just sit there and solve those puzzles <laughs> nonstop, break my record. And uh, I'll be fascinated to see if the viewers can actually get to level 12 or how many levels they can get through. Yeah. Uh, and it does help the pattern recognition for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And the ace in the sleeve game that we are challenging you guys to test is uh, a game where you're going to put black in checkmate by placing out chess pieces, basically. Chess pieces on cards. So you're going to place cards to checkmate black. Very fun game. It is a lot. We had a little bit of a preview of yeah. the players. I can't wait to share with you guys. Because <laughs> of course we have challenged the, the players. How some of the top players have done. And I can't wait to see how you guys at home <laughs> do. And uh, Magnus bopping away. Look at He's him. He's happy. It's a good time for him, wherever he is in the world, listening, listening to music yeah. in chess land. 
Yeah, he's much more awake this time than yeah. uh, that previous match, match we saw against Liam. Um, I'm not sure what he was singing. Maybe we can get some <laughs> info into his playlist a bit later on, Magnus. But uh, yeah, he's looking happy and usually for Magnus, but all for all chess players. If you're happy, if you're relaxed, you play well. And uh, that's why he's been doing so great so far this tournament. Meanwhile, Liam just pushing a pawn. I'm expecting Magnus to bring his, rook, his remaining rook in the corner over into the center at some point where it's middle. Uh, pawns could step forward. Yeah, it's uh, still a lot of life left. I think both sides have reason to be happy. Magnus, because he's got out of the opening without walking into some deep preparation. And Liam, because he's still solid yeah. as black. Yeah. And uh, how many moves in? We're at 14 moves in. And uh, do you think this thing is running through Liam's mind? Because often when I'm playing someone very, very strong, my big goal a short-term goal, I should say, is to survive until move 20. You don't want to get a, like a lost position or a much worse position. You want to have somewhere, a position where you have some chances. And I consider that like a success. And then the next goal is move 30, 40. Move 100, and move 200. <laughs> <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> 200, yeah. No, David. <laughs> <laughs> Fast move 60 and, and I'm satisfied. <laughs> But you're right, I mean, survival, there's different types of styles in chess. A lot of players, they try to win out of the opening. Liam is one of them, he's very principled. He's maybe one of the most professional players I've ever seen out in the chess world. He studies openings so deeply, he has his ideas, he sticks to them, he never backs down. He'll happily repeat those openings uh, just to show he knows more, understands more. But then there's another style of player like Magnus, who he knows his stuff, he has his favorite openings, but he's also happy to freestyle. And normally those kind of uh, innovative players who, want to make things up as early as possible, who want to get into new territory. They just want to survive. And uh, the older I get, the more I'm heading into that camp. Nowadays, uh, when I sit down at the board, I'm like, strong player, weak player, no matter what. I'm just like, okay, as long as I survive the first 10, 20 moves, I'm happy. I can outmaneuver them later. And uh, we're at move 15, both sides have survived. Neither side's really in their homework anymore. So this is really just Liam against Carlson. No opening prep, no more theory, no uh, help from engines, no pattern recognition necessarily anymore. It's just brain versus brain. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like That's that kind of scenario. But there is some, uh, there's one game that they're following. They're following <coughs> Stephen Le Pen. Oh, now they're not. <laughs> this pawn move? Yep. Uh, this is totally new. No one's ever played this before. Okay, those two players, Ivanka, you were going to mention? Yeah, and then they disappeared from my thing. But uh, okay. there were two amateur players yeah. around I'm... about the 1900. Uh, okay. I'm pretty sure Magnus and Liam, they wouldn't have seen that game before. Um, they're just on their own right now. Okay, Liam's bishop comes out, very sensible. Blocking a diagonal, eyeing up the white queen perhaps. It is a bit provocative, this last bishop move. He's inviting Magnus to step forward with white's d-pawn. White's d-pawn can hit this light, light squared bishop. But uh, I'm expecting Magnus maybe to build up for that first. It feels like uh, that rook in the corner really just wants to get into the game. Magnus is so good at inv inviting every piece to those parties. And uh, yeah, bring the rook across. I Why agree. not? Centralize, I... coordinate. That's a, that's a good lesson in life. Prepare and uh, there you go. He maximizes his pieces and gets ready to push the deep pawn one square forward. And uh, black. If I were black, I would perhaps take some time out just to retreat my bishop mm -hmm. so that when the d-pawn does move forward, it's not attacking a piece. Yeah, this is really instructive, Yovanka. I completely agree wholeheartedly here. Um, there is a big threat. If you look at white's pieces, they're all pretty much on their optimal squares right now. They're all perfectly placed. They can't really be improved. So it's clear Magnus is about to break forward and Liam plays exactly the move you wanted. White's only idea to break forward is to push uh, in the center with d5, hitting the bishop. So why not step back? And when this does happen, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen now. Uh, what else for Magnus simply? But when it does happen, at least now black has options. Your bishop is no longer hit. So yes, you can take and open things up. But if you want to play a calmer, uh, calmer position, then you can just block, which you wouldn't have been able to do if your bishop was vulnerable on this e6 square. So that's what we call prophylaxis in chess. Just you see your opponent's threat, you guard against it before it even arrives on the board. And uh, suddenly, I'm not sure whether Magnus would be too happy with this position. Suddenly, what's his queen doing out here on a limb? Not really uh, doing too much. And uh, yeah, these, this rook especially, it looks great, but it is just staring down at its own pawn, which can no longer advance. So I really, really love that last move by Liam. I think really instructive. A lot of people would have been carried away, maybe move the queen, maybe move the rook, I don't know, move the knight, but no, just step back 
and ask the question, what are you actually going to do? Now you have no more direct threats. And yeah, great move by Liam. This is what makes him so classy. He's great at dynamic play, but he can also take time out uh, with these little sophisticated maneuvers. Yeah. And what I also really like about that bishop retreat is that the bishop can actually go to the other direction, can actually plant itself at the right time on h5, and again, ask white, how are you going to defend your knight? Not an easy question to answer. Yeah, that could be an annoying pin later on in the game. And meanwhile, black's next two moves, if white does nothing, are very straightforward. Black's just going to move his queen, then shift, uh, kind of shuffle his rook across one uh, into the center. But what's white doing? I don't see any idea for white at all here, other than pushing in the middle. Yeah, suddenly, yes, the evaluation bar says 0 0.1, but white's plans are quite mysterious. It's very simple for black to play. Uh-huh, so you're liking this better for Liam, basically. I'm also biased, Kaya. You know me and my two bishops. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these two pieces could become fantastic later in the game if they're allowed to break out of the bind. And Magnus, he's uh, thinking now for over two minutes on his next move. We're going to go to San Francisco, where Tanya is with a player that actually participated uh, previously on uh, the season of the tour. Kaya, it's a fun day here at the venue. We've got so many chess enthusiasts, players here with us discussing everything that's going on in the tour with the players' farms, how much in shape Magnus is, just the way he's played so far. And today we've got a very special guest joining us. It is the US junior chess champion. He did make his debut at the Champions Chess Tour this year earlier at the Julius Baer Generation Cup. Impressed us all with his phenomenal performance. Christopher, you. Christopher, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, it was it was very fun to play um, at the U.S. Championship. Despite it not ending that well, I still had many good games, and it was really fun, in, interesting to face the top players. And it was definitely a new level I hadn't really experienced before that event, because before that event, I had mostly only played like other people around my rating, like um, 2,500 or 2,600. So it was actually a lot more fun to play these top players, <laughs> to be honest. And Christopher, we were so impressed with you qualifying to the knockout stages of your first event. What did that mean for you? Uh, yeah, I was elated. I was like, I was jumping up and down when it happened, especially since I had lost the first two games of the tournament and I really wasn't feeling so great. But after losing the first two games, I really, my form really picked up and somehow I managed to come back and make it to the knockouts. It was really, it was very cool to watch that. I have to ask you, what is it like to actually have the players here in your city play the tour finals? It's really nice, but um, I do, I do wish that I could play, obviously. <laughs> but I can, I can still enjoy watching, and this, and I can really enjoy being here too with such a nice view. I completely agree about the view. And I have to ask you that at the US Championship, you made big headlines when you beat Wesley as well. But there were so many stories, especially that incident with Savion breaking off the king against uh, Hans. That was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen in my life. What happened there? You've got to tell us. <laughs> I don't really know what happened because Han said something to me, but Sam Sevian said some, that he said something totally different than what Han said he said to me. But all I know is that th th they had they had something going on. <laughs> it, it wasn't it wasn't all chill among them, and they're definitely not on friendly terms after that. And what about you? I, I remember there were these interviews also after the your own game, because uh, Hans did grow up around here. You played a lot as kids. How's your relationship with Hans, and are you guys good friends? Yeah, I, I know him very well, but I, I, I wouldn't personally say we're super good friends, but he can be very entertaining at times. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with you, and I have to ask you, in this event, the Tour Final, we do have Wesley who's qualified. He is uh, the American player for the finals. Are you rooting for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I don't have, I definitely don't have anything against him. So I wouldn't say I'm particularly rooting for him, but I would like to see him do well. Yeah. And Christopher, what do you make of Magnus's form in this event? Because that's been impressive. Amazing. Just like Magnus, Carl, Magnus Carlsen on good form is just really scarily good.
<laughs> it's super hard to play against him as is, but when he's in shape, it's it's really tough. Yeah. Uh, now I don't feel as now I don't feel as bad that I I'm like zero six against him online, <laughs> which is a bit rough, and I do still really want to beat him. But he keeps declining my challenges when when I challenge him. So I hope that he can watch this and accept one of my challenges online instead of declining all of my challenges. Because I do really want to play him. Well. We loved having you on the tour. Do you enjoy these online formats with uh, the Rapid and Blitz and the Champions Chess Talk? Yeah, I really, I really enjoy these formats. And I would personally say that I, I really like playing in these formats myself. Um, so I hope that this keeps happening and there's and that this tour goes on many years in the future well as do we and we've got chess action on so we're gonna head back to the studio we'll report back soon from san francisco fantastic thank you tanya and christopher this is from uh, before the game started today christopher you was uh, lucky he got to test out magnus carlson's chair inside the shack 15 arena the grandmaster himself of course but uh for a young player like him, Magnus will be a big idol, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, Magnus is a big inspiration to many young players and actually to several chess players over the world. <laughs> and uh, there we see a photo of the actual scene that he was talking about yeah. between Hans Niemann and Sam Sevian. They did uh, talk about that very strange moment. Tanya call it the strangest moment she's uh, seen in chess in her life when Sam Sevian broke off the crown of the king in the middle of the game against Hans Niemann. That was so bizarre. Yeah, it was actually Hans Niemann's move. And then uh, Sam, as white, just picked up the opponent's king while the clock was ticking, just snapped off the cross on top of the king and just started fiddling with it as if nothing had happened. And, <laughs> and there we see Hans just his surprise. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's really fascinating, Christopher, giving some insight there, which I don't think anyone knew around the world. This is like breaking news. Yeah. And there was actually some uh, personal stuff between them. Because afterwards, the players, they were like, oh, no, 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 it's just a misunderstanding. Just, uh, But apparently, some something going on behind the scenes there. Yeah. Strange, yeah. strange moment that we all know. There has been moments between Magnus Carlsen himself and Hans Niemann this uh, season, both in uh, St. Louis St. Phil Cup and on the tour. But here Magnus is fighting to win the Tour Finals. He's already the winner of the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour 2022. Will he finish off with winning the prestigious Tour Finals? Before we headed uh, to uh, Tanya in San Francisco, you kind of liked it for Liam, the position. What yeah. do you think now after a few moves? Um, I still think black is fine, but suddenly things have changed. Uh, the center, the tension there has resolved itself, and now Liam is pushing on the queen side. And uh, maybe we can jump in just to show what has happened, how that situation did clarify. Uh, so this is the current position, but we left it here uh, a few moments ago. So we did say that white is going to break forward in the center. Black blocked it up. Here, Magnus brought his bishop to a more active square. This is a clear target, the base of black's pawn chain. And therefore, Liam said, OK, I don't want to tolerate this tension any longer. Slightly surprising to me, perhaps, but he immediately rushed to trade off bishops. I still like the potential of the bishop pair. Maybe he could have delayed this a few more moves. But after a rook trade and now a bishop trade, this is where I was really surprised. Uh, yes, Liam has a set of doubled pawns and he corrected his pawn structure by taking now. But suddenly there are weaknesses, especially this black pawn. Watch out for that one being a weakness, a target later. It's a clear backward pawn. Magnus now uh, just improved his rook to an open file and Liam immediately broke out, sacrificing a pawn temporarily. We see an exchange here. Magnus capturing that sacrificed pawn. It is defended, remember, this knight by the white queen. And after a pin, the moves are coming thick and fast, but white defended. And uh, after a trade of pieces, look at White's pawn structure. It is a bit ragged. It is ruined here. Doubled pawns, isolated pawns. But how can Black take advantage? It's not 100% clear. This Black Knight especially, not really joining the action anytime soon. It takes three or four moves to hop around and threaten those pawns. Maybe Liam's idea is to come with his queen to one of these two squares. I guess the first target has to be the advanced B pawn. What do you think, Ivanka? Does he have enough compensation? Um, 
it's it's a very difficult position actually because uh, I do I mean I have to say Liam's last move was actually my first move of choice but I was wondering what's going to happen once Magnus just starts launching forward his rooks and uh, since he just cannot preserve the pawn on b5 he might as well maximize his pieces but here I was just trying to assess this and I was thinking this is a very complicated uh, position because, yes, some queens might get traded off, but the rooks are very active and black has terrible pawn structure. I mean, the pawn on d6 is so weak <coughs> and white's knight is primed and ready to perhaps jump over to some important squares. Yeah, um, even if the queens come off, maybe white has some small chances here in an endgame due to the weakness of this pawn. Uh, he might even allow this one to drop just to get forward with his knight towards black's d pawn. Um, this one feels like it might fizzle towards a draw if the queens do come off. So the big question for Magnus, if we go back to the current position, is can he prevent this somehow? I don't see a way either, I've got to admit. Ideally, you want to bring your rook forward and here kind of keep the queens on, somehow zigzag the queen across to the king side to attack. But this does take a few moves. And meanwhile, black will start gobbling up even more pawns. Uh, the one th good thing about Black's Knight, it's not on a great square actively, but defensively it's very decent. It covers some key squares. Knight on f8, no mate, and it can always come out and block any threats. Yeah, maybe Liam is just about holding. It does look a bit scary, uh, the king and queen. We've seen this scenario so many times of uh, the queen kind of divorced from the king just so <laughs> far away on the other side of the board, and then there's a direct attack against the king. She can't defend, but right now, Magnus... He doesn't have too much ammunition left. He don't, doesn't have too many pieces to create those threats. So maybe, just maybe, Liam has calculated his way to safety. Okay. Important uh, game, important uh, match. This one, Liam, Liam, he was able to destroy everything for Jan Christoph Duda uh, yesterday when he beat him in that match. Duda was in shared lead with Magnus heading into day four yesterday. But uh, Liam winning that match means Duda is now three points behind Magnus on the standings. And Duda is today facing Prague Nananda. Prague was uh, for big parts of the season number two overall on the tour standings. But Duda playing uh, in the final and winning the previous tournament, Aim Chess Rapid. He has now uh, taken that second place and also winning a bunch of matches in the tour finals is still in second place. But these has been the two best players behind Magnus Carlsen this season. So this is a match we are definitely keeping a close eye on as well. And I think I did, yeah, the bar. Very much over to Duda's side in game one. Yeah, yeah that game opened as a Catalan opening and it does look like Duda so far is in charge. Wow. He's out-prepared Pragnananda. These two have history. I remember the first time they played in the Oslo eSports. I mean, Duda was just convincing. He beat Pragnananda in three games. But uh, when it came to the rematch in the FTX a Crypto Cup, well, guess what happened? I mean, Pragnanda was actually winning the match. And it was, do you know, in the, in the kick, you see that big moment where yeah. there's that, oh, no, that was Duda. Yeah. Because Prague was totally winning when he checkmated himself. Yeah. He allowed uh, Duda such a horrible moment. And that was against Duda. Yeah. And that was the last time these two played a match together. Mm -hmm. So that will be a nightmare that Prague remembers last time he played a match against Duda. Yeah, oh. That could well be the biggest blunder we've ever seen from a GM, not just on the tour, but in general, blundering into mate in one. Um, it happens once in a lifetime if you're a grandmaster, especially from such a winning position to kind of see the game turn completely 360 in one move. Mm. It's, uh, yeah, it's heartbreaking. So Prague, we know he's good at recovering. He had a difficult start to this tournament. He's already bounced back. Yesterday was, um, oh, sorry, the day before was a good uh, performance from him. But yeah, it's going to be an uphill struggle in that game as we see against Duda yeah. right now. He is on seven points after the first four matches. Prague in a shared place with Anish. Uh, sorry. Four points. Is he on four points? Yep. <laughs> That's correct. I'm watching Liam Lea sc uh, score. <laughs> <laughs> Pragnanada, he's on four points. In shared place with Anish uh, Giri. Uh, so, is there even a chance for him to win the tournament? Three, six, nine? Oh, well, Magnus will have to lose everything. So, he's not going to win the tour finals, Prag, but he can still finish in style. Three matches left to play. 
Yeah, I think it was just the top four and the top half of the table who still have some chances. For Wesley, it's not going to be easy. He relies on Magnus losing a couple of matches. Yeah. Everyone at this point relies on Magnus slipping up. But I don't think he's going to slip up in this game. Uh, it does look like, despite uh, the simplified material, it's only White, really, who can play for advantage. It feels like Black is the one who has to be quite accurate. There is a trap on the board as well. And uh, I Ooh. don't think Liam will fall into it. But it, just to show this elementary trap, don't get greedy before you can capture anything uh, in your opponent's camp. This, you should always double check to make sure they haven't set up uh, a nasty surprise for you. Queen takes pawn. It looks like the pawn was undefended. But look at the queen. Look at the rook. They're lined up on the same file and they can be skewered now by white's rook stepping across. <laughs> and uh, the white rook is protected. So here, black would lose material. If you move the queen out, out the way, the black rook drops. And if black takes the white rook, uh, here, it's actually level material, but for sure, the queen is superior to the black rook and knight. Black's rook and knight are just not combined. They're not coordinated. If they were, maybe they could hold, but white's queen uh, will just jump in, grab some pawns, and win the game. So, uh, yeah, right now, I'm not expecting Liam to blunder. He, the fact that he paused, and he's been thinking two and a half minutes now, means he, for sure, is not going to capture this pawn. And uh, the big question for him, then, is what else can you do? You don't really want to move your knight. If you move your knight, then the white queen can jump in with a nasty check. This would be incredibly dangerous. Uh, if you can't move the black knight, where do you really want to push the rook to? It looks pretty good right now. Um, so how do you even improve your position? Maybe you have to improve the black queen. But again, where do you put her? Lots of questions here for Liam. And meanwhile, Magnus has a clear idea. That's to jump in with his knight and target this big weakness on d6. We caught it earlier on when he took uh, with a pawn on this square, we said this is going to be the target for Magnus, and he's going after it. Instructive play from Magnus. I agree with you, David. It's the Black Queen that needs to be moving, yeah. and uh, she needs to get out of the way of her rook. Yeah, I mean, there's a few squares uh, you can, I mean, drop back, for example, if you want to be really solid. You could maybe drop back here just to keep an eye on white central pawn. And uh, yeah, you, you could make an argument for stepping forward to one of these two squares just to stay active. But. Sure. Lots and lots of choice, and it's not clear which one is best. And Liam does have to move. He's down at four minutes now, one minute behind Magnus on the clock. But that could be a significant factor because the critical moments are still ahead in this game. Magnus will ask some difficult questions. And wow, he does go for this. We said this was a blunder, but he's relying on sacrificing his queen, Liam. Surely he didn't miss this move, the rook coming across. He has to give up his queen. We said that this was losing, but... Does he really believe that he can build a fortress here? How can you hold this position when you have such a weak pawn, when your rook and knight are so disconnected? Maybe he's evaluated this better than us, but uh, it would be a shock now to me if he can hold the draw. It's only two results now. It's either white winning or a draw. Black has to somehow curl up into a ball. He has to somehow retreat his rook maybe to defend and cross his fingers and hope. Wow. Uh, to me, this is the Magnus effect because in the, the position until he played this queen sacrifice, I mean, everything was fine. He, he didn't have any problems. But I mean, I have to say, I do like Liam's last move using all his pieces, but still, this isn't necessary. It's only Magnus who's going to be able to win this before, you know, anything could happen. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're definitely just fighting for the draw now if you're Liam. I'm so shocked, I'm almost speechless, I've got to admit. I think his idea is, for example, if the white queen comes to target this pawn, black's rook is just in time to slide back, and it's still hard to pinpoint weaknesses in the black camp that you can target. White is just playing with the queen, but Magnus is trying to get in from this angle. Uh, the black rook drops back, and look how passive black's pieces are now. Black's rook is stuck. However, it's defended by the black knight, and these three pieces are basically going to sit on these three squares for the rest of the game, and he's going to hope that white can't break through. It's so funny, Magnus himself has held a fortress this tournament. Uh, we've seen a couple of other fortresses, but now Liam, he's trying to say to Magnus, yes, they do exist. Yes, you can't break through. And the evaluation bar seems to agree that Black is holding. It's going to be a tough slog now to defend this one. Yeah, I agree with you there, David. And also, I'm just thinking about the psychological effects because it goes to show that Liam is just very happy with the draw. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in fighting a game with three results possible. Instead, he was just like, OK, I respect your skill, your genius, and I'm just simply going to hold the position tightly. I would be feeling very positive about the match 
if I were Magnus. But what is the most likely result right now if you guys just walked in and saw this board? Is it a win for Magnus or is a draw still the most likely? Somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. I would say that maybe this is a draw 60% of the time and Magnus wins 40% of the time or, or maybe it's a draw 70, 30, roughly around there. Uh, so I was going to say that Black has to just sit still and wait, but now uh, Liam is happy to actually try and go active. He's trying to get his knight uh, forward. He's trying to capture this pawn. He is, however, giving up his pawn in the center, but I think he's uh, okay with that right now. I was going to say, surely White can just grab this pawn, but after the Black Knight captures, suddenly <laughs> White has created a pass pawn, yes, but it's still going to take a while to advance. For example, Black can just retreat his knight, and uh, even if you give up another pawn, maybe this is the fortress that Liam is relying upon, the Black Knight on a nice outpost here. You can never kick it away with a white pawn anymore. And uh, he will just slide his rook across and say, okay, you're not advancing. It still looks a bit <laughs> shaky to me as Black, but uh, he does have a point. It's going to be difficult to dislodge that Black Knight. What do you think, Yvanka? Is he going to hold this one, Liam? And we might be headed in this direction, actually. Magnus is going for this pawn. Yeah. I mean, it's very clever by Liam, but I do feel it's it's a tad on the negative side. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it bodes well for the match situation. Yeah. I just... Yeah. Normally, the players who beat Magnus, they're playing for the win. They're aggressive. Uh, they're, yeah, they keep all three results open. You very rarely beat Magnus in a match, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Ivanka, in this type of format by just playing for a draw. Maybe he'll play for a draw with black and try and go for it as white, Liam. Maybe that's the strategy, but uh, not to positive stuff from the Vietnamese player. Mm. Now I'm expecting him either to use this square or this square. The goal is to get the knight onto e5. That's the square you want to keep the black knight on. You just have to simply stop white's pawn. White does have a pass pawn and those are killers when you have a queen to, to kind of shepherd that pawn forward. But okay, I think he can defend. He's still within the realms of a fortress. Mm. Okay, Li Emle is uh, fighting for a draw in this game. Magnus Carlsen, is this like a typical Magnus game where he can sort of grind and... No risk. Yeah. Oof, he pushes a pawn forward. This is, oh, again, it just feels like... Oh, you, look yeah. at that, yeah. You're weakening your position. If you want to hold a fortress in chess, you kind of have to just curl up into a ball, sit there, just defend your squares, be patient, just wait, and hope your opponent can't break through. You can't lash out and push pawns like this. Now the black F pawn, the pawn in front of the black king, that one is a target long term. It's a bit softer. It's a bit more vulnerable than it was earlier. Yes, you've got your knight on a good square, but you're defending actively when you can't defend actively if you're material down like this. White can just move the queen out of the way now and start pushing this pawn forward. Mm. Oof, I, I don't like it. The valuation bar agrees. Sometimes human instinct is enough to tell you that this move is too risky. It's it's it also shows some inconsistencies, yeah, actually, exactly. because uh, right at the beginning, you know, when he went into this ending, it seemed to me that he was going to curl up in a ball. Then he went active with a knight and said, mm. hey, you can take my big asset, the d6 pawn that held the position together. But still, you know, and now he's playing, it feels like he's trying to keep his pieces active, but that's not part of the plan, you know. Mm. Even, a bad pl even a bad plan is better than no plan, you know, and the plan was to simply hold and uh, he's just impatience. Yeah, he's changing his mind on every single move, right? He gives up a queen, gaming for the fortress, then he's like, no, I'm going to try and win with my active knight. And then he should just retreat, go passive again, but he's like, no, I'm going to go active again. It's like an identity crisis <laughs> for Liam. <laughs> I think it's not in his nature as well. I've, uh, I've grown up alongside Liam. He's just one year younger than Magnus, myself, and others. We played him in all these age groups, and he was always very active. He, I very rarely ever saw him just sit still and hold passively. <laughs> Uh, it's just not in his nature. Uh, so, unfortunately, the position <coughs> demanded that he kind of curl up into that ball. But uh, now, OK, Magnus pushing forward. Already, the position for Black is starting to creak. Uh, Magnus could have moved his queen. I was a bit surprised there. That would have been the most logical. White has to win this game, if you want to win it as White, by pushing your past D pawn forward. Okay. Uh, but first, he's just trying to soften Black up even more on the king side uh, with these pawns on the right flank. So he's trying to undermine the pawn protecting the black knight. So black cannot capture this white pawn that's just moved because the white queen will come swoop back and take the black knight. But Liam does have one move now. How can he take advantage of that? And he's going active. Again, it's his style. He's staying true to himself. But is that what the position requires? Is that the spirit of the position? He's going after pawns, but even the pawns near the white king, they don't matter. It's all about the white central pawn. Ah. That is the 
only way that white will win the game. So I would rather have eliminated that white central pawn than go for the pawns near uh, white's king. Yeah, and uh, looking at the bar, hates it. Yeah. Doesn't like this strategy from Liam. And I agree, you know, the d-pawn is very strong, but also I, I suspect that Magnus is going to go about opening up the black king and just uh, subjecting him to some checks from his queen. Uh -huh. And uh, the queen is such a strong piece because she can lose time. The knight and the bishop are less flexible. It's knight and a bishop? Knight, uh, knight and the rook. Uh, they can't lose as much time hmm. as the queen. Yeah. All right, so Magnus, he is uh, definitely trying to checkmate the Black King. And that's exactly what we are asking you guys to do in our challenge for you today. Magnus Carlsen is today launching his very new official app, the Magnus Chess Academy. And within that app, there's a bunch of games. We are challenging you in the game called the Ace Up the Sleeve, where the aim is to checkmate the Black King using a bunch of uh, cards. So. Test the game, download the, download the app first of all, the Magnus Chess Academy, test the game called um, Ace Up the Sleeve, and let us know how you do. How many levels can you do? What level do you start struggling at? It's a fun game. I want to know their scores. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, every chess player always asks that. You know, you say, oh, we're playing a tournament. Oh, what was the score? <laughs> so this, I'm going to ask the same to you guys at home. Tweet us your score. Tweet us uh, what level you're at yeah. and uh, whether you're enjoying the game. I can't wait to hear their feedback. And I bet you when they see how the players get on, yeah. uh, no one will be able to resist. Oh, they're going to be motivated <laughs> yeah. to beat Magnus Carlsen's score. We're going to reveal after this game how Magnus did in that game. And just to clar clarify, the app is called Magnus Chess Academy, and the game within the app that we want you guys to try is called Ace Up The Sleeve. But the app you need to download, only available in iOS, Apple Store today, will be av available Android also uh, coming shortly. But the app is called Magnus Chess Academy. And I think Magnus has been inspired. He's been trying out this app. He's been learning from it. And he's going for checkmate with this pawn push, the white H pawn stepping forward. He's going for the black king. And now black's king is trying to run away desperately. He's trying to find a shelter. We have to jump in. We have to show what's happening because it's a lot of drama, a lot of hidden tactics actually on the board. And uh, last move, Magnus pushed this pawn forward. It looks like this pawn is up for grabs. You can capture it with the Black Knight. You can create an escape square for the Black King. However, now Black's Knight is so far offside, it's on the edge of the board, it can no longer run back in time to stop White's pawn. This would be a check, for example. And uh, if the Black King moves, the White Pawn steps forward. And just to show, just to illustrate the danger, if Black's Rook blocks, then White's pawn can step forward, giving up the White Queen and uh, making a new Queen. Next move, because Black's Knight is so bad. Meanwhile, uh, Liam didn't go for this. He decided, OK, the Black King is in some danger from some checks. He wants to run in front of the pawn. He's going to try and use this pawn as shelter. But Magnus says, OK, you can do that. I don't care. I'm just going to take a pawn. And uh, even after Black grabs this pawn with check, he just steps back. And uh, now it's all about the deep pawn. I think if Black can give up his knight for this pawn, there might be some chances to hold the game. But Magnus will try and force the win of the Black Rook for this white pawn. Yeah, and unfortunately for Liam, it's not just the D-pawn that's running through. The Black King is also incredibly vulnerable. So if the Rook, say for instance, tries to get behind the passed pawns, after all, that's a good defensive te technique, then the Queen will come into the E7 square. And that's bad news for Black because the King is going to get hunted down. Yeah, you have to start running forward now and this will end in disaster. I mean, white can start grabbing some pawns already. I'm not sure whether white wants to take immediately or white can just step forward. And now there's no path black, uh, for the black knight to come and stop this pawn. This pawn is simply promoting. It will cost black his rook and white will win. A queen versus knight is very simple, uh, very simple victory. So Liam now, he's only got 20 seconds left, and this is the current position. He faces two threats. The biggest one is this check, so he does prevent it. He brings his rook across, but how's he going to stop the second threat? White's pawn can just move. You can start pushing already. This looks terminal. Yeah, it's good to go. And there it is. Past pawns must be pushed. And the knight does jump back to attack the queen. Yeah. And there you go. A check on the board. And it looks like a deadly check when the king moves, when it starts to run. White's queen has a bunch of squares to choose from, but it could, for example, use this square. It pins the black knight along this line and it's grabbing this pawn. Next move, you just step forward and it's going to be game over. It looks like this pawn is going to cost black the game. 
And it's all because he went too active. Look at how poorly coordinated Black's pieces are now. Earlier, they all protected each other. Suddenly, the, the knight, the rook, these are pinned. The Black King off on the other side. In order to hold a fortress, in order to defend an endgame against a queen, you need to defend all your pieces. They need to protect each other. Um, you have three pieces against one, after all. Use them together. Don't just put them randomly on the side of the board, even if you're grabbing some pawns. Look at Black's King. He is getting active. He is grabbing pawns. But uh, after this move, you're running through. Uh, for example, if the Black King moves again, White will make a new queen. And uh, after the Black Knight captures, it's not the knight you take, but it's the rook. And you can no longer save the Black Rook. Yeah, here it's just a cleaning up process. You just slowly go and win all these three pawns, and then eventually White activates his king and goes for checkmate. Wow, Magnus Carlsen on fire, probably winning this game. That will be his eighth win in a row. And that's a record. Seven was a record. Eight is a record on the Mouthwater Champions chess tour. Yeah, yeah, and uh, there's some, there seems to be something very lucky about Magnus. You know, he seems to be getting a lot of sometimes shaky positions. Sometimes, you know, as we saw earlier, it was dead drawn positions. But the opponents are all going wrong, so someone seems to be smiling on him. Yeah. And uh, there we see the the king step forward. The black king is also following suit. And are we going to see a move like Queenie, or are we going to see something flashy? Yeah, so I do like what Liam's done. He somehow tricked Magnus into, <laughs> into the White Queen no longer pinning the Black Knight. Uh, there's a few ways you could play this. I would be tempted to bring the White Queen back to start kicking the Black Rook, just to ask it whether it has any safe squares. If you want to play this safe, I guess you can make a new Queen. Uh, as you mentioned, Ivanka, you can promote. That will cost Black his Knight, but then we'll see an endgame of Queen versus Rook and two pawns. It is winning for White. Uh, Black's pawns are too far forward, there's no fortress there, but uh, there's no rush. I guess you can make a new queen anytime you want. You can win that Black Knight anytime you want. So Magnus first, he'll test Liam a bit, and uh, he's forcing Liam to give a couple of checks. Ooh, suddenly, yeah, Black's pieces are at least active. They are at least okay. coordinated again, the Black King and Rook protecting each other. But uh, is there a knockout blow? It should still be winning for White, but at least Black is now threatening to give some nasty checks. Black's Rook uh, and King have caged the, uh, the counterpart, the white king. And that's why Magnus gives a check. But the king is going to step to the side opposite the white king and then ooh -hoo, checkmate is threatened. Yeah, suddenly it's no longer one-way traffic. Should still be winning for white, but Liam is defending really well. And uh, Magnus, he still has to be very accurate here. I think he should have kept it simple. I think you were right, Ivanka, just make a new queen, win that black knight and then focus on hoovering up, focus on winning those black pawns. Okay, Liam retreats. And uh, how will he finish this game off now? It's not totally easy. It's, uh, okay, <laughs> maybe it's just a matter of taking pawns. Magnus feels he has that luxury. Why not grab a pawn? That black knight is fixed where it is. Black's rook is fixed defending it. Maybe Liam just has to wait. Uh, yeah sit and await his fate. I, I was uh, curious about the situation, if it was a rook and queen, sorry, rook and pawn versus a queen, because mm -hmm. um, there are some situations where it is a draw. Yeah. And we can show this, for example, uh, if we do see this endgame, we will be in for a long grind here, but if we see, for example, white's, uh, I don't know how to do this, white's, I think there's a very strong move here, I think you can give a check, but uh, yeah, let's say, for example, black just waited, uh, white moves the queen across, and we see a position like this one, where black's knight can give itself up for the pawn, or the new queen. Uh, so this endgame, you're wondering about Yvanka, yeah. when it's king, rook, and pawn. And this one, I'm pretty sure, is winning. Uh, this would be a draw if the pawn was back where it started, and the king was back as well, uh, because then you can't break through be from behind. Here, white's queen uh, will simply catch the black king out in the open, and eventually you will win this pawn. Queen versus rook alone is a win. So uh, let's go back to the game. It does look like Magnus doesn't even want to allow that position to happen. So this is the current position, and he's just trying to make a new queen and win that for the black rook rather than the knight. And uh, the question for Liam here is, can he go for the white king? If you can't go for the white king, white makes a new queen, game over. Two seconds, one second, and he gives a check. Ooh, Ooh, hoo, hoo. This feels wrong. Now the white king can start running out into the open. Yeah, I agree. He needed to step forward with his king, for better or worse, and uh, there the king is running. The 
King is indeed running. And this one, I think, is just over. Uh, the King doesn't even need to run out into the open. It can just shuffle across and attack the Black Rook. This is a check. Now the White King can just continue moving across. If the Black Rook steps across, this is a check, yes. But White will just happily sacrifice his Queen to make a new one. And we have a result. Liam has resigned. Wow. Magnus <clears throat> takes the lead uh, yet again, winning game number eight in a row. Incredible what Magnus Carlsen is up to these days in San Francisco. Magnus, you take the lead in this match. It looked like near perfect technique to us. Would you agree? No, I, I, I think I did well to pose some problems, but I think um, he went for the wrong approach there. I think he, uh, instead of going for um, uh, setting of uh, going for a counter attack, he should just have put the knight back on e5, block with the rook, and then I think it would have been a draw. So you thought that a fortress was possible in this one? Yeah, I mean. It's not easy for for sure, but I, I thought it was uh, was possible, uh, and um, uh, it was yeah, it was a very interesting decision for him to take on take on b2. Um, it felt like um, f6 is such a massive weakness that um, uh, that I have should have some chances um, if he doesn't take. Uh, so I think it was a decent practical decision, but um, yeah, even after that, it's not easy. All right, thank you, and good luck for the next one. Magnus himself mentioned the word fortress there, and Liam did have the opportunity to build a fortress. Magnus pinpointed one moment as uh, the moment that Liam let the draw slip. And it was here. Black should have just curled up into a ball. Black should have kept his nice, harmonious pawn structure all intact, all defending each other. And it was about rerouting the Black Knight. White's pawn is, after all, the only piece that can win the game if it does push forward to promote. So why not just step the Knight into this square? So for example, if White moves, you can even give away Black's sea pawn, uh, stepping back. And this is a fortress because the Knight defends the Rook. The Knight, in turn, is defended by Black's pawn. Everything defends each other, and there's no way through for White. As long as you keep this form you can just wait. The Black King can move, the Black Rook can move back and forth, back and forth. White's Queen alone will not break through. Instead, Liam got tempted to make a mistake that a lot of us would make if we go back. He pushed his pawn forward, but this created weaknesses. Suddenly, the f6 pawn is a weakness. Black's King is no longer fully safe. And as we saw in the game, Magnus converted very nicely. He loosened up the black position and broke through at the right moment. Start for Liam Lea. He will have the white pieces in game two coming up in 10 minutes. Magnus Carlsen, he is on fire. Now winning eight games in a row. What will it take for Magnus to lose a game? Maybe, like in the air, things masters, a moment of hallucination. Magnus has blundered. Um, he's just forgotten about this threat. He's brought his rook across, attacking the black queen. Oh. Now, knight takes pawn, I think, is just winning for black. What's happening? Wow, what has just happened there? Magnus plays bishop takes pawn. Whoa! He's completely hallucinated. Magnus just lost a piece for free. And has he given up? He has given up! Wow. He has resigned! That You will never see that from a world champion. Magnus just took a pawn, but now black will play bishop takes bishop, and black will be a piece up for free. There's mostly been great moments with Magnus this season, but that was a big blunder, a moment of hallucination. This is a big day for Magnus. His uh, very own app, the Magnus Chess Academy, is launching today, available to anyone with an iOS Apple device, and uh, shortly also available for uh, Android users as well. And we are encour encouraging everyone today to download the Magnus Chess Academy app, and in that app to try the game called Ace in the Sleeve. And let us know using hashtag ChessChamps on Twitter how you are doing, how many levels in that game can you actually compete and can you make it all the way to level 12? That is the level we challenged Magnus in. Oh, wow. This is fun. Can I read a checkmate here? Oh wow, this is a proper help mate. This one is lovely. Where can I even do a check with the rook? What? What is this? 
Oh, I'm there. Okay, so let's see. Bishop and... Bishop and... Yeah, okay. What? I was gonna put the pawn... Ah! Okay, the queen is inside. Okay, I'm not gonna make this in time. Ah, pawn c5, queen d6, bishop c8. Ah! That was weak. But that was a fun game. Very good visualization training, uh, training mating patterns in a, in a fun way. I could definitely see myself <laughs> getting addicted to this one. Magnus, he managed uh, to solve 39 cards in Ace in the Sleeve game, a game within the Magnus Chess Academy app. And now we are challenging you guys to try this game as well. First, you download the Magnus Chess Academy app, and then in that app, you try this game, Ace in the Sleeve. You have to start out on level one and make your way as far as you can. Can you make it all the way to level 12? Yoanka, how are the viewers doing in our challenge? Oh, you know, a lot of people saying it's been great fun. We have uh, David Banks, who says, done the nine first levels of Ace in the wow. Sleeve so far. Great fun. And Badri says the same. Great solving Ace on the Sleeve exercise. So much fun and one of its kind. It's true. No, no puzzle has ever like been, well, let me just say that again. There's never <laughs> been an exercise like this ever, ever before. There's never been a game like this. And uh, it's different, it's unusual, yeah. and uh, as we saw from Magnus, it's a whole lot of fun. It is a whole lot of fun and a great way, basically, to learn chess, improve your chess, get better at chess. And in San Francisco as well, have you guys been able to test this new uh, app, Tanya? We're so excited about the new app and we're loving it. In fact, before the tournament started, we had a little go at it. Uh, and I'm going to let you in on something. I beat the world champion and the global champion in this new game. Everyone has to try it out. It's super fun. And speaking of fun, we also have a very fun guest with us here today, Kaya, joining us at the venue. He is one of India's biggest stand-up comics artists. Uh, also, a chess enthusiast, a chess player. He's on tour currently in the United States. Biswa is here with us. Biswa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be here to enjoy some chess. Yeah. How's it going? How's your tour going? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so far, I've done one show. I have uh, more shows in SF, Seattle, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, and New York. Uh, it's going on this entire month. Tour is going very well. Uh, my show today in uh, San Jose is in the evening. So that's why I thought I'll drop by here. Yeah. We're so happy to have you here with us. I have to ask you, stand up chess, how did the crossover happen? Uh, it's not too late to be mediocre at two things. <laughs> so I just thought uh, if I can't, uh, you know, be good at stand up, might as well become mediocre at chess. That's all. No, I actually, uh, uh, there's a stand up comedian named Samay. And he started playing uh, chess during the pandemic, and I was his friend, so we started playing, and then, you know, people got involved. We love to learn some chess. Yeah, so that's how it started, yeah. And have you along the way found any similarities between the art of stand-up and playing chess? Um, I, I, I won't say, like, very obvious similarities, but of course, patience and timing and all these things are common to uh, stand-up and chess. Um, both. I think timing is the crucial thing that is common between stand-up and uh, chess, yeah. Biswa, I've seen your streams and I've seen your involvement with the game. I have to say, to me, it looks like this whole comedian community is obsessed with the game. Is that accurate to say? Uh, yes, we have a lot of free time. <laughs> so we are uh, we are obsessed with this. Before this, it was poker, um, but now we have all shifted to chess and we love it. We love playing it. Um, we love promoting it. And uh, yeah, we love making money from it also. <laughs> Very little money, but still, yeah. That's awesome. And uh, in your obsession with the game, I hear that you're also involved with a big project along with some of the biggest talents of India. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, currently we are uh, in the first stages of shooting something very interesting with the upcoming uh, bunch of Indian talents, uh, like the young talents of India. Um, uh, they have been, uh, you know, in the news uh, almost every month for beating uh, the world champion or uh, winning some big prize. So we think there is something really big uh, um, that's going to happen in the next uh, couple of years. So uh, we are shooting something very interesting with them. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm really looking forward to that. And one of the big moments in the tour was, in fact, when Prague beat Magnus, and that totally blew up in India. Did that leave a big impression on you? Uh, yeah, but we started shoot long before that. <laughs> so we're not, uh, we, we expected that he's going to beat him at some point. Uh, so uh, that's why we're shooting. Uh, so yeah, we're not like, we didn't come after he beat her like, oh, who is this guy? Uh, we're on it before that, yeah. And do you believe that India will have the next world champion? Um, yeah, I think for the next hundred years, we should have it. Uh, we have a lot of people, so uh, we should produce a lot of uh, world champions. <laughs> Do you follow the tour? Uh, this tour? I unfortunately have not been able to follow, uh, but generally I do follow a lot of the tournaments, yeah. And we've seen so many uh, Indian chess prodigies play in the tour, sort of leave their mark, establish uh, themselves along with the very elite. Uh, has there been any one particular player who you feel is really going to go far ahead? I really like Gukesh. I really, really like Gukesh. Um, I just love uh, how fast he's growing. And uh, as a personality also, I feel he's very calm and centered. So yeah, he's my favorite out of all the Indian young talents right now. There's so many to pick from and definitely a very bright future for all of them. Uh, and I have to ask you finally, who according to you, Biswa, is the funniest chess player? Uh, Anish Giri, very easy. <laughs> I don't even have to think about this. Anish is very easy. Yeah, he's the most comedian-like personality. Says a lot of things that can get him in trouble. So I think he's my favorite, yes. Love it. Another Anish Giri fan in the house. Back to you guys in the studio. Thank you, Biswa. I bet a lot of people agree with uh, Biswa on uh, that Anish Giri is a funny guy. Been struggling a little bit this season on the tour. And let's take a look at the results from the first set of games here on day five in the tour finals. Anish Giri, he started off with a loss today against Arjun Aragaisi. So he needs to make a comeback and he's sitting in San Francisco. <laughs> Together with Wesley So, who started the day in great fashion, winning game one against Chakriyad Mamjarov. Actually, all games ended up with a winner. Magnus Carlsen, as we saw, he won his first game against Liam Le. And Jan Christoph Duda starting off with a win against Pragnananda. He uh, needs to win today's match, Duda, to have uh, hopes of uh, keeping up with Magnus Carlsen and winning the tour finals. But Magnus seems to be on fire. Now eight wins in a row. Liam Le will have to make a comeback. And let's take a look at their head-to-head -head scores from this season on the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. Liam has, uh, as we've seen, been able to win a match against Magnus in Oslo, but it is quite one-sided. This is actually from both seasons on the tour. Nine wins for Magnus. Yeah, that's a very one-sided score. And Liam has won two games, but those both came on that one day when Magnus was feeling unwell. So other than one day, Magnus has been quite dominant in, uh, in their matchup. And he has started well again. Yvanka called it the Magnus effect. And here he is in his chair in San Francisco, ready for game two with the black pieces. Liam has made his first move. Here we go. Yeah, it's a queen's pawn opening. Liam tends to start the game this way, and we do see a queen's gambit declined. White not taking that pawn on c4, and we see Magnus adopt the triangle formation as black, as we said, as uh, as we call it. This uh, setup of pawns in the middle of the board, rock solid. But Liam tries to go for a Catalan type of setup against it. This is a bit risky because it does involve a full pawn sacrifice, which Magnus accepts. Ivanka, risk taking from both sides so far. Yeah, definitely. And uh, incidentally, this is a very similar approach to the one that Liam Le took against Jan Christoph Duda yesterday when he won that important game with the black pieces. And uh, Magnus preserving that extra pawn. And this is why Liam has to generate some counterplay and jumps in with the knight to the center, attacking the c6 pawn. And Magnus, he's just on the defensive right now. He defends that pawn. And a very intriguing battle ahead. This is quite a trendy line. And uh, White certainly does have compensation and often doesn't even bother trying to win back the pawn. Just says, have it, and I will just develop my pieces, put them on good squares and create a bind to suffocate the black pieces. Yep, White is significantly ahead as well in development right now. White is the first to castle. Black is still three moves away from ever castling his king. And uh, White's light square bishop perfectly placed, exerting some serious pressure. White's knight perfectly centralized too. 
Um, I, I did see Magnus just before he pushed his pawn to b5. He was looking out the window again. He was just like, hmm, what have I prepared here? <laughs> and then he played a couple of moves. Now he's thinking again. I wouldn't be surprised if he looks out the window to the left. Oh, he's slightly looking to his left. <laughs> and oh, okay. uh, just above the screen here. And he, there we go. He looks again off to the left because for sure he studied this. But uh, every human needs a few seconds to recall what they've looked at in the past. He might have studied this maybe six months, one year, even five years ago. Uh, it's just about what... Uh, what setup Black wants to choose. Black has a lot of options. The good thing about having no developed pieces is you can uh, develop them all in a bunch of different orders. And uh, I'm expecting one of the two Black Knights to develop now. Not sure which one. And uh, once Magnus decides, once he starts activating, then it will be up to Liam to prove that he has compensation for the pawn. Yep, I can tell you the most popular move is the one that Magnus has played. Uh, it's actually possible to just develop the other knight, as you say, and just uh, return the sacrifice material. And Liam is playing in a very ambitious way. He's just like, OK, fine, I'm going to accept that I'm going to be a pawn down, but take a look at white pieces. <coughs> they are in commanding positions. And uh, it's not going to be easy for black to develop, and it's certainly not going to be easy to break out that light square bishop. Yep, Black's Light Squad Bishop is a target for some of the white pieces, certainly. And uh, yeah, Black still needs to castle. But I have to ask you this question. I mean, can is one, one question, but should Black capture that pawn in the middle with a queen? <laughs> because that feels like it's poisoned and it feels like maybe the computer gives it a blessing, but I why, don't why know. does it feel like it's poisoned? You lose a lot of time to uh -huh. take this pawn. So black is already one pawn up. You could make an argument for just being satisfied with one pawn. You could move the bishop out of the way, then try to castle and say, OK, I'm a pawn up. Oh, that's enough for me. But if you're really, really a maximalist, which a lot of the top players are, they will want to go two pawns up because that's a significant advantage. You also attack this rook in the corner. You attack this white knight in the middle. White can deal with that in a very simple way. You just move your bishop. You attack the black queen. And now the black queen has to run away to safety. Um, I think I've seen a game in the, quite recently uh, where Black moved the Queen across. I think that was Aronian against Shankland in the recent US Championship, or it, at least it was very similar to this position, offering a Queen exchange. But, for example, if the Queen were to retreat, let's say she goes the whole way back, you've basically lost two moves as Black. You've taken this pawn, and then you've retreated back where you came from, and you give White two moves. You've given White a Bishop development move for free, you give white another move now. For example, white could use this to develop his rook. And white would gain two moves for free. So yes, you've won a pawn, but is it really worth it? Mm. Um, that's like the eternal question in chess. Do you want time or do you want material? And uh, Magnus decides he wants the material. Uh, he wants the time rather than the material. He moves his bishop, getting ready to castle. And the M says, OK, you didn't take my pawn that time. Now I'm going to move. I'm daring you to take my pawn. But this time it would looks even more dangerous. Um, if queen takes pawn here, Yvanka, I'm already looking for sacrifices that white can play. For example, taking this pawn with a knight, hoping to blow open this diagonal for the white bishop. And if black's queen steps back to capture, then white has a few tempting moves. But at the minimum, you can just move the bishop. Because uh, just to show off here, if the queen moves, uh, then a knight would jump in with a nasty fork, winning the game. And if the queen even takes this knight, then after a queen trade, white is a whole piece and two pawns down. Uh, two pieces and two pawns down even, but you can regain one of them now and you trap this rook in the corner for next move. Yeah, mm. Magnus says, no, no way, I'm not touching that pawn. And instead it reinforces his uh, pawn on b5. And uh, Liam finally defends the pawn on d4. Yeah, so he's protected his centre. Now Magnus does have time. Magnus will most likely just castle. And it will be up to Liam to prove that his active pieces, White's great pieces, uh, that they do compensate for the one pawn. I'm expecting Liam, for example, to either gain space in the center or put some pressure on Black's pawn formation on this left side of the board. There's lots of different alternatives for white. I have to tell you, a thousand out of a thousand times, I would have taken that pawn with the Black Queen both two moves ago and in the previous move. <laughs> Is that a typical like beginner's move? Yeah. Um, Maybe it would be a typical mistake for a lot of players, not just at the beginner level, but even quite experienced players, if we do go back, especially one move, especially here, we would say, OK, we can take a pawn, we're attacking the white knight, we gain time against white's knight, but unfortunately we have to just back everything up with calculation nowadays in chess. Mm. And uh, if you don't develop your pieces, if you're not quick enough to castle, they do say you should always castle by move 12. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't castle, then you might often get punished. So, uh, so yeah, it's not necessarily a mistake to capture this pawn, 
but you have to double check that there's no immediate consequence, that there's, there's no way for your opponent to punish you for losing time, being greedy. And uh, yeah, I've made that mistake as well countless times in the past, Kaya, and that's made me scared now of capturing pawns. <laughs> uh, so I've gone the opposite way. I'm, uh, I'm a bit of a coward when it comes to uh, losing time. And uh, Magnus, okay, he didn't castle, very surprising. He, uh, he didn't grab the pawn, of course, but uh, now he just moves his queen across. The whole idea is to protect this light squared bishop, meaning that at some point, for example, if white is too slow, that black can push a pawn, break out. The whole idea is to try and trade off white's great light squared bishop. A very intriguing choice, actually, because I just have one game in my database. And it's a very interesting game, actually. It was uh, played between Oscar Idol and Alex Bullen. And Oscar I Idol is rated 1722, and he beat someone 400 points higher rated than himself. Wow. In this particular position. And he did that by moving, I think, the bishop out to the A3 square. That would be a very logical move. Now that Black's Queen has abandoned the dark squares, White can actually prevent Black from castling, uh, at least temporarily. Uh, now Black cannot castle because the bishop on e7 would be under fire. And if you trade off those bishops, those dark squared bishops, then suddenly after the White Queen recaptures, the White Queen has x-ray vision and you can't castle through check. So Black's King is still stuck in the middle. And yeah, maybe this would be a bit uncomfortable for Magnus to deal with. Maybe a small consequence of Black's last move. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have to say, I'm um, looking ahead at the way that Oscar Idol played, and it was very impressive. You know, the rooks just came to the open line and very natural play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looks great for white. Just aesthetically, you have two great knights. You have the superior bishop. White's bishop is the kind of active piece. Black's bishop is the passive one. White's queen far superior to the black queen. White's rooks already uh, in the center. Who needs a pawn when you can have great pieces? Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is the move we're expecting from White right now. In the current position, we're expecting Liam to develop with gain of time. And he would prevent Magnus from achieving his number one goal to castle. Yeah, dangerous position for the world champion. Ah. And will he play it? What do you think? I think he will after a bit of thought. And uh, this is a bit of a theme as well. So Magnus, he's on fire. He's winning all these games. But it's a bit of a theme in the opening. It's no, never that impressive. Especially against Anish Giri yesterday, Magnus was significantly worse out of every game uh, in the opening, but he always turns it around. It's the middle game that he's uh, putting his stamp on. And okay, he doesn't develop that direction. He goes the other way with the white bishop. I also want to say eight wins in a row. Uh, I'm trying to recall any time that's happened at the top level ever. Mm. I mean, the one kind of biggest run that we talk about is Caruana winning seven in a row yeah. in the Sinkfield Cup in 2014. And that's kind of gone down in history as the biggest kind of winning streak, but eight in a row, that's yeah. incredible. It's very yeah. impressive. I mean, what I'm thinking of also is uh, Magnus's run in the Julius Baer preliminaries, where there he got 12 out of 15 points. Mm -hmm. So maybe he won eight in a row then, but uh, I don't know, but eight in a row against some of the world's finest players in a head-to-head -head match. Um, that's incredible. Unheard of, if you ask me. And uh, there we see Liam putting his rook on an open line. But uh, somehow, I don't feel that Magnus is being challenged as much. I mean, it's still a very complicated position for Magnus, but he can get his king to safety. I think he should as soon yeah. as possible. <laughs> he's, he's used to delaying it, Magnus. He likes to kind of postpone castling, often prioritizing development or exchanges or pawn structure. But this type of position, it is about to explode. It's kind of a breaking point now. The climax <laughs> is uh, building and you need to just run away. You need to play it safe. I would be castling in a heartbeat. So I don't think I would even pause for that. I mean, one thing I have to say for the black position is black is a pawn up. That's uh, stating the obvious, but he can return some of the material. So for instance, the C6 pawn. And once that pawn disappears, well, black's pieces get a lot more freedom. And we might see a situation where white's advantage, which was primarily due to the pressure on this pawn, has just dissipated and the position is equal. Yeah, so you're talking about this pawn, Yvanka. Yeah. Um, this is a big target. For example, if Magnus castles, I think white can pretty much win that pawn immediately, as you mentioned. Uh, let's say there's an exchange, uh, maybe black can capture a different way, but let's say white's knight jumps into the center. And uh, now it's pretty much guaranteed you win this pawn next move, no matter what. But uh, even if, uh, okay, let's say black pushes forward. I think there's other ways to do this, but even if uh, white can regain that pawn, just to prove your point here, I think black is okay. Uh, black's rook will just slide across and pieces are disappearing. Yes, this is a dangerous pass pawn, but it will be blockaded. And 
can White really aim to push the advantage even further now? I'm not so sure. Uh, I think suddenly all of the activity in White's uh, position is compensated for by the fact that Black is rock solid. Uh, White's knight is a bit loose. White's, uh, the Black bishop is about to spring to life. I don't think Liam should be greedy, you're right. Uh, so I think that's what Magnus should be aiming for, giving back a pawn just to alleviate the pressure. And uh, going back, this is the current position. What else can you consider other than castling? It just looks so natural. It just looks so safe. I, th I think most <laughs> humans would have played it instantly. He spent two minutes, Magnus. I mean, He's the, down six minutes on the clock. The only other move that I can think of is actually attacking the bishop. Yeah. Um, and uh, the whole idea is that after bishop takes knight, if it captures, then maybe I would even consider pawn takes and uh, <laughs> trying to resolve the tension that way. But Magnus has had enough. He wants to get his king to safety. He's just run <laughs> through the lines and checking that it's all okay. And uh, now I guess Liam is uh, working through those captures that we talked about. Yeah, so Liam could trade off a, knight, a set of knights here. He could trade off bishop for knight. Uh, he could maybe move this knight out the way at some point because he really wants to open up his rook's vision towards the black queen. But I haven't yet seen an effective way. The computer does indicate that white does perhaps have something quite strong here, but I'm struggling to see it, I must admit. White has the advantage, but how? That is the question. Maybe and it would be this move. Yeah, it might well be this move. And uh, the whole idea is that knight takes knight is, of course, met by bishop takes bishop. Yeah, this bishop no longer protected. I really didn't like that queen shuffle that Magnus played a few moves ago. It just feels like the queen is a clear target on the c8 square, and she no longer protects this piece on e7. Suddenly, yeah, the black rook can indeed move, but once the white bishop runs away to safety, uh, suddenly black has a problem with this knight, has a problem along this whole diagonal, to be honest. And uh, again, look at the white pieces, especially the queen and rooks, so active. Compare them to black's queen and rooks, not great pieces at all. So yeah, it looks like Liam has found the way, the most accurate and most direct way to seize an advantage. There's already threats now on this c6 square uh, with the, the white rook, the white knight in the middle and the white bishop from afar. So uh, I'm watching out for that pawn to just disappear. And the question then will be whether Magnus can equalize once the material levels out. It's definitely a successful opening for White, for Liam. Maybe a comeback. That would be huge if Liam Le is able to win this game. He has so much more time on the clock, Liam. And he does capture the knight. I must admit, I thought that this wouldn't happen. And we're going to see bishop takes bishop on the board. And the position that you're like our resident fortune teller, David. What <laughs> you say, you, <laughs> what you say on the analysis board tends to occur in real life. OK, but the bishop is going to go all the way back. Normally, I'm saying don't play this. It's a mistake. And then the players, they go for, <laughs> for it. And uh, I mean, I can't blame Magnus for capturing that knight. To be honest, I would have been reluctant because, again, I'm biased towards the two bishops. Suddenly, white has the bishop pair. But uh, yeah, maybe he had to. And Magnus is um, much lower on the clock right now. So he's in a spot of time trouble. He needs to make those quick decisions. And at least now the position is starting to clarify. There will be a bunch of trades. I just think White's bishop is going to return. Yes, you can maybe grab the c6 pawn. If you leave uh, the white dark square bishop on e7, you take the black knight in the middle instead. But unless you're kind of forcing a win there, I would be reluctant mm -hmm. to cash in. I think now might not be the moment to cash in. I have to say, we have detected one tiny flaw in Liam's Lay's um, game, mm -hmm. and that is he does force things at critical moments. Yes. Uh, we saw that against Duda when he, he spoiled a win. He just, like, lashed out. And uh, we also saw that, uh, yeah, in, mainly in his match against Duda and in general. But uh, I, I think he is looking at that capture. Yeah. I have a feeling he'll f choose the most direct path as well. Uh, you're right, Yavanka. A few years ago, just before the virus struck, just bef uh, in 2019, I played in St. Louis. I played Liam in two matches, in two games, uh, classical chess. And OK, he does play a direct move. And I noticed as well, in both of those games, he was outplaying me. And just at the moment where he should take a step off the accelerator and just slowly maneuver, then he kind of broke through and just forced a draw. So oh. it, he could have just kept the pressure. He doesn't like the tension necessarily. And wow, there has been a big transition because just like the last game, one of the queens has been sacrificed. And uh, this time it's Magnus's queen and Magnus is gonna try and build a fortress. It's like a mirror image of the previous game. We have to jump in. Black now is material down. Uh, so this is the current position. But if we jump back, Liam didn't spend much time before cashing in on the material, taking this pawn, 
Now the white knight had to be captured, it's too strong. And after bishop takes knight, using this pin, white is winning material. So uh, bishop takes bishop happened, the black queen dropped off the board. And uh, if we do a quick count here, just like the last game, it's queen versus rook and knight. Here there's uh, more elements to the position. There's opposite color bishops. It's not clear who that favors. I like black's bishop in the middle of the board for now. Uh, but there's also an imbalance in pawn structure. So black has two versus one on this left side. What do you think, Ivanka? This shouldn't be a fortress either. <laughs> it should not be a fortress. Uh, but then again, I did say that, and I, will, I came to eat my words in the game that uh, Magnus played against Wesley, where he blundered his queen. And I was like, there's no way this is a fortress. Too many holes in the black position. And it was a fortress. Mm -hmm. um, here, I, I agree with you. The presence of the opposite color bishops seems to me that uh, white has the upper hand, and I definitely think it should be winning. I'm going to put the odds on about 65%. Okay. I, uh, I've been known for my optimistic percentages. And it's not just that it's winning, but uh, also it's that black is the one fighting for the draw, oh. fighting for his life. A black win here is nearly out of the question already because the white queen, uh, she should be able to hold against any uh, set up of pieces and the evaluation bar reacts. Yeah. This looks like a very nice move by Magnus. He looks like he's about to bring his knight into some decent outposts, but could it be uh, just a mirror image again of that previous game where getting active with the knight is not actually the best path? Maybe keeping it passive, keeping it as a defensive piece, which would have saved Liam in game one today. Maybe that was Magnus's best bet. But uh, what is the idea now? I guess Magnus is banking on the fact that if the white queen moves, for example, to capture this pawn, the black knight will indeed get active. There's no time to take this bishop because of queen takes knight and exchanges will help white here. White's ahead in material. So bringing the knight forward, I think this is Magnus's idea. And when the bishop moves to safety, for example, the black knight could create some counterplay, suddenly attacking this rook, attacking this pawn. And uh, yeah, white's not completely safe here. So what is the computer wanting to play. It gives a huge advantage to white, but uh, Magnus still has chances to hold a fortress later on. This is the current position. I'm expecting the bishop to just retreat somehow. And uh, Liam, he shouldn't be too direct anymore. I think this is where he should take his foot off and say, okay, I've won material, I've done the hard work. I'm gonna slowly step forward. So for example, bring the bishop back. If the white knight, if the black knight moves, slowly push this pawn, slowly push the central pawn, slowly bring the white king towards the center. Yeah. Uh, I don't think you need to be uh, going straight for the kill anymore. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, the one pawn move that I would never make in a million years is actually to push the E pawn forward. If I did that, I concede all the light squares to black and suddenly that bishop becomes a monster. Yeah, this would be a strong piece. So let's see what the players have in store. Yeah, Liam, he has so much time on the clock. Again, is he making a comeback, winning this game? Magnus Carlsen with an uh, eight game winning streak, maybe losing now and uh, we're gonna go to san francisco to tanya what's going on tanya just a lot of fun here, Gaia. I mean, Magnus just seems unstoppable, as Christopher mentioned himself. Just so impressed with his play. Now, while in there in the playing arena, we've got our players fighting it out. I've got Christopher and a very special guest, Allison, here with us. Christopher will be trying out the ace in the sleeve game. He's already up to level four. Uh, Christopher, are you ready for the challenge? Yes. Magnus scored 39 on this, so you just have to beat his score. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't gotten to level four yet. I'm still on level three. Okay. But after I finish level three, we'll get to level four. Sure. So while he gives this app a try and tells us how well he does it, how much fun he's having, we've got Alison here with us, who also is Christopher's childhood friend. Uh, she's also somebody who's doing a lot of cool stuff here for the chess community. Fem Chess is her not-for-profit organization. Alison, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, FemChess is a nonprofit youth led organization. And what we do is we hold online classes for underprivileged girls. So, all of our classes right now are online, and we have about 50 different um, students and 20 different coaches in a variety of 10 or so levels. And uh, Christopher Yu is our chess advisor who has gone over our curriculum and has kindly revised it to make it the best it can be. That just is such a cool initiative. I want to ask you, what is your vision with Fem Chess? Um, our goal is to bridge the chess gender gap and especially enable underprivileged girls to learn more chess because as we know, chess is a very expensive sport. So with private coaches, 
100, 200 an hour. And some people, they just like don't have the means to do that. So we want to provide that free coaching for them to be able to learn that chess. And do you find a lot of interest in the community amongst girls to take part in this? Yes, I find that girls really, really like learning chess, but then it feels like kind of a social stigma. I feel like guys are more expected to play chess, but then girls, it's um, kind of harder for them to get into the sport because they're just surrounded by men. So we want to um, change that and enable more girls to learn chess. How do you bring a change about in that? So just slowly by slowly, we're, right now we have around 50 students, so we're just uh, coaching them every step of the way. Every week we hold one hour classes and slowly but surely they're improving and they can start competing soon, so yeah. And do they feel more comfortable uh, with chess and more confident with their ability to be able to play in open tournaments as well with this program? Yes, yeah, so actually most of our students are beginners, but we actually do have several that are competing already. So our goal is to get all of our students to be able to start competing and be comfortable in a tournament environment. That's so cool. And you feel very strongly about this. We were chatting earlier and it's so nice to see that you were really involved in this. Yes, I feel very passionate about this because I was really fortunate to be able to afford private coaching. So now I just want to give back to the community that's helped me so much, especially like my mentors, um, my first coach like Joseph Lonsdale and then Judith Starre and Abel Talamantes, who was um, the former director of MI. That's super nice here and we wish you all the best for your for Fem Chess and the vision that you have. Meanwhile, we've got Christopher back here with us. How did you do? I'm about to try level four, so okay, let's go. Let's take a look. A bit, did you have fun? Are you having fun with this? I'm having, a, I'm having an awesome time. Is it tough? <laughs> It, it, it's you know it, it's not it's not too difficult yet, but I'm sure it's going to get extremely difficult the farther you get. All right. Well, we've got Christopher. You here trying out Ace in the sleeve, um, and I see he's struggling a little bit with yeah. this one. We will report back and let you know how he did. Back to you guys in the studio. It's already getting more difficult. <laughs> Seriously, That's fantastic, just... Tanya. And uh, as Tanya told us earlier, she has tested this game. We have to mention Magnus played it at level 12. Uh, the Ace in the Sleeve game, which is a game within the Magnus Chess Academy app that you can now do download on iOS. And Tanya was able to beat Magnus, who had a score of 39 cards. And we are asking you guys as well to share us your results. Uh, take a screenshot. How are you doing? You have to start on level one and make your way towards level 12. And level 12 is where you have three minutes to solve as many cards as possible. That's where Magnus had a result of 39 cards. But uh, share with us your results and maybe what level you are struggling with. Magnus is right now struggling in this game against Liam Le. Is Lia making a comeback, do you think, David? Yes, it does look like White is in full control. Magnus is struggling big time now. And it's all to do with Liam's plan. He's clearly learned from that previous game where he was playing against the Queen. Now he has the Queen and he's simply trying to open up lines towards the Black King. I love Liam's last move, pushing the White G-Pawn forward. I think he's going to push that White G-Pawn even further over the next few moves and trying, if he can, to break through on the King side. Right. Ivanka, do you see any drawing chances here um, for Magnus? It's really dependent on what Liam does. This is uh, the thing. I think Magnus is purely in a reactionary mood. And uh, there you see the queen slide over and she starts eyeing up the king on the right. Um, all Magnus can do, I think, is hold tight, hold the fort, and just to anticipate what Magnus, sorry, what Liam is going to do. So Liam clearly indicating that he's going to push the H pawn, perhaps uh, two squares forward to H4 and then to H5, and then maybe the, yeah, I'm going to get very optimistic with what Liam has planned there on the right. But uh, Magnus just has to batten, batten down the hatches. Yeah, I don't think Liam's even going to play it that slowly, Ivanka. I think he's just going to forget about pushing the white H-pawn. He's just going to push the G-pawn, open up one line. That's all he needs against the Black King. The white rook can swing across to the G-file opposite the Black King, as long as you get one open file towards it. This is where you need your queens. <laughs> Black has no queen to defend. Black's knight is on the other side of the board. Where are the defensive pieces around the Black King? Magnus in, I mean, huge danger right now of just getting steamrolled wow. over the next four or five moves. Could be his first uh, loss then, Magnus, in the tournament after now winning eight games in a row. And actually, after winning the first game today, Magnus reached a new record rating on the Maltor to Champions Chess Tour 2903. 
is his current tour rating. That's just insane. But if he loses this game, I think he's going to go back down under 2,900, probably. So he needs to enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah, and uh, he loves those ratings. He loves the numbers. They really motivate him. That will be disappointing. He'll want to keep this winning streak going as long as he can. It's not every day you get a chance to win a ninth game in a row. But uh, yeah, this one, I think he's just thinking about saving because already it is that desperate. And a long think from him as well. He's yeah. down at just over three minutes against eight now. So it's the clock, the board, the pieces, everything's against the world number one. He brings his bishop back to the center. He's just waiting. Yeah. I He's... mean, really, it's <laughs> difficult to uh, suggest a move for Magnus, I have to say. He just has to wait for the lines to get opened and then use a rook on the horizontal to defend. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything else, to be honest. Yeah, Black will hope that he can uh, have enough defensive resources to at least prolong, uh, at least delay White's attack enough for him to get counterplay. And there we go. Liam is just going brute force straight for the Black King and Magnus surely can't capture this pawn. It's a bit surprising to me that Magnus even put that black H pawn on H6 a few moves ago. That's created a hook. This is what we mean. White pushes his pawn forward and using the black hook, the black pawn on H6, he's just gonna break open the position. Um, he's just gonna tear open some lines and it feels like you have to block it up. You have to block up as many lines towards the black king as possible. Uh, I just don't see anything else. If you take this pawn, White's queen will recapture and White's queen is gonna give checkmate within a few moves. Yeah. It's that simple at the moment. Yeah, the big problem though for Magnus is that if he steps up with a pawn, then uh, okay, we see Magnus trade the knight his for his bishop. And uh, if the pro I was just gonna say, if you, if you step up with the H pawn, the G pawn is gonna be doing a demolition job on the black king side. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna take a step one square forward. Yeah. For example, it will sacrifice its own life just to open up a file. I don't think you can allow this pawn to exist. If you kind of bypass it, then later White's Queen is just going to sneak over, grab this pawn and use uh, the White G6 pawn to deliver some mating threats. This would be terminal. It takes a few moves, but it's game over. And if you do capture, as you say, Yovanka, if you do take this pawn, now White's Rook will switch directions. You could switch with the Queen as well. And you're breaking through. This pawn is just dropping. You can defend it with the king, but now the white queen adds the pressure and you can uh, say goodbye to this game because white's queen and rook together are overpowering that lone black king. I just don't see any way to save it. Uh, this is the current position. How do you keep the lines closed? I mean, it feels like the g-file is just uh, is the way in. White only has one way in, but it's enough. No fortress here. Too many pieces as well to hope for a fortress. If, the, if there was uh, a rook trade, then uh, maybe Black could hope to hold if it's just a queen alone that you're fighting against. But uh, a queen and rook together is too much. Okay, Magnus takes and uh, pushes a pawn. You were right earlier, he's going to try and defend uh, across the board horizontally. So, for example, if the queen steps forward, he's going to use his rook to try and defend this pawn. But, yeah, it doesn't feel like it should be enough. Not only can White switch his rook at the right moment, but he can also start pushing uh, a pawn. This is going to act as a battering ram. Yeah. And, uh, well, he doesn't actually step forward with the rook. Instead, he grabs material, just uh, going for that philosophy. Well, you know, if you're suffering, you might as well suffer with some extra material. Yeah, so at least Magnus has some, some hope of counterplay. He needs three moves to really create a threat. But uh, can he survive three moves? Liam has three or four moves to deliver checkmate, and he's going for it now. He swings the rook across, the black rook moves. The white queen takes a pawn using this pin. The black, white queen cannot be captured. Uh, so Black's Rook shuffles across as well. And all White needs to do is step back, step somewhere safe with this Queen. Yeah, as she should protect her pawn on C5. And then after that, well, there's a pawn that's not working. Okay, he attacks the Bishop. I also quite like this one. And then I was just going to say there's a pawn that's not working, the H pawn. And let's push that one up the board. Yeah. After grabbing material first. Yeah, why not grab material? Now he's taken all the sting out of Black's pawns. This pawn alone won't do any damage. I think we might see Magnus resign soon because, as you mentioned later, Yvanka, this pawn is going to kill the game. This pawn is going to open up the Black King. Magnus, he'll try and survive, but the King is too open. The Black piece is not coordinated. It's the final stages. Wow, just everything going wrong for him in this game. We're only at move 34, 35 now. Yeah, full credit to Liam. He got a great opening, but... A lot of players in the in this tournament, they've got great openings against Magnus, but they haven't finished it off. 
or they've let things turn around, or they've played too passively. He's gone straight for the kill. And uh, we mentioned that his one weakness, maybe Liam, is being direct, but it can also be a great strength, mm -hmm. being direct, and especially against someone like Magnus, before he gets balanced, before he gets control. And uh, yeah, it feels like Liam struck just at the right moment, and Magnus had no answer. And he's closing it out really nicely, very calmly as well, not rushing. That means this match will be tied after Magnus won the first game with uh, two rapid games to go. Will we see a winner in the rapid portion or will it uh, go to a blitz tie breaks? Uh, we also see uh, the other games. Action is happening between Prague and Duda. Duda won the first game and in the second one, Prague sitting in San Francisco, the bar has been over to the young Indian side for big parts of the game, but now I see it's in the middle. So would, is that going to be a draw? What do you think? Ooh, there's a lot of life left in that one uh, between Prague and Duda. I still quite like Prague's chances, mm -hmm. but uh, Duda, as he always does, uh, he's escaped a bit. He's, uh, he's very <laughs> slippery. Lucky. He's very hard. Well, yeah, I want to use the word lucky, but he, he makes his own luck. He's very hard to pin down. Uh, I think anyone looking to defend losing positions should study his games, mm -hmm. uh, Duda, because he's good at creating practical chances, tricking the opponent. Uh -huh. And it's going to be such good news for him if Magnus loses this game against Liam Lair, giving Duda a chance to uh, maybe catch up with Magnus on the standings if Magnus loses today's match and Duda wins his match in the rapid portion. I'm also noticing Giri Ergaisi. Giri lost the first game today, sitting in San Francisco, and the bar is basically saying that he's losing another one against Arjun. Yes, and that one should be over quite soon. Wow. Arjun is winning a rook and pawn end game, and I think in quite a simple manner. He's just got a couple of extra pawns there. Uh, yeah, Giri just, it's been a downhill few days for him. Yeah. He started the tournament so well. The thing is, uh... He, Giri seems to be in a pensive mood. You know, I was l looking back at some of the older interviews, and even after he won his game against uh, his match against Liam Le in the very first round, he did kind of mention that he didn't necessarily enjoy playing chess, but yeah. he did enjoy winning. Uh huh. And I wonder whether that's a source of the problem as well. He's just not relaxed enough when he's actually performing. He's, uh, you know, he enjoys the result, of course, but there's too much tension when he's playing chess. Mm. Something's up. Anish Giri is struggling. But we have seen earlier in the Tour Finals a huge comeback from him after losing two games against Prague. He did win two rapid games and he won the match in tiebreak. So it's still possible for Anish Giri. Wesley So, he won the first game today against Shakhria and Mamadiarov and the bar is over to his side in game two as well. Could go up by two points. Wesley So, Mamadiarov struggling playing at night in Azerbaijan. Not the best uh, time for him to play chess. But Liam Le, he is uh, sitting at home in St. Louis. It's a good time for him to play chess. The bar has gone slightly down, but is he still winning this game against Magnus? He should be. Uh, I think until we see either that black pawn create some serious counterplay by running down the board or maybe an exchange of rooks, then, then perhaps Magnus has some chances. But until we see that happen, it feels like it's all about the black king. Liam's idea, at least it's very human. Uh, he's lifted his rook up the board. He's going to swing that rook across. Just one square to the right to the H-file. He's going to step it behind the white queen and try to head for some checkmating ideas. If he can support the queen, coordinate those two pieces together, then it should be game over. But uh, the computer thinks Magnus might have some chances to defend now. I think from a human's point of view, though, when you're down at two minutes, when you're facing a queen, so many countless threats almost, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be too much uh, to handle. <coughs> Yeah, but you know, it's Magnus, it and, Magnus. <laughs> I, and I suspect that uh, his only hope lies in pushing that B-pawn. And whereas if we look at Liam's plan, it kind of involves a trade of rooks if he's going to capture that G-pawn. G OK, and I don't think he's going to bother with pawns, Yvank. I think he wants he checkmate. Checkmate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes. the problem is, how does the black... I mean, maybe at some point we'll see the black king start running towards the centre. How does the Black King stay safe behind its own pawns? Uh, simply rook h3, the white rook shifting across one square, that's going to create some yeah. diabolical threats. Yeah, I did miss that when the king runs over, the queen does have a checking square on d8. Yeah, I'm already struggling to find a defence for Magnus. Magnus clearly struggling to find a defence as well. Under two minutes now, let's just show the threat. So, for example, Black here 
okay, he moves his rook across, what is the idea? So for example, if he'd pushed, pushed his pawn, then rook h3 does create almost unstoppable checkmating ideas. You can't even run now, uh, as you mentioned, Yvanka, just because uh, if the king starts running, this would end the game immediately. And uh, okay, this is on the cards now. Liam has created a checkmating threat. He has shuffled his rook across. So the idea is queen to h8 into the corner, trapping the king. Magnus, he has to move his rook. He cannot move his king. He has to move his rook somewhere just to create an escape square for his king. I'm not sure whether you step up the board, maybe you step across. You have to run away. You have to flee as fast as possible with the black king. I mean, that's the only thing you can do. You have to move this rook. Remember, king f8 falls into immediate checkmate. We've seen Prague blunder into mate in one. I don't think we'll see Magnus do the same. Uh, so, okay, he has to move his rook out the way. This is the square the king wants to use. And he steps back. Okay, so at least now he can run. Still feels like it's teetering on the edge. Yeah, it feels sh shaky as anything. And the queen comes and gives check. King runs. And I'm suspecting the rook will move one square to the g3 square, attack the pawn on g7. And black's rooks will be so passive. Yeah, if black has to put his rook on this square just to defend, then it's not going to be uh, happy days for Magnus. White can start pushing this pawn forward, for example. Um, yeah, plenty of ways to win this game, surely. One passive rook means you will never have counterplay. Yeah, and Liam does indeed shuffle his rook across. And this one, yeah, I think now we can say Liam is a heavy favourite mm -hmm. uh, to convert. It shouldn't take too much longer. Could be a huge result this for the Tour Finals. Magnus losing this game. If he ends up losing the match, then anything can happen with uh, two days to go. It's going to be a fun weekend here in the Tour Finals. No matter what, Magnus after this match still has Prague left tomorrow and he's going to finish off against Duda on the very final day. And imagine if whoever wins that final match, Duda Magnus is the winner of the Tour Finals. That is the dream scenario, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait for that matchup. Because uh, traditionally, Magnus has had the upper hand when he plays Duda. Mm -hmm. But in the last tournament, the AIM Chess Rapid, it was Duda that knocked Magnus out. That's true, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's on great form. Yeah. And uh, there comes the H pawn. It's two squares away from its destination. And Magnus just has to retreat the rook. Um, the f5 rook, put it on f6, just curl up in the smallest ball possible and start praying. Yeah, <laughs> he's got to pray to all the gods here because, uh, yeah, it's just hopeless. It's beyond hopeless at this point. You just need a trick. And white's moves are just so straightforward. That's what we talk about in chess sometimes. We can see the evaluation bar clearly on white's side and unless there's a massive blunder, it will stay that way. It's not the type of position where uh, if white doesn't find the best move every time, it will immediately drop. This is the type of position where it's going to stay uh, in white's favour for a long time. And as Yvanka mentioned, the black rook, uh, rook drops back, but white's queen is now free to retreat and maybe change angles, switch tack, and looking good. Yeah, he had uh, Wesley So looking over his shoulder there, Magnus Carlsen. It's another win for Wesley against Mamadiarov. So now, with only a draw in Game 3 with the white pieces, Wesley will win that match. Same situation for Eric Icy. He only needs a draw in game three against Geary to win the match. This one, if, and I think maybe I can say now, when Magnus loses, this match will definitely go to four games. We are in for a lot of action between Liam Le and Magnus Carlsen today. 13, 12 seconds, 10 seconds, and the, and the world champion has terrible position. Six seconds, five, four. You have to make a move, Magnus. They lose on time. No, no. Ooh, he makes that move with two seconds left, and that's often a telltale sign. That's a giveaway that Magnus is struggling when he's this low on the clock. Um, it's normally because the game has been going against him the whole time, or there's too many options. And here there's a lot of options for black, of course, but they're all losing. And uh, he attacks the white queen. The white queen can retreat anywhere along the diagonal, any safe square. Um, I think just plant it in the middle of the board. Does she have to move? There is a tactic ah, on true. the board. Don't even have to move, you're and right, that's, that's the move that I would instinctively would play. I wouldn't even think. I would just pick up my rook and capture the pawn on g7. Yeah, take this pawn. And he doesn't go for it, but this would have been a nice way to win. This would have been a check. And after the rook is captured, the other rook is no longer protected. And uh, you've won a pawn in the process. 
Maybe Liam just wanted to keep uh, a set of rooks on the board, but this would have been a killer. The H-pawn now would be passed and it would be uh, about to promote. So this would have ended the game pretty much. Instead of taking this pawn, he dropped back to the center. I, I saw this one as well. I thought, oh, this looks good. Uh, but Magnus now, he's reacted by pushing to G5. So he's hoping that uh, any checks can be met by the black king moving. But uh, en passant as well is legal. You it can is take legal. this pawn. And uh, I do wonder whether Liam will have a chuckle when that move is when that move was played, primarily because Duda did this to him as well. Yeah. So it's an unexpected unexpected move, and uh, it's unfortunately just like in the game with Duda, you know, it was unsatisfactory, but a. Uh, has good surprise value. Yeah. And Rook takes pawn on the board. Yeah, I was going to say, you can be flashy here, and Liam is flashy. He takes this pawn, and uh, the whole idea is now there's a check, and when the king moves, you'll pick up one of the two black rooks, no matter what. And the king does shuffle across, and uh, it hides out in the corner, so finally you find a safe square, and you've traded one set of rooks. But uh, unfortunately, white does have potential for a second pass pawn. These two are going to start marching. And here we go. One of them steps forward. The other one's going to join now. If these two white pawns didn't exist, maybe you have some chances to draw. But uh, there we see on Magnus's camera, there's no chance now. Black's rook is all, also just paralyzed. It's stuck. You're playing without a rook. He even gives up his central pawn just to free that piece. But white can take it. White has three passed pawns, and this will be enough to win the game. I think we'll see Magnus resign any moment now. White will take that pawn with a lot of pleasure. And it's going to be game over. Queen yeah. takes pawn, queen okay, give Magnus. a check, anything can be played. And Does he Magnus... even remember how to resign though, Magnus? <laughs> it's been a long time since he yeah. lost a game. Not since, not in this tournament. I think it's been a month since he lost a game. Yeah. Uh, maybe since he lost to Duda uh, six, uh, <coughs> in the last tournament. Or maybe in the Fisher Random uh, World Championship. That was the last time he lost. But then you don't have to press resign. True. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's just going through the motions. He's forcing Liam to show he knows how to win, but yeah, unfortunately here everything wins. So a couple of checks, and then we will see white pick off that pawn in the middle. And that is basically the, the end. That is the death bell, yeah. Mm. It's gonna ring, and uh, wow, look at Liam. He doesn't even bother capturing that pawn. Instead, he just walks his king over to the action. God, that is nice. Yeah, it's unnecessary. You could have just taken that pawn for free, pretty much. But he has the idea of maybe trying to checkmate. And in order to checkmate, remember, you can't use a queen alone. You need the support of other pieces. Often that's your own king in the endgame. Uh, so the white king will close the door. It will cover the escape squares of the black king. And then the white queen will try uh, to sneak behind and deliver checkmate. For example, if the white queen can somehow get to the h8 square in the corner from behind, that black king is trapped. And there we see the evaluation bar does react. Um, this is a mating net. The black king has no safe haven to, to hide on anymore. Yeah. And there we go, Magnus does finally admit defeat. Losing his first game in the Tour Finals, Magnus Carlsen is now tied with Liam Lea. This is such an important match, and they are now tied. Bad game for Magnus Carlsen. Magnus, uh, enterprising opening play by Liam there, put you in pressure from the start? Yeah, I mean, I uh, really played poorly and I was actually relieved to sack the queen, uh, but uh, it wasn't so easy and I think he played well after that. You seem like you're still in a good mood, coming out smiling, not something we see you often after a tough game. No, I mean, um, it's still 1-1, so that's okay. All right, good luck. That is very true. They are tied after two games and uh, Magnus will have the white pieces in game three starting in 15 minutes. What happened in this very first game that he lost in the tournament, David? Simply it was a bad opening for the world number one. Liam got a dominant advantage and converted it very nicely. But Magnus said he was relieved to sacrifice his queen. Actually giving up the black queen was the decisive mistake, objectively. Here, black, as Magnus uh, played in the game, he captured this knight. But after uh, the white bishop took the black knight, this pin did cost black his queen. After bishop takes bishop, the black queen disappeared. And as we saw, Liam converted this very nicely in the end. But Magnus had a, had a nice way to actually save the queen. He could have jumped in the way with the black knight, given up one of his knight's life for the black queen, jumping just to break the connection between the rook and queen. For example, if the knight is captured, now 
he is safe to take the white knight, and maybe he would have had chances to save the game. Ultimately, he didn't find this move, however, and he did fall to defeat. All right. And this is a golden opportunity then for Jan Christoph Duda to catch up with Magnus on the overall uh, standings. He lost the match yesterday and is three points behind Magnus in the tour finals. He won the first game today against Prague, but is Prague making a comeback just like Liam Lair? Yeah, we've jumped in just as Prague wins a piece. He had that dream queen and knight combo that we talk about quite a lot on the tour, Yvanka. Yeah. Queen and knight together works so well. And uh, they're going to carry on working very well as uh, they're about to deliver a series of devastating checks. I mean, the only thing that uh, Prague has to be careful of is he must not exchange queens. Mm -hmm. As long as he doesn't do that, then he is home and dry. Yep, and he's fixated on giving checkmate to that black king. Another great thing for Prague in his position is the white king. Look how safe it is. No checks are available. And I think we'll see Duda resign. Checkmate was coming in the next few moves. No safety for that black king. Wow, another comeback here in uh, the Tour Finals. Day five, Prague winning game two to tie the match against Jan Christoph Duda. That means we will definitely see four games between these two as well. And we'll be here from Prague after that uh, great comeback. Prague, a much needed comeback win in this match. How are you feeling for the remaining two games? Yeah, it's good that I managed to come back with the white. And yeah, I got a very, very big advantage out of the opening. But I don't think I played really well. I, I think I had a lot of counterplay. Uh, but somehow in time trouble, I managed to uh, uh, win the game. Got a big one coming up. All the best. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Must be very happy, Prague. It's always nice to make a comeback. We came in super late in the game, of course, David. But uh, could we take a look at it? Yeah, and the final stages were actually very instructive. Prague won the game in the end, as we just saw there, utilizing his queen and knight together in perfect harmony. But Duda did have chances to save it. Uh, Prague got a good opening. Duda balanced up the game. And it was here where Duda made the final mistake. Black needed to push his pawns. He needed to just forget that the white is promoting. He needed to rush forward, for example, with the c-pawn. And if white makes a new queen now, then suddenly it's not so clear anymore. Black's queen will come back with a check, and Black's pawns will start to run. Anything was still possible here. However, Duda took his foot off the pedal just for one move. Instead of pushing his pawns in this position, he moved his queen back one square, and this allowed White's knight to come and capture this black bishop. If the bishop disappears, of course, White makes a new queen, therefore the bishop stepped back. But here we see the end, just as where, uh, just as where we joined it, and uh, checkmate is coming. Simply, the queen and knight together are too strong. Black's king alone cannot hold the fort. Black's queen offside. And this is how Prague won the game. So they are tied. Jan Christoph Duda winning game one, but losing game two. He will have the white pieces in game three against Prague starting in 11 minutes. Is Prague now starting a uh, winning streak against Duda? We're going to follow that game between uh, the two young players and Prague. What a season he's had on the Malfoyer Champions Chess Tour. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Just to have this move on your radar is incredible. He's too good for this age. What a player, Prague Nananda. Crazy tactics. Prague is just showing off now. It's just a masterpiece. Unbelievable how he finds that move. We've got to call that Prague style. Surely there's a checkmate now, and there we go. Prague finds a really nice pattern. Checkmate next move. Prague he's calculated everything out so cleanly. Wow. Cliff edge. Yeah. But, oh, wow, what a move. Black cuts the coordination between White's queen and the second rank, and is Magnus about to resign? Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, loses to 16-year-old Pragnananda. Prague still hasn't played four games. Fireworks non-stop. Every move is a really crazy, unexpected blow. It's a very good pawn as well. Yeah. Yeah. Prague wow. takes it. Wow. 16-year-old Pragnananda is ready for the final in Chessable Masters. <laughs> what a season it's been for the 17-year-old. Uh, not many people knew who Pragnananda was nine months ago, but uh, in the air, things master beating Magnus Carlsen and being one of the top players for a whole season on the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. 
he is uh, now one of the top chess players in the world. And he is also one of the players in San Francisco challenged in the new Magnus Chess Academy app. We are asking all of you to uh, download this app if you do have an Apple device. And in the Magnus Chess Academy app, test out the game called Ace in the Sleeve. You start out on level one, and we have challenged the players all the way up on level 12. So how did Anish, Wesley, and Prague do in this game? So I have to place a three with Bishop here. What? Shoot. Oh, there we go. Jesus, it's so hard. <laughs> Okay, this one is going to be tough. So put a pawn. Yeah, it's imaginative. Huh? It's fun. Oh shit, 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 shit. Oh, shoot. The sound is pretty funny. Oh yeah. I think getting harder. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can put a pawn anywhere. Oh no, shit, seriously. I don't think I'm getting it. Ah, uh, oh, shit. That was hard, huh? I'm good at this stuff, yeah? Wow, Anish Giri. I'm, I'm not even surprised. He is just the champion of stuff like that. 69! Yeah, he's so multi-talented. He seems to win everything. When he was in Oslo, we gave a quiz to the players. He won that a couple yeah. of times as well. He's uh, a master at everything he does, Anish Giri. Yeah. Did, didn't he win the escape room as well? Uh, probably. Yeah, I think he did. And uh, yeah, that's a great game. I was trying to solve the puzzles as well. And I just loved seeing the <laughs> reactions of the players yeah. you know, when they were panicking and trying to place the cards. I mean, what a brilliant game. I and know. it's never been done before, something like that. So it's great to see such a no novel concept. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for you guys at home to also show us how you're doing, how you're finding it. Yeah. Take a screenshot of uh, how you're doing, what level you're at, what level you're struggling at. And if you do make it all the way to level 12, let us know if you are able to beat Magnus Carlsen. He managed to do 39 cards or even Anish Giri doing 69 cards in three minutes at level 12. We're going to go to San Francisco where they're also uh, playing uh, this uh, game in the Magnus Chess Academy app. How many did you do, Tanya? I got a score of 43, I think, so uh, not too bad. Uh, by the way, Christopher is still at it. He is trying to beat Magnus' score as well, so a lot of uh, ace in the sleeve going on here. Meanwhile, we've got a special guest joining us, Kaya. It's Paul from the Mechanics Institute, the oldest chess club in the country. Right. Paul, it's just such a legendary place. You must be so proud of it. I am very proud to be working there. I um, first joined the Mechanics Institute in 1972 when I was 12 years old during the Fisher Spassky match. So I've been around for a while there. Uh, we were there the first day of the event and Anish, Prague, and then you had a tournament going on. Tell us a little bit about the local community's involvement currently with the Mechanics Institute. Okay, so um, we supplied some chess sets that you're using here um, and chess boards and um, we came to the opening reception and uh, watched Magnus uh, mm -hmm. give his uh, talk um, and uh, we're, you know, you came and uh, uh, oh, yeah, so yeah, there, this is a historic club here at the um, Mechanics. Uh, there's Daniel Narodzitsky, who uh, played chess there as a kid. I'm not sure what uh, other, uh, we have a historic wall with all sorts of pictures. We uh, run scholastic events, um, just the tournaments uh, fill the chess club up with players. Uh, we're very proud of the club. Uh, young players coming up through the club like Christopher Yu and uh, Daniel and uh, other strong players. And not just from the current generation, you've had so many world champions, many world champions. at the club. Yes, I was very fortunate to play Mikhail Tall at the club. One of the highlight of my chess career, he came for a blitz tournament 
and we played uh, a, a few Blitz games. I got the chance to play uh, him. Um, we've had Petrosian at the club, uh, Smyslov, Lasker, Capablanca, Alakine. It's a Karpov. Many, many famous players have come to the club. We're very proud of the chess club. That's quite the list. And while we were seeing some of the images from the chess club, it really does break a lot of barriers. You've got these kids playing with older players. You've got women. You've got men. It's just amazing to see how everyone comes together for chess. Yeah, we're um, like I said, we're, we feel like we're the center of chess in, uh, in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And we're very proud of that long tradition. Um, it's uh, an exciting place to work. Many things happen through the club, including this tour of which we're, you know, proud to collaborate with you folks very we're, much so. We're so honored to as well to be able to partner up with uh, the Mechanics Institute. And now just something different. I also know that you have been involved with the development of one of the first chess games uh, well an app or I, I have no idea how it was called at the time but uh, in back in 1985 tell us about that yeah well there was a friend of mine who was a software developer and uh, he was um, uh, did a, uh, a a series of, of um, software programs uh, around chess uh, teaching chess and also um, there were some opening books and stuff like that that were put on software the the uh, you probably could Find it was for Commodore 64 and Apple II, so it was a long time ago. Um, I'm not a software developer myself, but I supplied some chess knowledge that way back in the day. <laughs> Things have changed a lot. <laughs> a lot, but um, it's still the same wonderful game uh, played on 64 squares, and we're all enjoying it so much. Well, 64 squares right now, we just saw Magnus Carlsen walk into the room to sit on his screen as he's got a big game three coming up against Liam. Action starting soon, guys. Definitely. How cool to hear from both of you, Tanya and Paul. And uh, I did hear about that game that Paul created, Learn Chess with Paul, I think it was called, came out in 1985. And today, the Magnus Carlsen, uh, the, uh, the Magnus Chess Academy app coming out. I, I think stuff has happened to video games and, you know, <laughs> online games since 1985. Yeah, the graphics might be slightly different, <laughs> yeah. but uh, as Paul said, it's still chess. It's still what we love to learn, the patterns, everything. And uh, as long as people are enjoying it, I want to check out that old game, actually. I know. And, um, yeah, if I can get hold of an old console like that, then uh, why not? Yeah. Super fun, super fun. And remember to download Magnus Chess Academy app launching today. What a cool app. All right, we need to take a look at the results so far today. Day five in the tour finals. Wesley So has won two games against Mamadjarov. And with a draw or a win in game three, he's going to finish the match. Same situation for Arjun. Eric Icy, he struggled so much in the start of the tournament, but he won his match yesterday. And look at that, winning two games already today. Arjun with a draw win in game three against Anish. It's gonna be a match win for Arjun. Super dramatic for Anish. But Magnus Carlsen and Liam Lea, they are tied, winning one game each. And so are Jan Christoph Duda and Pragnananda winning one game each. So we are going to follow game three, where Jan Christoph Duda will have the white pieces against uh, Prague. And it's quite uh, equal between these two on the tour. Yeah, they've uh, traded blows with each other. We remember that really dramatic game that Duda won in Miami, that checkmate in one. If not for that one move, the score would be 5-5 in terms of victories. So a lot of decisive action. They've actually had more decisive games, far more decisive games than they have had draws. So that uh, promises a good fight for us today. And Pragnananda will fight from Shack 15 inside the Ferry Building in San Francisco. These two have been the top players behind Magnus Carlsen this season on the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. For a long time, it was Prague in that second place overall. But Paduda has now overtaken that second place and probably will end up as number two on the tour overall this season. And with the white pieces, uh, Duda, in game three, what do you expect, Ivanka? He's going to be direct. Yeah. Uh, he will be cross. He will be looking for revenge. And it will be something aggressive that he will put uh, Pragnanda under some pressure. I don't doubt that. And they see Prag getting ready to sit in his seat. Do the players get their own dedicated chairs? I bet. Mm. Yeah. Probably. 
just for comfort and uh, Secret Lab we have teamed up with. They provide these really nice chairs yeah. for the players. Yeah, we sat on them in the Oslo eSports. Oh, they are so comfortable. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, well, Duda begins with a D and he's pushed his D pawn two squares forward. And are we going to see something? Are we going to see, I was going to say, Pragnanda push the E pawn or the G pawn? Mm -hmm. So we see Prag push the e-pawn and now block things up, so it's transposed into the Catalan. Uh, this is actually what they played earlier in game one of the day. Still, they're copying that game. Who has done their homework better? White blocks a check. This is still following the lines of that earlier game between the two that Duda won. He got an opening advantage in game one of today. So I'm really fascinated to see where Prag's improvement is. Look at the evaluation bar as well. It quite likes white, the computer preferring white at this early stage already. Prague must have spent the break time, that 10, 15 minutes that the players have between games, looking at this with his coach. Ramesh is probably then San Fran right now, just with a computer saying, OK, this is what you should play. This is where you should improve. Um, this is how top players prepare nowadays. And meanwhile, Black defending a pawn. And uh, yeah, it's up to Duda. At will, he can regain his pawn. In the Catalan, often you sacrifice temporarily just to open up white's light-squared bishop. So it's all about the tension between those light-squared bishops right now. It's also quite reminiscent of uh, Magnus in that last game, Liam <coughs> against Carlsen. The pawn structure is almost identical. Yeah. Wow. And uh, that last bishop move has been the change that Prague has made. I was just checking. Uh, in the first game, uh, Prague actually pushed the A-pawn two squares forward to defend the B-pawn here. Duda is on his own now. Mm -hmm. So we have the first improvement, yep. as we call it, the first uh, innovation. I'm not sure if it's a novelty in general in the history of chess, but at least in the clash between these two, uh, it's a new move. Novelty according to my database. Now, my database isn't necessarily the most comprehensive, but uh, we're going to take its word for it. Oh, we love novelties. Yep. Uh, brand new move. This position never been seen before. And that's why Duda's got that face right now, <laughs> frowning, uh, wondering what the difference is. This is very logical. Black protects a pawn. Black develops a bishop. So surely in his opening preparation, he should have examined this move, should have come across it, or at least considered it. But uh, yeah, Prague will be feeling confident that he got the first surprise in. Often that's just the key. No matter when your novelty is, as long as you get the first idea in, you surprise your opponent first. And will he be aware it's a novelty, Pragnananda? Will this be something he has prepared? Yes. Um, it's something either that he prepared himself or his coach told him to do. And his coach will have explained why it was such a strong move or mm. why this move order was slightly more accurate than the move order he played in game one, where he got in a bit of trouble, Prague. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's Duda who's unaware whether it's a novelty or whether it's uh, just Prague freestyling. Yeah, and it's a different plan as well, because in that first game, Prague was actually lifting the rook on a8, moving it to the seventh row and swinging it across. Here, he's just saying, OK, I'm taking a different approach, which is simply to return the extra pawn, and I'm going to focus on developing the pieces. Yeah, and Black will focus on developing the pieces. Let's maybe show where the novelty was. The brand new move doesn't look that special, but it looks very sensible, at least, uh, was to play this one. In that earlier game, Prague immediately pushed his pawn, his pawn forward, and as Yvanka mentioned, after White's rook came across, Black's rook lifted up. This one does look a bit odd, uh, what he did in game one. Uh, he wanted to shift the rook across, maybe, but uh, his move now at least looks far more sensible. He moves the bishop, and what, uh, the Black idea here is all based upon the fact that White's two pieces here cannot get into the game. So, for example, White can regain a pawn. White can take this undefended pawn either with his queen or with his knight, say he takes with the queen. Uh, the issue is long term, even if white gains material uh, over the next few moves, these two pieces, how are they ever going to develop? You can't get your rook out unless the knight moves, but the knight can't move because at the moment this pawn dominates the knight. It controls the two squares that the knight can uh, jump to to develop. So white actually has to take a timeout at some point, Duda. For example, he might need to, uh, maybe even in the current position, might need to move his bishop back just to create this square for the knight to jump to. And uh, if he can jump out, then he breathes, breathes a sigh of relief. Uh, but yeah, Duda needs to be a bit clever with his development. Prague is playing against those two pieces. This is very modern chess as well. Often you don't care about pawns material, you just care about piece activity uh, in modern chess. And that's these two pieces. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you, David. My vibe was actually to retreat the bishop right now and just contort yourself on the back row. I call it back row chess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whenever I write, I have to play like this in my notes, I'm like, yeah, living on the back rank. And uh, there we see Prague develop his queen. And I'm fully expecting 
the white knight to also take a step forward to move to d2 so that it can capture on c4. Yeah, and Prague's whole idea as well is that the Catalan, the, the opening that white has chosen, is all based on this light squared bishop and how strong it is on the diagonal. So Prague wants to swap it off. Uh, if, if white does indeed move his knight, then black will take the time to push a pawn and he's going to trade off white's pride and joy. Uh, if this bishop disappears, then white's king actually becomes a bit open on the light squares later on. So uh, I do like what Prague is doing. I, I think he's prepared really well. I agree. It's a good preparation. And it's, it's a sign of confidence as well to repeat exactly the same opening Ooh, that oh, you yeah. played and lost in the first game against the very same opponent as well. So uh, there you see Prague rocking in his chair and uh, he captures the pawn with the queen and here comes the breakout anyhow. Yeah, so this is actually a, pa a pawn sacrifice mm. from Prague. He's willing to give up a pawn. One moment he was a pawn up, he's about to be a pawn down. But the only goal is to trade off those light squared bishops. If black hadn't broken out now, he might never have broken out. He would have been kept in a bind forever. So uh, I really like it. It's clearly been uh, approved by the computers, the fact that Prague is playing it so quickly. And this is also the benefit of having a coach on site, Ramesh, during game one, maybe even during game two, was just sitting there with a the computer analyzing, preparing, finding where uh, Prague could have improved. And this is it. It's now move 17, and Prague has played each one of his moves instantly. And uh, he's given up a pawn, but now he's going to try and regain it. The black rook now is eyeing up that white queen. Yeah, there's actually no way that white can hold on to that extra pawn. I mean, I was thinking if you retreat the knight, then uh, black is simply going to add more fuel to the fire and attack the pawn again. Yeah. Oh, this is uh, looking like excellent preparation from Pragnananda. Yeah, and I think he's gone a lot deeper. Duda's frowning here. Maybe he's uh, surprised. And to be honest, uh, I would be a bit surprised too that black is playing so quickly. You mentioned that uh, white has one extra pawn here and uh, can you keep it intact? If you defend it with the knight, as you mentioned, Ivanka, then black's knight, one of the two knights can come and just grab this pawn next move. Uh, it, this pawn is doomed. You're attacking it three times now. It can't be defended. But the question I would be asking myself is what happens if white steps forward with this pawn? Uh, because it is defended on this square. The black queen is attacked. You can't take this pawn yet. At least I don't think so. Uh, so you would have to move the black queen. Will Duda go for this? I think he will. Uh, when the black queen moves, Maybe this is Prague's idea that the white knight is a bit unstable in the center, but it still requires kind of understanding and knowledge over the next three or four moves. Black still needs to be accurate to win this pawn back later, because if this pawn survives, white's going to win the game. This pawn is too strong. It's too, only two squares away from promotion. Maybe his idea later is to use the rook as well to come and take this pawn later. But uh, yeah, I think it's just a battle about this one pawn on c5. Yeah. If it survives, White is winning. If it drops, black is at least equal. Yeah, and uh, white does also has to be very careful that in the battle to preserve that extra pawn, they don't make too many positional concessions because once black does, in fact, win the pawn, then white's position could collapse. Yeah, it's not just two bad pieces now that we talked about that were undeveloped, but white has made his bishop bad just to uh, create a knight uh, square for his knight. White's bishop takes a long, long time to get into the game. It's just staring at a wall of pawns over here on this diagonal. It's not a great piece. So you're right, Yovanka. If white can't find anything direct, then he's got to be really careful about timing. If everything gets traded off, for example, if white does take a negative decision like retreating, which isn't due to style, so I'd be surprised if this happens, then suddenly after the knight jumps, say again, if white develops, suddenly knight takes pawn and we'll see a situation where after the white queen moves, black. Black is better because white has one really, really bad piece. And uh, okay, Duda doesn't, of course, step back and start retreating. Not his style. Uh, he offers a queen trade instead. Interesting decision. If the queens disappear, then suddenly this white rook, which wasn't developed, we said it was a bad piece, it has come to life o on an open file. It has targets. For example, that would be a really nice tactic here. Actually, this should go down in the books when we talk about pinning. If bishop takes pawn, white can win on the spot <laughs> by playing bishop takes pawn. It looks like this black pawn was defended, but white is pinning black on this line and oh. on this line. So this bishop is poisoned. It's uh, untouchable. Uh, if you take it with the pawn, you lose your rook in the corner. If you take it with the bishop, uh, sorry, in this position, if you take it with the black bishop, you lose your rook on the c file. So uh, Two this is pins. double pins. <laughs> this is something you nearly never see in chess, uh, a double pin uh, to win the game. 
I've actually never seen something like that. And I can tell you, when you make a move of such brilliance, you also have a big smile, just like the Cheshire Cat, <laughs> or just like Jan Chistov Duda, uh, when he played that amazing checkmate. So that's a beautiful spot, yeah. David. Yeah. We know Duda likes to smile at his own moves, so uh, Prague will try and stop that. So we do think that Queen takes Queen is a mistake because it opens up this white rook in the corner. Uh, therefore, I'm expecting uh, Prague... He's out of his preparation now, first think of the game, but I'm expecting him to dodge the queen exchange. Ah, there's yeah. something about the sort of the symmetry of your two pins there on the analysis board as well. Yeah. Beautiful chess art. Yeah, this position, uh, <laughs> it's definitely diagram worthy in a book. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't think we'll see Prague fall for that trick. Yeah, probably not, but it would be yeah. kind of fun. It would be kind of fun. We do have uh, a lot of drama going on today. Day five in the Tour Finals. Two players are in must-win situations. One of them is Anish Giri sitting in San Francisco together with Prague there. He has to win game three here against Arjun Aragaisi to take it to a game four. And so does Shahriyar and Mamad Yarov. He is down by two points against Wesley So, who has had a fantastic day winning both of the first two days. And we're going to hear what Wesley said after winning game two. Wesley, a two-point match lead. Looking good. Yeah, as I said yesterday, I think whoever wins the first game has a huge advantage. You have like an 80% chance to win, I must say, because the players here are all very strong. They're very evenly matched. Uh, maybe except Magnus. <laughs> so uh, it's when you lose the first game, it's just psychologically, mentally very difficult to come back. I mean, I don't know what Shaq's thinking, but I think I have a pretty good shot winning this match. Speaking of coming back, Shaq tried it in this game with the white pieces. We saw a creative H4, H5 early advance, but you kept everything under control and played it out super calmly. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, first of all, I didn't expect him to play the English. I thought he'd play his usual 1D4 and you know prepare some deep preparation stuff just like in game one uh i guess one c4 i usually play e5 but this term i have been testing c5 quite a bit and i think though his d3 bishop d2 is just uh over the board inspiration like i think white usually plays h4 instead of d3 and white has some chances there but d3 bishop d2 i think overboard inspiration i'm not sure I mean, at least I was very happy to get the playable position and not lose right out of the opening, like against Le Kwang. But um, yeah, basically we got a very complicated position, so he got exactly what he wanted. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't, I don't think I was that worse. And when the queens were traded, I was very happy because then we get into <laughs> quite an equal endgame. I'm not sure whether his move h6 was correct. I mean, he could delay that move. He has several tempting options, such as hg6, or even castling long on some lines. And then also castle long. But for, yeah, it's a nice game. Yeah, you seem to have shut down all the counterplay after that uh, queen trade. Game three yeah. coming up. I want to ask you, Wesley, what's the approach for the next one? I'll try to get the draw in one of the two games. <laughs> <laughs> Loving the honesty. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, Wesley. <laughs> he is a fun guy, Wesley So, and the bar has been definitely over to his side uh, almost the whole time in this Game 3, so it's not very unlikely, I guess, that he's going to get that draw in Game 3. No, I mean, if someone can lock the game down and secure a draw without too much trouble, it's going to be Wesley. Mm. He has this incredible talent for getting draws when he needs to. <laughs> he's so pragmatic. And uh, whilst the players are thinking, we do see that uh, Duda has gone into, sorry, Prague has gone into a very deep thing. Five minutes! I know, you know, he's been certainly surprised by that queen move, queen move from Duda. Well, we do have some people who have taken up our challenge. So nice. we're asking today, can you beat Magnus Carlsen's score? You know, we're asking you to download the app from the Magnus Chess Academy and play the game Ace in the Sleeve. And uh, Patrice Gluck says that they are on level, that there are 39 on level 12. They ask, when can I play Magnus? <laughs> <laughs> and Badri goes even one better. He says, yay, 42 wow, that's cards. Beating better Magnus. than Magnus, better than Wesley. Finally able to beat Magnus's score. It's 3 a.m. here, and hopefully I'll go and get some sleep now. We have to be Alpha Zero to beat Anish in this. Wow. <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah. yeah. It's very impressive.
but it's possible this is your chance to beat world champion Magnus Carlsen at something chess related. The ace in the sleeve game inside the Magnus Chess Academy app. I'm so impressed. First, by making it to level 12. That's going to take me a long time. And second of all, beating Magnus' score of 39 cards in that game. Wow. Yeah, we knew we had some very strong viewers, uh, some great chess players out there watching our show. But yeah, that's another level, beating, yeah. beating Magnus and beating Wesley. I thought Wesley would be very good. He's great with the pattern recognition, former Frisha random world champion. Yeah, impressive stuff. Yeah. Prague also did good in this. He's great at puzzles and stuff like that, right, Prague? Yeah, we saw when uh, we set David's impossible puzzle yeah. that he was like, yeah, yeah, it's Queen A8. <laughs> yeah. Five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the rest of us had to actually rack our brains and uh, think very hard. Yeah. I love puzzles like that. And uh, so I, cool. I can't quite remember when it was uh, created, when, when that puzzle was composed, but it was, I think it was composed by Sam Lloyd one of the most famous chess composers ah. of puzzles and he, he does the most he does some fantastic puzzles wow. if anyone wants to also solve as many puzzles as possible then i would check out him cool sam lloyd chess i'm going to put that into google later <laughs> sam lloyd chess puzzles how cool Chess fossils are fun and the chess apps are fun. The new Magnus uh, Chess Academy app is just a fantastic app for improving your chess and having fun with it. Just playing some really cool chess related games. Prague is thinking again for a long time. He is ticking down on the clock. We're gonna go to San Francisco where Prague is sitting and where Tanya is uh, our roving reporter. What's happening, Tanya? Such a fun app, Kaya. I can't agree with you more. Between the games and the interviews, that's pretty much all we're doing here in the mix zone uh, on the app. Ace in the sleeve, that's the game everyone wants to be on right now. Uh, but for now, we have another very special guest with us. It is Yuyanga. She is an economist and a chess player. And in her life, chess has played a big role. Uyanga, welcome to the show. It's so nice having you with us. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Tell us a little bit about the role of chess. You are from Mongolia, now you're at UC Berkeley. Yeah. What role did chess play? Chess plays such a profound role in my life because, um, you know, I started playing like, very little when I was in Mongolia and then I immigrated to US, you know, and that was a, such a different uh, environment and I started playing chess, uh, started tournament and even teaching chess in the US, which like enabled me, you know, to overcome so much like challenges here as an immigrant and uh, support, you know, support me to pursue my dream in academia eventually. So, yeah. One of the things with the tour has been how chess just makes the world a small place. It brings everyone together from different parts of the world over the game. Have you seen chess break barriers in your profession? Um, in, in economics, you mean? Yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, like in economics, also in chess, you know, it's a very men um, and dominated sport. And especially being a woman in uh, economics, and chess has like has been challenging in a way, but um, it has been definitely very a profound experience. Yeah. And you were in Kenya as well. Uh, tell us about that experience uh, as a scholastic program. Yeah, and that was an incredible experience. I was here. I was in Kenya in Af uh, Africa for work and I was able to visit some of the scholastic chess tournaments there and kids were just very enthusiastic about the game and I was able to give some speeches and like play simul games and just see how also like play chess plays a role in school programs um, and uh, some of the schools you know it, I want to do eventually want to do research on how you know we can do chess programs in schools and um, to see how that changes kids' lives, you know, in academic and non-academically. And in your experience, what's been the most profound way in which chess has changed people's lives? Um, like, it's a like you said earlier, chess is a you know different kind of world. And just for me, like people I met through chess has been an incredible um, asset for my life and some of the people I met completely changed my life. Yeah. Wow. And are you having fun here today at yeah, the tour? Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So much fun. 
What's it been like watching the players come by, stop for the interviews, enjoying the app? Yeah, definitely, because I actually never seen, for example, Magnus Carlsen in person before. So um, I've been really enjoying and able to watch their games in the same room. Uh, so it's been very special, yeah. Who are you rooting for here? Um, Magnus Carlsen and also Wesley so. I like. I like him too, yeah. Awesome. Uh -huh. Thanks a lot. There we have it, Wesley and Magnus. Lots of fans here, lots of fun going on here in San Francisco. Oh, I bet you guys are lucky to be on site with uh, these four players. We are following the game between Prague and Duda. They are tied after two games. And Prague has been spending a lot of time over the last few moves, but we do have some moves on the board now. We do have some moves on the board and Prague has won his pawn back. Now he's just deciding how to recapture this intruder, this white knight on c5. And the mystery to me, and I think you mentioned as well, uh, Yvanka, we were just discussing that. Why is white better? Why is the evaluation bar on white side? It looks like Prague has a perfectly playable position. Uh, I agree. I mean, I was thinking, OK, if he captures with the queen, I mean, why does the computer love white's position so much? Especially because the bishop... Uh, the bishop that black has can actually defend any potentially weak pawns. So, big mystery. Yeah, big mystery. It looks like white's bishop, if anything, is just the worst piece on the board. So, how can white hope to have an advantage? Uh, Prague, I'm not sure about the queen exchange. I've got to be honest. I think he could have taken with the bishop as well, kept the queens on the board if he wanted to be more dynamic. But, uh, yeah, it looks like he should be fine here. Now, again, a question. Does he recapture the white queen? with the black rook, with the black bishop. There's arguments to be made for both. He takes with the bishop. This makes sense. You don't really want a rook trade because white still has a blocked in rook in the corner. White's rook doesn't want, uh, you don't really want to allow it to get into the game. But meanwhile, the evaluation bar continues to shift up for white. So <laughs> big, big mystery here in the studio. Maybe we can jump in to show why uh, here. I mean, what could be more natural? Take back the queen with the bishop. The computer says, nope, mistake. But uh, is it to do, Ivanka, with the knight coming to this square, maybe? I, I think uh, so. To attack this pawn? It has to be that move. Because after all, I mean, you can't step back with the bishop in order to defend it. So you have to instead... But that's oh, Sorry, because of knight takes bishop. Yeah, and just to show, at the very end, after a bunch of exchanges, there would be a checkmate. And uh, if black can't step back, as you say... Yep. And uh, Duda playing the direct move, then if you can't step back with the bishop, that means you have to defend that pawn with the rook. And sometimes I just use maths to assess the position. I'm like, hey, a knight is traditionally worth three, a rook is worth five, three, B three is less than five, so therefore white is better, just yeah. on the basis of, of uh, who can use their pieces in a better way. Yeah, so essentially white's knight will stay here attacking this pawn and black's rook, which is the more important piece, is also stuck here defending this weakness. And those two pieces balance each other out. Um, the rest of the army, though, it's still hard to imagine white being too much better uh, just because of this bishop. I'm looking at this bishop, I'm saying, where is it coming out? Maybe long term, the computer, its horizon will see that white can step forward with a pawn. Um, no matter what black does, white's bishop will come to this square. Again, let's say black makes a move. Finally, the bishop breaks free, you push a pawn forward. And once these two get exchanged, you suddenly look at the pieces and you think, oh yeah, maybe now white is indeed better. Uh, white's knight is in isn't an outpost after all. It is eyeing up this backward weak pawn. And uh, Black's Knight still takes a few moves to get into the game. To be honest, I still feel like a draw would be quite likely here, but may I mean, this is the only explanation I can come up with for the evaluation bar being on Duda's side. Yeah, uh, I have to say, I'm equally puzzled, David. And uh, Prague, wow, he doesn't even bother to defend that pawn. I thought that Ooh. was a must. Yeah. So, <laughs> what tactics does uh, Prague up have up his sleeve? <coughs> Has he just lost a pawn? I mean, surely Duda can just take this. What could be going wrong for White here? Everything's protected. Everything else for White is on the back rank. Pretty safe. So, uh, Prague choosing an active way of defending. Remember, he is the king of counterattacks. So, what is he trying to counterattack if White just grabs on a5 and goes a pawn up? It's not just any old pawn as well, it is a passed pawn now. Computer thinks white can get away with being greedy. I don't get it. I mean, I mean, presumably the knight is going to spring forward to the e5 square. Don't really know what it's doing, David. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it's coming in, but those aren't 
too threatening. For example, if white just waits, if you give a check, white's king just moves. I don't think you really want to trade off for this really bad bishop. Uh, if you come the other way, yeah, the rook just moves. And uh, I think you're pretty safe. Yeah, I, I have a confession. I just, I don't understand. Yeah, I think we've given up trying to understand this game because uh, White has just won a pawn. Duda did get greedy. He did grab the pawn on a5. So he's a clear pawn ahead, a very important pawn ahead. And uh, Prague did indeed jump into the center. But unless Prague has seen something that we don't or the, the computer doesn't see, it just looks like these knight jumps, they're just illusions. They're just kind of visual tricks. It, they look active, these knight jumps, but they don't do anything. They don't achieve anything. And uh, maybe that's one small weakness still in Prague's game that he doesn't want to defend passively ever. Sometimes you need to make exceptions and you need to defend. Uh, if we go back, this knight move, yes, it's on the cards. Yes, you want to activate the knight later. You want to reroute it. But first, you maybe just need to take a step. Uh, maybe, oh, Yvanka, I think I've spotted why he didn't do this. It's that pin again, the pin we mentioned from earlier. The mystery has been resolved. Oh. Knight takes pawn was still possible oh. because after the rook recaptures, Bishop takes pawn. Suddenly, this bishop comes to life, and this is a pin. Oh, oh. this is the idea. This pin wins the game for white uh, because now the black rook is attacked, and if the rook moves, you win the bishop. You come out two pawns up. So, we have resolved the mystery of <laughs> <Yeah>. Craig's. <laughs> Good job, you guys. Face. It took us a while. It took us a while. Yeah. But uh, these players, that's why they're so good. These, they see these things quicker than us. Uh, they see these things instantly. Uh, so maybe there was a defense. The computer thought black could maybe hold, but uh, Prague didn't find the best way. Uh, instead, now he lost this pawn, and he has to hope that he can find some miraculous compensation. Uh, there, the computer is skeptical. I'm very skeptical too. I do feel with good technique, Duda should be able to finish this game off, and he retreats his knight. Yeah. Uh, very sensible, That's just neat. yeah, trying to trade off pieces. Pawn yeah. up. I must admit, when you showed that uh, tactic, you know, the bishop takes the pawn, I felt like doing a life of Brian moment. <laughs> we're not worthy, David. We're not. <laughs> it took me too long. I missed it the first time, though. Yeah, but the, the worst was that you actually showed it to us yeah. <laughs> a few moves ago. That's why, that's why everyone needs to download that app, because uh, this tactic that we just saw uh, here, I mean, we showed the same pattern earlier. Sorry, in this position, we showed the same pattern with this pin, and uh, we forgot it the second time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we need to hammer home practice, practice, practice these patterns uh, with apps uh, like that one. Yeah, Magnus Chess Academy, that is the app to practice stuff like this. And it's looking good for young Christoph Duda. This is game three against Prague. If he wins it, he will take the lead. Two matches, wow, have already finished. It's a match win for Wesley So. Winning also game three against Mamadiaro to take all three points. And it's over also for Anish sitting in San Francisco. A draw in game three means he loses uh, the match. Arjun Ergaisi takes all three points in that one as well. But still, two matches going on. This one will definitely go to a game four. And so will Magnus Carlsen against Liam Lea. And I think maybe the bar is slightly over to Liam's side. They are tied, winning one game each so far. Magnus losing his first game of the tournament in round two here against Liam Lea. Is he in trouble at all in game three? It looks possible. Oh. Uh, Magnus, he's taken some significant risks. He's actually two pawns down in that position. Uh, he has the bishop pair. We know Magnus is great with bishops. He won yesterday against Anish Giri in a position where he had two bishops, so I'm not going to write him off. But Liam looks like he's fighting very well at the moment. And we could see some big surprises. Um, wow. Some real, real uh, turnarounds uh, yeah. for the leaderboard, especially. Yeah, the tournament. that would be really shocking, actually, if Liam Leo were to win his match against uh, Wesley So. Oh, sorry, Wesley So. <laughs> Magnus Carlsen, yeah. I jumped ahead of the gun, because I was going <laughs> to say, he also beat Wesley So. Yep. He stole uh, points from him. And, uh, and course, Duda. And Duda. Yeah. Incredible stuff, you guys. And if uh, this happens, if Magnus now loses game three, Chances, as David says, for the MLA in that game. And Duda wins this game against uh, Prague. The bar way over to his side. Wow, it's going to be an interesting game four today. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting weekend with Duda and Magnus fighting to win the finals. And even Liam Le getting in there. Yeah, it's open. Even Wesley So, he's only yeah, going to be three true. points behind and all of the top guys play each other in the final two days. Yeah. So even Wesley, imagine he lost his first two matches of the tournament and he's catching up now. He's in it now. 
Oh, a lot of fun, you guys. But we are following this game. Duda still with five minutes on the clock. Is this an easy win? Or will it take some uh, thinking? Take some thinking, especially now, because Prague is testing Duda to the limit. This last move, I must have... Wow, look at Duda. Not happy at all. Uh, maybe he's calculating, maybe he's not upset, but uh, he must have missed this last move. I must admit, I'd missed it. Uh, here, we did see Black's knight and the white bishop disappear, so that exchange is actually beneficial for white. White has a very nice knight now against Black's bishop. If Black was too slow, if he played any other move on the board, for example, pushing a pawn, white would cement his knight on this outpost. Now the knight is here for eternity, and white's pawn would start marching forward. Meanwhile, though, Prague did test Duda, and Duda, I think, has passed this test because the Black Bishop moved into the center, giving itself up, but trying to dislodge this White Knight, trying to win the White Knight. Uh, but instead of getting tempted, instead of taking the Black Bishop, allowing the Black Rooks to get active, allowing the beautiful White Knight to disappear, uh, Duda just realized he could play it calm, he could play it safe, and uh, this Knight is attacked. Why not just defend it? Now the Black Bishop has to retreat, has to run away, and next move, I think, Duda's plan is to cement the Knight. This formation of pawns and knight now, they're going to win the game. If all the rooks disappear, you're winning the end game. Uh, no matter what, you just keep this one up your sleeve. Any future end game is winning for white because of this protected pass pawn. Yeah, and uh, you take control of the open line, take mm -hmm. control of the D line, yeah. and uh, white's king is primed and ready for the action. So fantastic position for Duda, and it was a nice shot yeah. by uh, Prague, but it wasn't good enough. Yeah, it was a nice try to try and trade off the bishop for knight, but now you are stuck in a sad situation of a good knight versus bad bishop, black's bishop. Even if it parks itself on an outpost like this one, uh, it doesn't do anything. It just hits thin air. White can play around this bishop on the light squares. Duda, I think, is big favourite now. Wow. Ooh, it's getting uh, dramatic and uh, fun in the tour finals, you guys. This is round five out of seven. And Duda, he is putting pressure now on Magnus Carlsen, sitting in the same room uh, as Pragnananda. Magnus Carlsen now fighting in game three against Liam. We will, of course, jump to that game when this one finishes, if it's still going on, of course. I was just laughing because uh, we suddenly saw the webcam of Duda, yeah. and he just looked a little bit evil. There was like shadows all over his face. <laughs> okay, now he looks uh, back to his usual self. And uh, yeah, he's in full focus mode. He knows what needs to be done. Mm. And uh, poor Bragg, it was such a good opening, but somehow or other, it didn't work out well for him. Yeah, and we did praise Prague's opening choices. He was the one to launch the first surprise, the first novelty. But if he does fall to defeat, he'll have lost two games in the same opening. Oh, that's true. In the same variation of the Catalan. So yeah, there's an argument for maybe mixing it up. Even if you go deeply and kind of, even if you prepare further than your opponent, if the type of position doesn't suit your style, you will still, uh, yeah, you will still be suffering as we see. And mm -hmm. he's found a counterattack. <laughs> Again, a move that wasn't on my radar, Yovanka. It wasn't on mine either. And, uh, well, here comes the counter-attack. Wow. These two guys are just surprising us on every turn. Tactical monsters. Mm. They're both so good. The problem for Prague, though, is he's about to go two pawns down and uh, he will lose the game. He did test Duda again. We have to show what just happened because it was quite spectacular. Uh, I thought Duda had already calmed the waters. I thought he would just face a bishop retreat. Then Duda fixes these pawns. Remember, this formation is winning for white. But uh, Prague, nope. He plays an interference tactic. He push, pushes his bishop in the middle, breaking the connection of the rook and knight. But the bishop wasn't captured. If pawn takes bishop, the white knight falls. This would have led to maybe some drawing chances for Prague, but instead the white knight leaps out the way. And remember, bishop takes rook is bad here because when all the rooks come off the board, white's pawn will win the game. This would have been deadly. So uh, unfortunately for Prague, this wasn't possible. He had to move his rook out the way. And after pawn takes bishop, look at this as well. Black's back rank is the main flaw in his position. You cannot go and take this pawn now. If you could, you might draw, but unfortunately a check and you're trapped on the back rank. So he should have given his king some breathing space earlier. He gives his king some breathing space now, but uh, White now has two connected pass pawns. They survive, and they're about to win the game. Yeah, too, little, too late. And uh, Duda offers a trade of rooks. Frag will be forced to say no. He'll have to slide his rook over to the A2 square. 
But there you go, it's on the board. But Dudo is just going to do the same. He's just going to lift his rook and challenge the black rook. And there's nothing to be done. Yeah. Just those two pawns, they're just so strong, they will walk themselves down to the finishing line. Yeah, we see a bit of a dance between the rooks. The white rook is saying, please take me, please trade off. Black is saying no. And uh, we're seeing the rooks shuffle across. But eventually, Duda, as you say, Yvanka, he's just going to find the right moment to start pushing those two pawns forward. What I would do here, I would just keep things simple. I would put both white rooks behind the two white pawns. So one rook behind the A pawn, one rook behind the B pawn, and then just propel wow. them forward. I was going to ask, to what is your tip? when uh, beginners have sort of two pawns and they know they can march them to the other side, there's rooks on the board. Is yeah. that the way to do it? That's the key. Rooks behind past pawns, whether you have connected past pawns or whether they're even separated, as long as your rooks are behind, then the opponent's rook will be a blockader and it will be passive. If, if you can imagine the rooks swapping places, so black's rooks were behind and white's rooks were in front, white's rooks would actually be in the way. They would be passive. Mm -hmm. But uh, So if you're attacking, you want rooks behind past pawns. If you're defending, you also want your rook behind the opponent's past pawns. But unfortunately for Prague, one of his rooks is stuck on the side, one is stuck at the top. I uh, wasn't expecting that little rook move from Duda. I was expecting the pawns to start walking. But uh, no rush. Mm -hmm. I, li I like this move. Calm and steady. Yeah. And uh, I'm, the rook is going to lift itself up over to the b4 square and then he's going to line up both rooks on the b line. Yeah, I think you're right about that one, Ivanka. Black's king is coming, but black's king cannot really go too much further. Um, at some points, if it does march towards those white pawns, it will either get cut off or it will get checked away. Kings are good uh, at marching towards pawns in solo rook end games when it's just one rook each, but if it's double rook end games, then, yeah, King struggled to approach pawns, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And Prague, yeah, he doesn't look as kind of focused, as confident as he has in previous games, and he knows he is losing this one. He'll have to strike back again with white. He's done it once already. He'll need to do it again. And we have a draw between Magnus Carlsen and Lee Emily in game three. That means they will be tied before game four, and that's going to be white pieces for Liam, black pieces for Magnus in that final game of the day. Well, could be final day, game of the day if we have a winner in that game. If it's a draw, then it means uh, tie breaks. Wow, drama in that one. But this one is looking good for Duda. About to win against Prague. Yep. And I like what Prague has done. So earlier we were talking about rooks behind pass pawns. I at least like what Prague has done with his rook on the B1 square. Uh, and now the rook on the b4 square, because he's behind, he's controlling the white pawns. Um, unfortunately, he's two pawns down, so this isn't going to save the game, but just as an instructive example, that's where rooks belong in general, behind past pawns. It's a good technique, but uh, like you say... It's not going to help. It's not going to help, and this is a very nice move from Duda. He's just sealing the win. He's basically, and there you go, he's so satisfied with himself because he's won the game. Wow, and imagine when he checks uh, results in the other ones. Uh, Jan Kristof Duda now up in the match against Prague, and he's going to know that Magnus will have to win game four to win that match and take all three points against Liam Le. Now with a draw or a win in the final game for Duda, he will take all three points and start catching up with Magnus if Magnus is not able to win that final game. Prague. Very disappointed after losing this game. I wonder if we will have a um, reaction from the young Indian. He's going to be in a must-win. Nope. He's going to be in a must-win situation in game four, starting in 20 minutes. And we have to take a look at this game. Was it a brilliant one by Duda? Yeah, it was great play by Duda. I think actually perfect chess from opening from start till end. And uh, unfortunately for Prague, he only really made one slip in the game, but that was enough for Duda to seize control and uh, cruise to victory. And it was here, just as we uh, were talking about earlier, Prague had a great opening as black, 
prepared very deeply, but I think he made a tactical mistake here, and uh, it was one that he only realized later. White has just captured a knight on the c5 square, and this knight can be taken in two ways. I think he made the, the wrong choice. He took with the black queen, but if he had taken with the black bishop, he would have held the balance. Black's queen is actually very active, and she defends this key pawn on the a5 square, as we'll see, that did just drop off. Instead, Prague took with the queen, he made this decision, decision quite quickly, and he regretted it immediately, because after a trade of queens, suddenly the white knight came to c4, and as we saw, there was no way simply to defend this pawn. Duda won this pawn for free and went on to win the game. If he had defended, just to show this pin one last time, if he had defended, I think this is what he had missed. Knight takes pawn is still possible, because uh, after the rook captures, the white bishop springs to life and uses, uses this pin to win material. A really nice tactic deep into the endgame there, but that cost Prague the point. And Prague will now be in a must-win situation in Game 4, starting in uh, 18 minutes. He is sitting in San Francisco. Duda is now up by one point and only needs a draw in that final game to take all three points. Jan Christoph Duda, he came in as an underdog in the Champions Chess Tour 2022. But what a season it's been for the Polish 24-year-old. He finds it. He finds the best wow. Of course. <gasps> He's a player of form, isn't he? That's checkmate in one move. Duda's turned it around. Big threat on the board. Checkmate is coming. Nine moves. Oh, He's winning now, Duda. Magnus Carlsen is knocked out of AIM Chess Rapid by Jan Christoph Duda. What a match. This is a Duda move, isn't it? Direct. It's over. Jan Christoph Duda wins AIM Chess Rapid. And, mm, wow. Nice, Christoph nice, Duda. nice. Ooh, Duda. Which takes Bishop. Very strong move. A win for Jan Christoph Duda on his birthday. Wow. Oh, wow. He allows a queen exchange. He pushes a pawn forward. This is complete domination right now. It's king versus king. What's and Duda going to do? Double yeah. fist pump? It's One fist over. pump. Jan Christoph Duda wins the Oslo Esports Cup. The winner is Jan Christoph Duda. Impressive stuff, that win for Jan Christoph Duda in the Oslo Esports Cup. He also won the AIM Chess Rapid only a few weeks ago and is on Fire. He can now win the match against Prague and take all three points with only a draw or a win in game four. And uh, Magnus Carlsen, he's under pressure, tied with Lee Emler before that uh, fourth and final game. Maybe we will see tie breaks with the world number one. It's uh, dramatic, you guys. We're going to take a commercial break. And when we get back, we're going to build up to the action. He will go queen h5 check with a double attack. Attack the king and attack the pawn. And you thought, no, can't have that. I don't want the double attack. And so, with this very good insight, you chose the move g5, trying to block the queen's access. First thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. I think for me, she moves us is about the passion for life. It's about doing things that light up our mind, light up our soul, light up our brain, and in the process, hopefully light up the world and give motivation to others as well to be able to do the same. I think there are so many iconic women in the world who've raised the bar and uh, really shown that it's okay to break conventions and it's okay to break norms. And yes, it's not easy and it's hard, but it's also so rewarding. To be completely honest, it's a lot to do with how I feel about the game that drives me. Definitely seeing the women around me in my personal space 
go after the things that drive them definitely makes me feel like I can do that as well. The one thing that I learned along the way would be that you don't have to live up to the expectations of others. I think you have to do things which exceed your own expectation to build a world around yourself that you feel proud of. And that's the only thing that is your responsibility, to create the life that you're proud of. For me personally, I would say a strong woman is somebody who has complete belief in herself. And no matter how many people question her, uh, how many people try to put some kind of self-doubt in her, whatever the circumstances is, there is an ultimate belief in, in herself and her goals and uh, she's able to take them on, take on the challenges, whether it's external, whether it's internal, uh, and go forward with, once again, the life that she wants to create. If I had to talk to my younger self, I would probably go and give her a big hug and tell her that it's going to be amazing in the most difficult times and just keep going. The only thing that I would like to say to people who have a passion for something which is not what the society or the general norm or the general structure is or what people expect out of you and you have a path that you want to take because it makes you happy, just keep going on it and believe in yourself. It's going to get tough, it's definitely going to get hard, it's not going to be easy. But in the end, it's going to be 100% rewarding. Welcome back, everyone. It's day five in the tour finals, and we're waiting for a dramatic uh, round four of games. Magnus Carlsen is tied with Liam Le in Prague. He has to win that game to take it to tie breaks against young Christoph Duda. We are encouraging everyone today to download the Magnus Chess Academy app, which is launching today, available to any Apple users. And in that game, or in that app, there is a game called Ace in the Sleeve, which we are challenging you guys to do. We have challenged the players. The high score is Anish Giri, managing to solve 69 cards. And in San Francisco, Tanya, is anyone even close to uh, Anish's high score? Let's check it out, guys. I've got Grandmaster Christopher Yu with us. He is the US Junior Chess Champion. Christopher, how's it going for you so far? Going great. It, it keeps getting more challenging and more fun. <laughs> What's the challenging part about the uh, game? There's just so many possible places that you can put your pieces, and it's actually surprisingly hard to figure out um, where you need to put the pieces for it to be checkmate. I remember when you started playing just uh, just an hour ago, you thought it was going to be pretty easy, but yeah. not so anymore. <laughs> And I just got one wrong, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I have to ask you, I know you're really enjoying uh, Ace in the Sleeve here, but we've got a big final game coming up between Magnus and Liam. They're tied currently. Um, punches have been exchanged. What do you think is going to be the outcome of this match? <sighs> so the currents, they're tied currently? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to bet on Lee Kwang Lee and pulling the upset. That's a hot take. Why, how, why do you say that? How do you think he's going to be able to do it? I'm not sure how he's going to be able to do it, but I I kind of want to see it happen just for the drama. Chess players love the drama. Christopher, you enjoying Ace in the Sleeve while we're up to enjoy the final game between Magnus and Liam. That's fantastic, Tanya. It's going to be so dramatic in 10 minutes when the drama starts for both. Magnus Carlsen and Prague in San Francisco. Duda is up by one point against Prague in their match, and Prague is in a must-win situation in that game. Let's take a look at the results uh, so far today. Two matches have finished. Wesley So is uh, the winner, gaining all three points against Chakriad Mamadiarov, winning three games. David, what do you think of uh, Wesley's progress in the Tour Finals? Well, he's definitely shaped up. He's definitely uh, perked up and brought his best chess over the last few days. He just needed that breakthrough, that first win. And ever since, Wesley's been flying high. Super confident. Yeah. Magnus Carlsen and Liam Lea, they are tied. So if game four is a draw, we will see tie breaks between those two. If we have a winner, then that player will be the winner of the match. And Duda is up by one point. It's going to be a must-win situation for Prague in game four to take it to tie breaks. If not, Duda will take all three points. 
and uh, Arjun Aragaisi winning the match yesterday and winning today's match against Anish Giri, who is really struggling. Three points for Arjun, zero points for Anish. And let's hear from the players who have finished their matches today. Anish, how did it go? Uh, very badly. Today went really bad. Uh, everything just went wrong. <laughs> uh, tough match. What, what went wrong? Uh, everything, but um, to mention a few things. Well, in the first game, I was kind of slow, though that was justified. I mean, in the end, uh, I don't know. I had many um, ways to uh, to defend, and uh, I thought what I did is also okay. But it was like I should have defended with a bigger margin. What I did was like very dubious, and finally, I, I lost. In second game, I uh, uh, I mixed up some opening uh, prep, or somehow got nothing, and then I got slightly worse and didn't want to defend either. And then third game, I didn't get uh, anything going. It was just not not really working out for me. Uh, Anish, do you think you're struggling to find your rhythm here a little bit? Oh yeah, well I had the rhythm at the start, so I kind of lost it. Uh, but I think it's good that today we have um, some basketball game, so it's a good moment, opportunity to reset. I don't necessarily have uh, ma major ambitions in terms of uh, results, but I do want to improve my play in the last two rounds for sure. I got some rest, and we hope you finish on a high. Thanks, Anish. Wesley, what a match that was. 3-0 against Shark. What clicked today? Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, as Shark, I mean, I was just trying to play my best chess. You know, I, I, I guess try to play your... The secret is try to play your best chess, not to think about the result too much. And hopefully things go your way, and that's exactly what happened. It felt like every game you got your kind of position while Shark, you know, he likes a mess on the board. You made sure you shut down all that counterplay. Yeah, I think also, I mean, Shark is a great player, but he's also like snowballing because he's lost his third match in a row today. And it seems like he's uh, losing his form. I mean, also, fortunately, he wasn't able to put that much pressure out the opening. Like I was getting very playable positions and uh, Okay, he shouldn't have lost the first game, but he made some. He captured the wrong pawn. He should take on a2, but he took on e4 in the first game. That led to his defeat. In the second game, he played rook c4 too quickly, and in the third game, things almost didn't go my way. But I think d5, like d6, d5, what he played was a mistake. Because after I could see no losing chances for myself, uh, I think Shaq was just making. Um, playing moves too quickly in critical decisions, but I may have might to decide. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to win, of course, and, you know, very grateful to also... I also want to take the time to thank the organizers for hosting such a wonderful event. As I said earlier, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, they really treated the players very well here, and that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to play in this last event and not online. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. Wesley, you're always really kind. And I want to ask you, you mentioned about being here. Uh, is it more fun for you to play such an event, a hybrid eSport chess event on site? Or do you like to play it from the comfort of your home? I don't like playing from home. Because then <laughs> you're just wearing your pajamas and uh, you just barely woke up. You know, your family members are there. <laughs> And they don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's it's very lonely playing playing at home because I'm just by in uh, in the room all by myself for the next four or five hours. I, I think it's much better. Also online, you can't be a thousand percent sure about uh, anti-cheating stuff. Like you can't see your opponent. And uh, as we all know, there's a cheating scandal recently. Yeah? <laughs> but I, I think overall is much preferable because. I mean, in person, because it's much more serious. You feel like you're actually going to work. But I think Chess24 and the Meltwater have done a great job, uh, you know, we're hosting this event. With everything that happened, as you mentioned, with the cheating scandal, do you think that's always at the back of the mind uh, when you're playing these events, even if you don't want it to be? Well, I think over the board, it's very, very difficult to prevent, I mean, to cheat. I mean, over the board, it's super easy to prevent cheaters. You just need uh, to implement the, a few minutes delay. Uh, you need maybe some 
scanners. You need random check, checking of shoes, of belts. So it's very easy. But I think o online, I don't see how it's possible to be a thousand percent uh, sure. There's always ways. Like I can think of three different ways how to cheat on this online event. But we don't want to give any ideas. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to give it. But the problem is that, you know, uh, so being being good in chess takes many years. So, I mean, well, if you wanna you wanna cheat, it's so much easier. But, yeah. You mentioned that you really enjoy being on site as well because it builds an atmosphere. So, are you enjoying it here uh, with this stunning view? Yeah, certainly. And now uh, winning three matches in a row, things couldn't even be better. And uh, we're staying at this fantastic hotel, and as I'm sure you know, uh, it gives. It gives uh, discounts to all the local restaurants nearby. So we've tried. Li my mom and I have tried literally every single restaurant, and we're having a good time. And you know, I'm not over preparing. I'm just relaxing at night. So it's been pleasurable. And uh, yeah, we're playing in one of the most fantastic buildings I've ever played in. So it's uh, and you can see the Golden Gate Bridge, I guess, nearby. I, I, I'm. A, it's only my third time in third or fourth time in California. I'm not. Really very familiar. I live in, I live in the Midwest, so <laughs> it feels like being California is a totally different country to me. But uh, you know, I, I love it here. I have had great experience. Um, the people are very friendly. So uh, you know, my, I can understand why Bobby Fischer moved to California. It's so nice to hear, Vasi, that you're having a great time here and enjoying chess. And especially, it was a slow start with three big back-to-back -back match wins. Yeah, for uh, sure. It's yeah. good to see you back on track. Yeah, one thing I must say also is that the format this year is very different. Like in the minors, you have three points for a win, and you get prizes based on how many wins you get. Uh, here also, I guess it doesn't really matter whether you finish second or eighth, as long as you win matches. So, I mean, it's a very interesting format. I wouldn't have thought of this kind of format. It's the first time I've played this, so it's interesting. We're so happy to hear that you're enjoying the format and the place. Uh, Wesley, good luck for the remaining games. Yeah, Thank you. you. Magnus, that one seemed pretty even from the start. Didn't get anything much with white? Yeah, I uh, didn't really get anything. Uh, if anything, I think I got off maybe a little bit easier than I should have. Uh, he was definitely pressing. A decisive game four coming up. You haven't been in this match situation this whole tournament. How are you feeling? Well, I mean, I had a uh, black game uh, against Wesley where it was where I was up by one. But um, yeah, certainly it's um, it's a tough situation and uh, one I have to deal with. Big fight. We love it. All the best. Clock is ticking down to game four. Two matches is yet to be decided here on uh, day five. Magnus Carlsen kind of in a must-win situation against Lee Emle. They are tied heading into game four. And uh, Magnus, if uh, he wins that game, he will win the match and take all three points. If he loses, he will get zero points out of today. If it is a draw, then we will see tie breaks between those two. And uh, these are the standings. We have to remind you guys, Magnus Carlsen in sole lead with 12 points. Behind him is Jan Kristoff. Duda. And uh, Duda, he's in the lead heading into game four against Pragnananda. So it's looking more likely that he will take all three points and be on 12 points after today. And uh, that means he could start catching up with uh, Magnus, especially if Magnus loses the, the game now. Yeah, this is crunch time, as they say. There's always small margins at the top of uh, world chess, and it always comes down to these one or two critical moments where everything is decided. Uh, we should mention these standings are updated, so yeah. this is taking into account Duda is guaranteed at least one point today. That's true. And uh, of course, Wesley has won his match, so he's catching up. Duda and Wesley are hot on the heels of Magnus. Yeah. If it goes to tie breaks, the winner will get two two points and the loser one point. If it is decided in the rapid portion, then it is three points for the winner and zero points for the loser. So uh, yeah, definitely David, that was Duda. He uh, will definitely at least get one point today. If he loses this game four against Prague, then it will go to tie breaks. But Magnus Carlsen, he will uh, have to win the game against uh, Lee Emle in round four here to take all three points. 
if it is a draw, then we will see tie breaks. Prague is in a must-win situation to have any hopes of getting points out of today. He has to win it to take it to tie breaks. And uh, he's going to have the white pieces, Prague. So what do you expect, Joanka? He's going to go hard, as he has to do. He will play his uncom un uncompromising chess, you know, full of complications, and he will try to outwit Jan Christoph Duda. And uh, this is uh, such an important uh, round of games, both Prague and Magnus sitting in San Francisco. We're going to follow both games super closely. Both this one and Magnus against Liam. Here we go, bunch of moves. Bunch of moves and just like earlier where Prague repeated the same opening in game three as he did in game one, he's now repeating the same opening in game four as he did in game two. Oh. So Prague, remember he won game two at least. He won game two with white. He got <coughs> a nice position out of the opening. In the interview afterwards, he said he felt he had a big advantage out of the opening. And this is still the same stuff. They're still repeating exactly what they played before until now. Duda playing the first new move of the day, at least. Uh, earlier, he moved his other bishop back. And uh, we'll see what Duda has up his sleeve. Uh, this is still a well-known position. This is a branch of the Italian game. This is not the quiet version of the Italian that we are so used to seeing nowadays. It's more direct. If you look at the center, there's a lot of tension there. A lot of knights around the middle of the board. The pawn structure slightly favors white. White has a bit more space in the middle. But look at this, there is a weakness around the white king. Ooh. This, yeah, the white king now, it's about to get checked. It's about to get kicked around. Black has just sacrificed a piece. This is still well-known stuff. Uh, now a bunch of checks are about to happen. White's king has to go into the corner and Black's king is uh, Black's queen sorry, is going to try and hunt down this white king. Yeah. Well, that looks super and, scary for yeah. white. It is. It is very scary for white, but uh, according to the computer assessment, it does say it, white is slightly better and uh -huh. the players are just racing through the moves. What kind of uh, thing does uh, Prague have up his sleeve? Yeah, this is surprising because this variation is known to lead to almost a forced draw. Um, there have been many, many quick draws in this variation, but of course that won't suit Prague. Look how quickly Duda is playing. And Prague frowning, maybe surprised by this last move, but it must be opening preparation. Duda has sacrificed a piece. The material count right now, white has an extra bishop, black has two pawns in return. Mm. But it's about the white king. That is the main compensation that black has. Also note that black is attacking with a queen and knight. That's the ideal, ideal attacking combo because a knight can give the checks, sneak over pawns that uh, is moves in the way the queen cannot. And this is terrifying stuff. I mean, this is, again, maybe a downside to repeating the same opening against the same opponent time and time again because they will have had time to prepare. Duda, for sure, in the break, just before this game, has studied this exact position with a computer, with his coaches. And Prague is fighting against Duda's prior no uh, knowledge. Yeah. It's going to be difficult. And uh, Prague taking a pause for thought here. But it's slightly strange to think about the position now after blitzing out all those moves because here is the chance for White to deviate. He can blitz step the king forward, which probably would lead to a draw. Uh, he therefore must be obliged to push the F pawn to attack the knight. And that's the best move according to the database and also according to the computer. Yeah, so uh, yeah, if you step forward with your king, the whole idea would be to swing the rook across. But unfortunately, black will give a check, kick you back, and then go back where he came from. And the position repeats. As you mentioned, Ivanka, the alternative is to step forward with this pawn. But for a human, this is maybe not the most natural because it does look like it allows a check. The black knight wants to use the square anyway. And worst comes to worst, you just gobble up this pawn next move. So it, from a human point of view, it's not obvious to give that pawn up for free. For example, if the white king moves, then you just take this pawn with a check. And where's the white king hide? Yeah. I'm not so sure. But the th my point is, is that you don't enter this type of position without knowing every single detail. Mm -hmm. And he does uh, retreat his bishop, which also, I have to say, has been played before, but it wasn't the cr most critical move. So he drops his bishop back. If he gets time to eliminate this knight, he'll breathe a sigh of relief. I think I've seen this position before as well myself. Uh, I'm not sure whether, I think I was reading about it in a magazine uh, and uh, I'm not sure the exact move. It was one of the two black rooks. Okay, he uses the rook in the corner. I was gonna say it's one of the two black rooks to this square to target this pawn, but he uses the other one, Duda. Maybe this is more precise. And the whole idea is yes, you can eliminate this knight now, but if you take it, if you get rid of one of the attacking pieces, black gives a check. Your king is safe temporarily, but after rook takes pawn, Let's do a quick count. Black has seven pawns, white has only four, and the king is still in huge danger. 
You can't get greedy here and start grabbing pawns as white, for example, because black is going to start attacking you. Black's queen is going to come in. Already there's a threat of checkmate in one move if the queen gets into the corner. It's, uh, yeah, you're already on the brink and you're facing Duda, who's clearly in his opening preparation. Yeah. Duda's played 21 moves instantly. Uh, I mean, that was like half an hour in the previous game yeah. until we reached uh, that move count. Exactly. And that's the danger if you repeat exactly the same moves, exactly the same opening against a well-prepared opponent. You can't be a sitting target in modern chess. You can't be a sitting duck. That's why Magnus is so successful. He plays different openings every game. He surprises his opening every move, uh, his opponent every move. And already I'm fearing for Prague's life. This is a big threat. Rook takes pawn, adding another piece into uh, the attack. I'm impressed by David's memory because there's only been one game played in my database. It was... Uh, um, but played between Alexander Fier and Andre Souza. So this is probably the game that you saw annotated Possibly. on Whoa. the magazine. And it went just like David said. So already Black is in good shape. Yeah, I just remember reading through these annotations and at the end it said white is fine, but if you make one slip, you're just losing. So uh, that's not the situation that Prague wants to be in, really. He's still got plenty of time, of course. He's built up a lot of time due to playing instantly. Uh, over the last 20 moves, but 14 minutes won't help you if your opponent knows exactly what they're doing. Yeah. And look at the evaluation bar. It says, even with best play, White can't really hope for more than a draw. And uh, David, you called it. You know, I, I just have the computer lines in front of me, and I can see that there are only two moves that White can play that maintain the balance. Oh. Anything else is just going to be lost. And wow. what is that? Okay, so you have to defend that pawn. So you can do it two ways. You can actually defend it with your F pawn. Mm -hmm. That will that will secure a draw. And the other way is a little bit more complicated and says, well, you know, black is actually going to move the queen over to the D3 square. Now, this is like super important to get right, because if you actually def move the queen to the C3 square, this is lost. Wow. This is lost because, oh. yeah, uh, and it's... It's so dangerous here because if you actually move the queen to C6, let's say C3, the rook is actually going to go to E6 and we're going to see a swinger. Yeah, the rook joins the attack and the king is so open. And what's the difference, Ivanka? Because uh, this queen move looks very natural to me and this one loses, but yep. uh, this one draws uh, to <laughs> D3. So this one is OK. I guess the idea after the rook moves is that now after the pawn steps forward, you have ideas, for example, if uh, black... Uh, for example, gives a check. I mean, what's the idea? I don't really see it, to be honest. It looks so dangerous. Black's rook is coming across. It looks like you're about to come in and deliver checkmate. Oof, I mean, I would just be terrified. I would be shaking with fear if I were Prague. Black is attacking with three pieces. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's so random as well, the difference between the two moves. I mean, I don't see, even with the computer assessments right in front of me, I don't see an obvious difference between the two. So yeah. it's further along down the line. Oh, I'm getting very worried for Prague. And is he likely to make one of those two moves? He finds oh, the, wow. one of the best moves. That is great uh, discipline from Prague. He spent four or five minutes there and he calculated. That's very, uh, I mean, it's not an obvious move as well. So that's uh, very impressive from him. I think the more obvious move was to push this pawn forward. But as Yvanka mentioned, Black would then be able to jump in with a knight, maybe giving him some checks, maybe being able to force a draw. So now, will Duda have studied this far? It's still a test of nerves between the two. Often as well, it's the side who's better prepared here at Duda, who sometimes has the pitfall. If they run out of preparation, they collapse. Okay. Normally, it's said that there's always a mistake the move you run out of preparation. So Prague was out of his <coughs> prep sooner than Duda, so he has already stopped to think. Duda needs to engage his brain now. No, no more relying on memorization. You've got to calculate. And can he take this pawn? That's one question. Does he bring his rook up along the sixth rank to try and swing it over? That's another question. Does he give a check with the knight? Really critical moment, and we're just starting the fun. Wow. And I guess by listening to you guys that it is uh, definitely not unlikely that Duda will get at least the draw he needs to win the match in the rapid portion and take all three points. And it's a, dr a dramatic round, you guys, because we're also paying attention to Liam Lier against Magnus Carlsen. They are tied before game four, and Magnus will have to win that game to take all three points. The bar is in the middle. Is the what's uh, sort of the opening in that game? It's uh, much less exciting than this one. <laughs> let's uh -huh. just say um, it does look like Liam has taken a safe option, played a very safe opening, and the position is dead level, very symmetrical. 
Magnus, if he wants to win, will need to squeeze water out of a stone in that game. Okay, so likely right now that they will go to tie breaks. Very, very likely. Uh -huh. We'll see a draw. And that means Magnus can max score two points. And if uh, Duda wins in the rapid and takes three points, he will be one point closer to Magnus Carlsen. Or maybe two if Magnus loses in the tie breaks. Yeah, that's true. So Duda just needs to hold this game and it's the first critical moment. And we definitely chose the right game to follow. This one is full of action, full of life, sacrifices, attacks. And that Magnus game, it's a really slow, dry end game already. It's quite funny, actually, looking at this position, I would... If I were just to judge it on the basis of what we see in front of us, I would say it's black who's in the must-win situation, mm -hmm. not white. Um, just because white's king is so exposed. And I can actually tell you that the top computer choice is to capture the pawn with the rook. OK, yeah. I mean, that's one of the moves that you would calculate first. Uh, I guess there would be some downsides. White might push the f-pawn forward at some point and start attacking black's rook knight. And there's a lot of calculation to be done here, right, Yavanka? Yep. And uh, Duda's doing the right thing. He's already played 20 moves, so there's no need to keep that pace, to keep just playing blindly. You need to calculate, you need to knuckle down, be disciplined. He, or, he knows, because he's checked with the computer, he knows this is completely fine for black, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, again, you don't play this type of position with either side without knowing exactly how you're going to continue your attack. This is something that I've been working on with my own coach. You know, he's. He says to me, yes, let's look at your lines. And some, some of my variations have like where I have a pawn sacrifice. And he goes, yeah, yeah you have good compensation. But show me how you're going to win it. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, it's interesting. And uh, I'm sure Duda is doing the same thing with mm. his seconds. Yeah. And the good thing about studying with computers as well is uh, even when you run out of your knowledge, uh, even if you reach the point where your memory fails, you have the uh, kind of you have the certainty in your in the back of your brain. You know, the computer said you were fine. Therefore, uh, the position, if you find the right moves, is also fine. Uh, sometimes you reach a position and you don't know the evaluation. You you're kind of just guessing blindly. But Duda, even if he doesn't know the best move here, um, he, he knows he should be OK if he does find the best move. And uh, yeah, Rook takes pawn, looks very tempting. Why not bring the black Rook into the game? That's also Duda's style, just to kind of play the most direct uh, move if he can back it up with some calculation. Giving a knight check also looks tempting. I've got to say, maybe even moving the black queen looks tempting, but uh, yeah, it's up to Duda. I think if he, as long as he moves in the next minute or so, He'll still feel very, very confident. White's pieces still take a while to fully coordinate and consolidate around their king. Yeah. And uh, it's quite funny listening to you talk because your, your natural instincts actually tally with the computer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it helps that I briefly looked with the computer like two years ago or something at this <laughs> position. I mean, I can't remember any of the details at all. <laughs> I just remember vaguely the ideas. Um, <laughs> Because it literally is. It's like first move, take the pawn with the rook. Second choice, move the queen to the h4 square. Third choice, move the rook to the e6 square, you know, get swing that rook over to the action. And uh, that's it. Yeah. And OK, he does choose one of those moves you mentioned there, Yavanka. Uh, he does improve the black queen. Now there's a threat on the board. The black knight wants to deliver a nasty check. And the reason this is stronger now is because the f2 point is a target. If black gives that check, then white's pawn drops on f2. And uh, question for Prague is how to guard against this. It's not easy. Maybe yeah. the path is narrow as well. Yeah, I was going to... OK, so there are, the first suggestion that I would come up with is actually retreat the bishop. I do not want that knight checking my king. No. But uh, I accidentally saw the computer's top choice. Mm -hmm. And you would not believe it. I just have to show it to you. It's actually moving the queen to the f5 square. Like, wow. whoa, how crazy is that? Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to bring the queen towards the defence, but you do allow this really scary check. I guess the idea is you just march up the board, yep. you step forward. Yes, the black queen can take another pawn. You take the black knight now with your king and you just laugh. You say, I'm going to survive. <laughs> but <laughs> as a human, do you really survive on the edge of the board like this out in the open? Black can take a bishop, for example. Uh, black also has ideas later if the bishop goes the wrong way of just swinging across and getting your king. Yeah. But I mean, this just looks, <laughs> I mean, it looks foolhardy. <laughs> yeah. It looks like you're being too courageous here. 
marching forward with the White King. It's not good when your king does a Gloria Gaynor, no. <laughs> you won't survive. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so that's the best move according to the computer. Wow, will we find this, will Prague find this? Uh, moving the queen, just calmly allowing a check. Uh, the other move you mentioned, Ivanka, very kind of natural, much more human, dropping the bishop back that's just to eliminate the That's also scary as well because, you know, black doesn't have to actually give a check. You know, you can also move the rook over to the sixth row and good, goodness me, the rook is going to go to h6 and we're like looking at checkmate already. Yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> super scary still. And remember, black isn't even material down, really. Black has so many pawns. Black will most likely win a pawn or two back as well. So we'll see white with a bishop maybe for two or three pawns. Uh, so black is attacking without that much risk, it's got to be said. The evaluation bar slightly in white's favour now. But uh, is that because it sees a good way for white or is that just because uh, computers are cold-blooded <laughs> calculators? Um, yeah, so we're expecting this queen move or the bishop retreat. Either way, the, the attack continues. He plays the more human move here, Prague, and uh, can't blame him at all. He stops the knight check. Knight check here would just be traded off now by White's bishop. So now it's up to Duda to prob probably just improve this black rook. Pick it up, swing it across. Uh, you could also possibly consider taking this pawn, although now you would have to consider what happens after White steps forward with a double attack. A, uh, a fork here. I don't see a follow-up, I've got to say, for black. So I don't think you can get away with that. That narrows the path. Uh, if you can't take this pawn, you yeah. need to improve this rook. Yeah, don't switch focus. You... Checkmate is the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bring it up. And then you can plant it either on g6 opposite the white king, or you can plant it, as you mentioned, you're back on h6, supporting the black queen coming in. And uh, <laughs> this still looks like Prague will have to find some resourceful defensive moves over the next few turns. And a lot of time left for both sides. Normally, we see this type of position, and it's like 30 seconds each. There's going to be a blunder. Neither side has enough time to navigate the complications. But here, 10 minutes each. Uh, yeah, they've got plenty yeah. of time to work this one out. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's good, though. It's good because you do not want this position when you have, like, 30 seconds on the clock. I mean, I know that I would be panic central and I would just be like, what to do, what to do? Everything leaves in checkmate. Ah! <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm used to playing positions when low on time, but normally it's positions I can control. This type of position you can't control. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just one slip and it's, it's out of your hands. It's up to your opponent suddenly. And uh, there's going to be surprising checks. There's going to be even more sacrifices, most likely. On the subject of time trouble, do you ever let your emotions run away with you? Like, for instance, you know, you're so caught up in, like, the panic of the clock ticking down. Uh, or you do, are you just, like, I think, in my element, in the zone, just looking at moves? When I have less than one minute on the clock in a classical game, that's when I feel the calmest, uh, kind of, in my whole life. Uh, I, I don't know, sometimes in life I feel stressed or overwhelmed. You know, there's admin to be done, there's work to be done, there's stuff going on. But when you're playing chess, you've got one minute left. You just focus on the board. There's nothing else in the world exists. And for me, at least, that's when I'm at my happiest, calmest. That sounds like a, that but, sounds like a uh, nice situation. Yeah, but then other people, I think for the viewers, it's stressful. They're like, well, he's about to lose on time. What's going on? <laughs> but for me, it's like, yeah, this is, this is chill time. This is Dave time. Yeah. <laughs> Dave time, I like that. <laughs> All right, you guys, it's uh, dramatic. Uh, in the chats, it's dramatic in San Francisco. Are you guys uh, sensing the tension, uh, Tanya, down in San Francisco? Yeah, such a fun day. I mean, if you think about it, Magnus hasn't been in this situation where the score has been level and he goes into game four, uh, a decisive game. Will it go into tiebreak or not? It's been very impressive to see Liam today. Uh, you know, when you're playing against a player like Magnus, who's so in form, uh, to actually come back from that first round loss, I mean, Liam's uh, looking super strong today. So. I'm secretly hoping for a tiebreak, a playoff. It's always fun to see some blitz, but that's not the only fun that we've been having here at the playing arena because it's Ace in the sleeve that's taken over the mix zone. I've got Alison here with me. Alison, how are you enjoying the app? This is really fun. It's challenging, and I'm right now, I think I'm on level six or seven. It's really fun, really addicting. Like once I start playing, I can't really stop. What do you like about it? I think it's just the challenge because it's not really like typical chess, right? This position's already set up and it's like you have to place it out of nowhere. So it's just the extra added element of like unexpectedness, I guess. Yeah. 
Are you surprised that Magnus uh, got 39 on this? I'm actually very surprised because Christopher got 72, which almost doubled the score, which is crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. And where are you at right now? Uh, I'm almost at level 6, I think. Um, Ooh, level 6. Let's restart it. Right. And what's, uh, what's the one thing as a chess player that you find challenging about this app? I think it's just um, how you have to place the piece out of nowhere. Because typically in chess, you, it's already there, right? so you can't really put it anywhere on the board. But here, there's so many more possibilities. Yeah. Well, we've got chess players here actually discussing theories and strategies of how they can get better at ace in the sleeve. It's taking over. How cool. Launching today the Magnus Chess Academy app where you can, for example, try the game Ace in the Sleeve. They're doing a great job in San Francisco. The high score is Anish Giri with 69 cards. Magnus Carlsen did the 39 cards. Okay, we have a few moves in this one. Anything developing? Yeah, uh, quite a big moment. The evaluation Ooh. bar suddenly swung towards Prague's favor. And that's because Duda did take a timeout to capture the white pawn in the center. And that has given Prague time to activate the white rooks. Suddenly, black has no direct threat. And as soon as the white rooks get, start to get active, Prague is going to potentially build up a counterattack. So this one, there's still a lot of life left. It's still roughly in the balance, but I do like the way this has turned over the last move for Prague. Okay, he's in a must-win situation, Prague, to take this to tie breaks. There is another big, big game going on right now. Magnus Carlsen in San Francisco is tied with Liam Lea. And uh, if we have a winner in that game, that player will take all three points. If it is a draw, it's going to go to tie breaks. And you said, David, Magnus has done something quite spectacular. Yeah, it's a spectacular few moves for both sides, actually, because I said this one was quite dull. It was quite boring. Just a few moves ago, it was completely symmetrical. But Magnus sacrificed a piece. Wow. So he was really going for it. And I do think Liam has found a really sneaky way of uh, surviving. We have to jump into the analysis board here just to explain what's going on, because it's so complicated right now. Uh, black is a piece down but there's an attack against the white queen, white knight, and white bishop. And it all started here. It looks very peaceful. Uh, if black just plays a sensible move, the game is just equal. But Magnus jumped in with the black knight, sacrificing this piece, opening up an attack against the queen. But the reason this is a sacrifice is because white can just take this knight. There's a counterattack against the black queen. There's no, knight, no time now to go and take this piece. Magnus simply calmly recaptured. And uh, now there's a double attack, hitting the queen, hitting the knight, and uh, Liam reacted with a counterattack of his own. Right now, both queens are under fire. Both sides have minor pieces under fire. It's just complete chaos. Black took this pawn with his queen. He has to stay guarding his rook uh, in order to protect it. And uh, Liam, again, and second counterattack, hitting the black queen. Magnus, a piece down, can't allow that to drop off. And here, as we see, Stockfish suggesting three moves below the analysis board right now. White has a narrow path to maintain the balance. The only move to maintain equality is to take this pawn, to give up the white knight. It's going to drop anyway. You have to protect your queen, you have to protect your bishop, and you have to protect your knight. And uh, of course, you can't do three things at once here. So why not give up your knight for a pawn? And the reason this is so good for white, or at least holds the balance, is because black has to take back with his own pawn. The black queen cannot take this white knight because suddenly the black rook would no longer have its bodyguard. Uh, now, after pawn takes, at least the black queen stays defending it. And here, white does have time to just sidestep. And uh, for example, if there's a bishop, uh, bishop trade, Magnus emerges from all of this mess one pawn ahead as black. But look at these pawns. These are doubled. And this is isolated, the h6 pawn as well. And black's king is a bit open. So Liam would have enough compensation to hold the draw. OK. But he has to find this move right now. Is he likely to? I think so. It's a check. And you naturally check all the checks, the captures mm -hmm. and the threats. So I, I do have faith that Liam will find the solution because everything else just looks too shaky. Yeah, for example, if you move the queen out of this attack first, uh, for example, if you go, uh, if you just sidestep, now bishop takes bishop and next move, Magnus will take this white knight. And if you compare that, we re reach the exact same position, except black still has an extra pawn on this square. He has found the best move, uh, Liam, he's that good. He does uh, capture this pawn with a check. Of course, he wasn't going to miss this. And now if we compare the position, OK, Magnus doesn't trade the bishops yet, but black has lost the g7 pawn in the process. So um, this one is very, very balanced now. I'm expecting the M at some point to just trade off the bishops, and he should be safe. Maybe you have to be slightly careful of when you take right now. Uh, you have to be careful. 
I don't think it quite works here, but uh, of the black pawn stepping forward, unleashing an attack against the white rook. But uh, yeah, I think Liam has stabilized. There's uh, simply time now to just maybe push a pawn, stop the bishop taking this pawn. Maybe you can move the white rook. Uh, a bunch of options. So is it even more likely now that we will see tie breaks? Yes, I think that kind of three, four moves of chaos, Magnus initiated it. He kind of tested Liam, but Liam passed the test and Liam saying, OK, I survived. Now I just need to calm myself. And Black's extra pawn is meaningless here. If we do see the bishops disappear, a draw is almost guaranteed. And I also see now the bar is uh, really jumping up for Prague against Duda. If he wins that game, we will see tie breaks in that one as well. I think we might need to jump back to the other game. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> this one, we've seen the action. Magnus entertained us just for a few moves. But uh, yeah, the other game is the more dramatic of the two. I think the other game uh, will be decisive either way. It does look like it's going in Prague's favor. And uh, we might see two sets of tie breaks. Oh, that's so exciting. And uh, Prague, he is uh, the one right now fighting for those tie breaks. He has to win against uh, Duda and the bar has jumped up for the young Indian, but we have seen Duda just super duper good at saving difficult positions. In this one, it looks like Magnus and Liam will play a draw, and that means tie breaks between these two. That will start 10 minutes after the final game in this round four. So you're saying we should jump to Prague and Duda? I think so. We're about to see the bishops leave the board, the rooks leave the board in this one, and we'll see a long Queen End game. So even if Magnus can squeeze something out, it's going to be a long grind. Uh, the other game, however, there's going to be decisive action any moment now. All right. Uh, Prague, yeah, he's in charge, but it could turn around in the course of one move. It's that type of position. So we're jumping over to Prague and Duda, game four. Can Prague win this and take it to tie break? So what's happening? So we've seen some uh, simplification of the position. There's a massive threat on the board now. Black's trying to swing his rook across to the G file to, to pin the white queen, win the white queen. And uh, if we do a quick count, black suddenly has five pawns, white has three, but white still has that extra bishop. So what we've missed is simply just a bishop for knight trade. Black's knight, the dangerous knight, has disappeared. Yavanko. It still looks a bit scary. It does still look scary. So that's why if I were playing with the white pieces, I would just throw some extra money at the problem and I would retreat my rook, or I was going to say move my bishop, so that there is some kind of cover over the G line. Yeah, this was essential. Prague found one of the two defences. Uh, this is just too strong, uh, this pin. So uh, he did retreat with his rook. The whole idea is to meet this pin with a block. The rook is, the rook is a great blocker here. And uh, instantly, Duda rejected that variation. He brought his queen in. Suddenly, maybe a small dilemma where to put the bishop. Uh, one idea you had, Yvanka, just there as well, was to plant the bishop on this square and then maybe use the bishop as a blocker. Yeah, that was one of our, um, <laughs> just a solution that I had because obviously the king needs protection. Yeah. So that, that's definitely the, my first choice, actually. Yeah. It's going to be that or it's going to be attacking the rook and saying, hey, my rook on b3, that's just an excellent defender. Yeah, you can attack the rook here, gain a bit of time, and then next move, swing across. Pretty much no matter what, you'll play this move. You can almost pre-move it. Mm -hmm. uh, just def bring an extra piece to the defense, and white's material will count. And wow, the computer says plus five. Yeah. To me, it looks good for white, but <laughs> plus five good? That's, uh, <laughs> that's extreme, almost. And yeah, right now, that does mean the computer's evaluation that white has a winning blow, or at least a way to profit from this extra bishop. OK, but OK, so once again, I, I took a peek at the plus five variation, mm -hmm. and the, it is like so crazy, because it's saying white should be super chill, and guess what? Grab the pawn in the middle of the board. Wow. <laughs> like any human would casually do that. And uh, after the rook moves to attack the f pawn, just drop your queen back to d4 and you're just like, hey, you've got it all covered. It's almost like the big Lebowski is he playing plays this. It. And, he, <laughs> and uh, yeah, wow. Pragananda take my hat off to you, sir. Yeah, super impressive stuff from the teenager, not showing any nerves at all in this must-win situation. Most mere humans here, myself included, would just move the white bishop, uh, but he's happy to jump forward, capture another pawn with his queen. Now white is a bishop for just one pawn ahead. And uh, remember, any checks, this looks scary for the white king, but any checks will be blocked by white's rook swinging across 
And uh, yeah, the more pieces that leave the board, the closer Prague gets to that desired point, that desired victory. And no other way for Black to continue the attack. Duda frowning. He, instinct wise, it just looks so suicidal to leave your king like this. But it works. And these youngsters, they're so concrete, they calculate so well. If they don't see a reason not to grab a pawn, they don't see ghosts, they just go for it. And uh, there's no way right now for Black to profit. As you said, Yumanka, this attack looks very scary as well. Uh, but you just drop the queen back. Simple, I mean, it's simple in hindsight. But uh, when you're calculating, it's so, it looks so scary. You've abandoned the light squares. Yeah. Suddenly the queen, the bishop, they're all a bit loose. But it's just about working for white. And uh, we see Duda double on the E line. Uh, yeah. This also looks good, you know, introducing a new piece to the attack. But to be honest, I say attack, but there's, there's no, no attack. attack whatsoever. Especially once white moves this rook across, I would be tempted to go for this now. And uh, suddenly white can start counterattacking. This g7 pawn is a bit tender. It's on a dark square, can be hit by white's bishop, white's queen. Uh, I love that, that move. And then I would follow that up by, and there you go. Pragnanda is looking after his king. And next move that I would be playing if I were playing with the white pieces would be just to move my rook across to attack the queen. Yeah. And uh, happy days. White's other rook in the corner is coming to e1, yeah, in front of the queen. And that would swap off pieces. I want to see Duda on the camera as well, because a moment ago we saw him go like, oh, what is happening? It's all gone wrong. When we left it earlier, when we switched over to the other game, it looked like he still had chances, still had some counterplay, but he didn't find the most direct way. Yeah. Uh, I think it all started, you, you were right, Yvanka, it all started with capturing White's e-pawn. Duda's so frustrated right now. Uh, he just wasted one move, essentially. He should have swung his rook across towards the White King immediately. As soon as, Black's, uh, as, soon as sorry, White's rook got active, it's, uh, there's just been no chance. Yeah, and uh, there you see the frustration on his face. Yeah, it's an important lesson, you know, keep it simple, don't switch focus, stick to the plan, you know, and we've actually seen it time and time again, especially today, we saw it with Liam, you know, he adopted a plan and then he abandoned that plan mm. and went on the aggressive. And here, Duda needed to go on the aggressive and instead he grabbed material. That really wasn't relevant. Yeah, you're right. And uh, that's one thing I've noticed with modern chess players, modern uh, kind of the new generation who are brought up with computers, they look move by move. Maybe it's because we do a lot of puzzles as well. We just look at the current position, we try to solve it, but they forget what they were solved two moves ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, when I look at a plan, I'm kind of planning five, ten moves ahead and I'll stick to that, good or not. Uh, sometimes I get punished for that, but the players who do kind of change their plan every move, as we see Duda here, Liam there, that's their downfall. And he looks like he wants to kind of throw a piece, hit the computer. <laughs> He's just, uh, he knows he was so close to getting that draw. Just one or two accurate moves and suddenly he's just a bishop down for nothing. You know, I genuinely thought that he was actually going to hit the computer there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's so angry with yeah. himself. We've all been there, right? Yeah. <laughs> After a difficult loss in a blitz game or bullet game, we all want to throw the mouse or... It's like... uh, yeah, just take our anger out. Yeah, and 35 seconds left for Duda. If he loses this, we will see tie breaks. It's so dramatic right now because the bar is also way up for Magnus Carlsen in that game. Is he now winning? Wow, how does Magnus do it? When we left it earlier, it looked like a dead draw. Somehow he swapped the queens off, he swapped the rooks off, and he's a pawn up in a bishop endgame. I think that one will still be going most likely by the time we finish this game. Okay. Uh, that one still will take a while, Magnus, to break through. But it looks like he might squeeze a victory there out of nothing. Wow. And if he does, that's going to mean three points for Magnus Carlsen. And if Duda loses this, he can max get two points out of today. And Magnus will have a huge lead in the tournament. It's almost insurmountable. Yeah. Again, you know, Magnus just showing his class and uh, Duda offering a trade of queens. And there you can see when he's doing that, he's just accepting. It's all over and, oh, he's so mad with yeah. himself. Yeah, and he's going to resign any moment. You can tell on his body language. He just needs to get this game over and done with. The queens are about to leave the board and that is uh, basically uh, an admission of defeat. I think Prague can just safely swap off the queens, bring that, black, uh, bring that white rook out of the corner, and the extra bishop. It's, uh, it's on a perfect square as well. It's going to decide this game. 
And um, you know, Prague isn't even talking <laughs> of Queens. He's like, yeah, let me just improve my rook. I mean, so chill, so calm, so confident. Yeah. So Look impressive. at Prague. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is the thing. Like, he, he held his nerve. He was out prepared in this game. And uh, he somehow, especially with a weak king like that with white, he somehow navigated it, tricked Duda, and uh, consolidated his material advantage. There's actually been a pattern. The previous game, Prague out-prepared Duda, but as soon as he ran out of prep, he went astray and then lost. And this game, Duda out-prepared Prague, <laughs> and two moves later, he was pretty much lost. It's, uh, <laughs> that's why opening preparation is important, but you need to know what to do next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's often the player who is better prepared, who kind of doesn't switch their brain on in time to calculate the middle game. And uh, yeah, Duda he just hit himself there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, now seen the queens disappear and white's going after pawns. Yeah. He's playing on a hopeless position here. Yeah, totally hopeless. And uh, also take a look at that pawn structure that black has there on the right side. You know, it's full of dark square weaknesses. And what does white have? A dark squared bishop. Mm. He looks so ready. Oh, look how furious he is. I've never seen Jan Christoph Duda like this. Yeah, because he knows he got his dream preparation. He spent the whole break looking at this opening and even getting everything kind of lined up, everything falling in his favor, and he still couldn't convert and get that full point mm. or get uh, kind of into the, well, get the three points today. And yeah. okay, he's still playing on, but why? He's just given up an extra pawn. And uh, I'm expecting White's Rook now on the third rank to swing across and defend the bishop, defend the pawn on the A-file. There we go. What can be done? Nothing, simply. Nothing. That A-pawn, those two A-pawns are just going to... Just queen. I mean, White has an extra piece. Nothing to do. The bishop is just going to take one step backwards. Doesn't even need to do that. Can also retreat the Rook and protect the bishop. And uh, once again, Duda, he just can't let go. Yeah. He's, but I mean, mate, is this a good sign? Is he kind of like venting all his anger now, out now, giving himself like 10 minutes of just frustration? And then when he gets to the tie breaks, he'll be like calm. Yeah. Or will this carry on? We've seen this from him before, some kind of anger, nothing this extreme, but uh, we've seen anger from Duda before, and then he calms down and wins the tie break. Uh, if you remember, I think it was last month against Mamad Yarov, he lost a game and he was just happy to force a draw and take the, take the match into playoffs uh, just to get it out of his system. But he needs to get it out of his system now because he's raging. Yeah, he is. I mean, that's a, is. so many times it looks like he's going to hit that resign button and just like just run out of the room. But uh, he keeps on playing. OK, now it's going to happen. And we do see Duda finally resign. The rooks were coming off and the end game was easily winning for White. Wow, it's a comeback by Prague. He takes it to tie breaks and they will start in exactly 10 minutes. Prague and Duda will start the first blitz game in 10 minutes. The winner will take two points and the loser one point. It was looking so good for Duda. But now he needs to finish this match in blitz and potentially Arma get on tie breaks and can Max get two points out of today. Momentum is now on Prague's side after winning a great game four. We're going to just follow him out and see if we can get a reaction. Yes. Prague, what a match this is turning out to be. Four decisive games. Are you relieved that playoffs are coming up? Yeah, I'm happy the players are coming, but I don't think I played <clears throat> very well today. Uh, maybe this game, I didn't really calculate anything. I was just making moves and kind of worked out in my favor. Uh, yeah, I just want to do well in the blitz. We wish you all the best. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. That's going to be super exciting. Question is, will this one as well need to be decided in tie breaks? They are tied before game four, Liam Lee and Magnus Carlsen. This one looked like a complete draw. Something huge has happened and the bar is way over to Magnus' side. Yeah, and it feels like it's all gone wrong for Liam. Earlier when we left it, there were queens and rooks on the board. We mentioned that black had an extra pawn, but it wasn't really uh, an effective pawn with those two doubled f-pawns, as long as it was just queen and rooks. 
But if it's just a bishop endgame, look at white's pawns now on the right side of the board, especially the white pawn on g2. That is a huge target for, for black's uh, light squared bishop. If the pawns were in dark squares for white, you're safe. But uh, yeah, if that white pawn on g2 drops, the black h pawn just runs through. And look at what Magnus has done. He's planted his bishop just ready to jump in to attack white's pawns over there on the right. So white's king is kind of forced to defend it. The problem for black, the problem for Magnus is he's blocked his own king out. The black king can't get in. No, and uh, where is that king going to go? So it has to go running, but every time it runs to the right side, it's going to get matched by the white king. And if it runs to the left or keeps itself in the center, white is simply going to copy. Yeah, it feels like Magnus, by kind of planting his bishop on the square, he's blocked the entry for his own king. And OK, he has to retreat the black bishop. He's now hinting that the black king is going to come closer to that white seaborn. But as soon as this happens, Liam closes the door. Yeah, I thought we would see a decisive uh, result here, actually. Just a few moves ago, it looked like the Black King was in. It had infiltrated just before we joined the game, but uh, suddenly the Black King is further back. Liam defending so well. And uh, this is the problem with same colored bishops. We talk about opposite color bishops often having this drawish tendency. When it's the same color bishop, Often it's just hard to trade them off. It looks like it should be simple, but as soon as black offers, offers a bishop trade, white's bishop will run. And uh, Magnus now failing to break through with his king around this side. He's going the long way around. He's going around the outside now from the A file. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's tried this once before and it didn't work. It didn't work and uh, the white king has to dash over to that side of the board in a hurry. And uh, obviously you have to tread carefully. You cannot put your king and your bishop on the same diagonal. Yeah, you cannot allow black to force a bishop exchange. Uh, then having the extra pawn for black will be decisive. Um, so, yeah, you need to keep bishops on the board somehow. You need to stop black's king from entering. You need to stop black's bishop from attacking the white pawns on the right side. So there's a lot of uh, kind of things in the to-do column. But uh, Liam has done that very well so far. And he goes back with his king. You're right, Yovanko, this was necessary sooner rather than later. Yeah. Travel on the dark squares, and then the king steps forward. I mean, it does look like the black king is going to at least get to the a3 square, which, incidentally, we have seen before. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's true, you know, how is it going to break down White's fortress? Yeah, how are you going to get further in? Uh, I'm expecting the black king to keep it uh, on its journey. What else, simply? But it does seem that white is holding this fortress. I mean, it's just the theme of the tournament. As soon as Magnus mentioned the word fortress in one interview, <laughs> like every game of his, it's the question, is it a fortress or is it not? Can this be broken? Can you creep in with the Black King? Yeah. That's the only way to win this endgame. What's to stop the king coming in now? OK, so Magnus retreats the bishop. Mm -hmm. OK, there's, we have to also mention that there is an idea in the air of the bishop capturing the pawn. Yeah, we can show black's potential winning ideas. For example, if white is careless and drops his bishop back in the wrong direction, now you can play bishop takes pawn, clearing the path for the h pawn to run to victory. Uh, now the pawn runs and the white bishop is not in time to come and stop it. Uh, it's only two squares away. So you have to be a bit careful with where you put your bishop, but uh, as long as you leave it on this square, it should be safe. For example, if the white king moves, uh, now this does not work, this capture. Uh, at least I don't think so, because the white bishop is just in time to save the day. It hits the pawn, and next move, it blocks the pawn's promotion. So I think Liam is okay if, as long as he waits in the right way. But uh, where do you wait? Actually, the problem with going this way is maybe the black bishop's going to come, and this is the other danger if the black bishop sneaks in from behind. So, uh, okay, Liam waits with his king. He steps the king back. Uh, the other winning attempt for Magnus is to march his king in, but the problem is... I don't like what Magnus has done by, by putting his pawn on a light square. The king, as soon as it moves, for example, here, uh, as soon as it comes in, will abandon its own pawn. Mm -hmm. So if this pawn was back on a dark square, if it was back on safety, maybe some winning chances. Do you see a breakthrough, Yovanka? I don't really. I see one idea, which is if the king steps forward, mm -hmm. white has to be super accurate here with where they put the king. And I think maybe they should put it on the b2 square because then black will play the bishop, will offer a trade of bishops. Mm -hmm. And then this pawn ending is a draw. 
Yeah, it's a draw as long as you stop black from entering on these two squares. So that's why we have to be really careful, as you say, Ivanka, of where white's king goes. Uh, for example, if you go the wrong way, if you let the black king in, then it will happily accept the invitation and the white king will be forced to give way and black's king will zugzwang white, kick the white king as way, uh, away and eventually start snacking on some pawns. So you have to be ready when the pawns come off uh, to just block the black king. We call it the opposition. You stay opposite and the black king cannot enter. And here we see black is a pawn up, but these three do not beat white's two. White's two hold those three pawns. And uh, white is going to control the critical entry point, uh, the b2, a3 squares. Yeah, as long as you hold these two, the black king can't come in. There's no other path into the white half for this black king. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I think Liam has found the right way to defend. His king is ready to come and block. Uh, sorry, his king is ready to come here and block to b2. And uh, now the waiting game has ensued, you know. Yeah. Magnus, seeing nothing direct, just says, well, I'm just going to pass the move on to you, my friend. Is it difficult for Liam to navigate in this game now? He's got enough time, that's the good thing. Mm -hmm. And because it's so simplified, because it's an endgame and it's just bishops of one colour, um, the options are quite limited. On, I think on every turn he'll have two kind of sensible moves. OK, oh. now Magnus trades off a set of pawns. This should be one step closer to the draw for Liam. But uh, the more pawns that disappear, the happier he'll be. But yeah, he'll have two or three sensible moves on every turn. And with four minutes, you can kind of just process of elimination, check them all, mm -hmm. and choose the one that looks most natural to you. The problem here for Magnus now is he's only got pawns on one half of the board. It's only on the right side now. And as long as the White King runs across to defend its two pawns, there's no way through. You need to somehow get the Black King in the race uh, to those pawns. You need to get it in first. But White's King has got a head start. No. That white king is only three moves away. If it can plant itself on the f2 square, it's a dead draw. OK, Magnus is banking on a king and pawn endgame. If the bishops are traded now, maybe some chance, as long as the black king can get, quick, get there quicker. But now this is really clever by Liam. He doesn't break the tension first. He says, yes, you can exchange, but it's on my terms. So if black takes the white bishop, white's king is actually nearer the black pawns. Maybe then white would win. Uh, so king and pawn endgames are the hardest ones to calculate in chess, but essentially, your king needs to be nearer the pawns than your opponent's king. And that's why Liam is running across so quickly. Do you know, king and pawn endings are almost not like chess because it's just pure calculation. It's almost like a mathematical game. Yeah. I always recommend starting with king and pawn endgames mm. when you're trying to learn chess because no matter what, uh, kind of at all levels of the game, you're guaranteed to get king and pawn endgames. Yeah. And you learn when to make queens, when to push pawns, where to put your king. Uh, and like you said, Ivanka, it trains calculation. Other parts of the game, sometimes you forget about calculation. It's just about peace activity and other stuff. But here, yeah, I think Magnus has blown the win. Wow. White's yeah. king is close enough to its own pawns to defend. And uh, we're going to see a second set of tie breaks, the very first. Fun. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. These two will start tie breaks 10 minutes after this game finishes. Prague and Duda, they're going to start their first blitz game in only a minute. And Duda has chosen to start with the black pieces. So Prague will play with the white pieces in the first blitz game. Ooh, it's about to get dramatic. It is. And do you think we'll see Prague repeat the same opening for a third time, oh, Yvanka? Oh, oh, oh. I think he'll switch it up. He has to switch it up, right? I mean, Surely. he's had t two losses. <clears throat> And OK, the second game wasn't necessarily to do with the opening, but yeah, it didn't quite work for him. So you have to change. Yeah. You have to be flexible. You can't be stubborn in this uh, day. And here he comes, Prague, for blitz game number one. Two blitz games to decide <clears throat> now the match. The winner will get two points, the loser one point. If they are tied after those two blitz games, then it will be decided in Armageddon. It looks like Duda is still kind of upset from that loss. Yeah, he's still suffering. He's still living in the past, but you can't do that at the top level. You have to move on. You have to reset. And uh, once the pieces start moving, once the clock starts ticking, I'm pretty sure he'll be able to uh, kind of focus on the moment. He's very good at that usually, but there's a worrying signs on the camera. Still shaking his head. And uh, maybe he's thinking about the tournament as a whole. He's lost one very valuable point in the race to catch up with Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. And that could be decisive later. Yeah. Well, it does look like he's going to be quite lucky because uh, Magnus also definitely not yeah. going to win this game. White can even win the pawn back now. 
he was a pawn down, but he's won that pawn. And we'll see everything get traded off. This is basically a draw offer from Magnus. He shakes his head. Uh, everything's been eliminated. And we will see. Yeah, Magnus probably just give up his bishop here or repeat the position. There's nothing to be done. And uh, a draw any second now. He even puts his bishop in the corner. A bit of chess humor. This, okay. this bishop can be trapped. But uh, there we'll see. It will give itself up. And a bishop alone cannot deliver checkmate for white. So this is a draw. This means Magnus will definitely lose his first point in the tournament. He's going to play his first tiebreak. It is over. A little bit upset there. He will now have 10 minutes, Magnus Carlsen, to get ready for blitz game number one against Lee Emle. And Magnus, uh, he will be able to choose the colors. We see the arbiter running after him to check with him. Will he start with the white or will he start with the black pieces? So let's see if you have a reaction from Magnus. Magnus, big fight there. You really pushed it till the end. How are you feeling taking it to the playoffs now? Yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, felt like there were some some chances, like maybe at the end, if I uh, if I hadn't pushed stage four, maybe I could have. Uh, I don't know why I pushed stage four. That was dumb. I mean, I knew it was dumb, uh, but I just wanted to take G3 out of the equation. But yeah, I needed to to keep that possibility. Um, if I'd done that, uh, I think maybe I could have. Uh, could have traded the bishops at the end, and then it would have been a win. Uh, but yeah, it's it's all right. It's it's okay. A couple of minutes. How do you shift to the mindset for blitz? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll try. Okay. Can't wait to see how this well, he hasn't played blitz uh, so far this tournament, uh, Magnus Carlsen. He needs to shift into uh, the mindset of time being slashed five minutes on the clock and only three seconds increment. These two have already started game one in the Blitz tie breaks. Prague with the white pieces. What is happening? We are coming in at move 14. Yeah, so it's still early days. Only one set of pawns have been exchanged. And uh, this game, it did start as a French defense. So it's Duda who switched up the openings, who played something he hasn't played so far today. And uh, it's not the typical blocked structure that we normally see from the French defense. We do jump in, though, at a very critical moment because Ooh. Prague has just given himself an isolated queen's pawn, an IQP, as we call it in chess. Look at White's d4 pawn long term. That's incredibly weak. So Prague, he's playing dynamically. He's playing for short term factors. He wants to attack the Black King and also Harry the h pawn. White's h pawn is quite far advanced already. Yeah. And uh, it's threatening to push one square forward, which we've seen Pragnanda do in very, very many occasions. I really like what Prague is doing. You know, he, his position is active. He's putting pressure on Duda. Duda offering a trade of bishops. I would be tempted to say no, thank you, and retreat the bishop. And you see that on the board. And get ready to march the H pawn when necessary. Because if, the great thing about that pawn is it keeps a lot of tension on the board. Black is always going to have to calculate whether to capture the pawn, whether it will advance. So whilst that choice remains, Duda will be burning time on the clock. Yeah, and white's pieces, if you look at them, especially the white knights, the white bishops, they're like storm clouds on the horizon. You know that something's coming. You know that the pieces are gathering ready for an attack. It's just when the clouds break, when, they, uh, when the rain comes towards that black king. And they're all planted, those white knights and bishops, at least near enough the black king. Uh, so just one or two moves and they'll spring forward and there might be a deadly attack. And, the fact that the evaluation bar is so far in White's favor means this is actually immediately scary. Normally, these, this pawn structure, with White having an isolated pawn, computers are a bit skeptical. They say, unless there's something immediate, they say, oh, black is fine, black is equal, you should be able to survive. But black actually doesn't have a plan. Uh, the problem is, what do you do with black? There's no clear square for the black queen. Black's rooks don't really have a purpose. Even if one of the black rooks goes to the open C file, there's no entry points on the C file. So you just have to sit and wait for white to build up. Mm -hmm. And that's not a pleasant scenario to be in psychologically. And uh, Duda spent a lot of time on that one move. He was actually ahead on the clock by almost a minute. And uh, now that time advantage has disappeared and he's still shaking his head. Yeah. Every move. It looks like he's just kind of staring away now from the, uh, from the screen, the board. It looks like he's still living in the past. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm worried for Black's position. Yeah, me too. I'm, uh, I'm very worried that the Knights are going to spring forward and it's going to be a problem central on the dark squares for Black. And uh, I mean, why is Prague 
Prague has taken a pause, but he's playing the most natural move on the board. Attacking the dark square bishop, retreats, and now you can attack again. And he comes forward with his knight, threatening to soften up the black kingside pawns. Yeah, watch out for some sacrifices mm -hmm. potentially mm -hmm. towards the black king. Black does black does have this wall of pawns. So, uh, what was it you called it in the past, Yvanka? This black pawn chain around black's kingside. I called it the wall. The Whenever wall. I set it up, I'm like, ha ha, break that down. Yeah, Prague's going to try. <laughs> He's going to try and break it down. <laughs> I must admit, I never allow a knight to get to that square because it's just too scary. So many sacrifices in the air. That knight could sacrifice itself on h7. And uh, it's not just that, but the queen can also lift herself at the right time to the e4 square and then dash over to the h line and attack the king. So many attacking possibilities. Yeah, uh, attacking possibilities for Prague. But where are the counter-attacking possibilities for Duda? There just simply are none. Yeah. It's one-sided traffic. And in blitz, it's much harder to defend than it is to attack. When you're attacking, you can build momentum, you see the checks, you see the threats, captures. As a defender, you're just trying to survive, and often that isn't enough. You need to play actively to defend at the top level, and there's no time. Duda, two minutes now, a whole minute down on the clock, still shaking his head. It's really, really scary for the Polish fighter here. He can barely find a move. I would just move one of the black rooks to the open sea file. Just improve it. Okay, he moves it across to this square. A Why this square? Very strange. Blocked by his own knights. Ooh, and the bar jumps up for Prague. Yeah, and sometimes you're right, Kaya. Just instinctively, it looks wrong. He's still shaking his head. You can capture that pawn. You know, we were talking about it going, demolish the kingside. And uh, Prague is now going to be thinking about capturing that pawn. I have been itching to do that. So for now a is long the time. time to sacrifice. Yes, Ooh. sacrifice it. Knight takes the pawn, just ruin the black kingside, and just springboard. The, into the black position with the knight and the queen. It's just dangerous. And he and gives he up it. his knight. Oh, did we ever doubt Prague and his attacking instincts? This is right up his alley, Prague. He loves to attack. He's played some of the most beautiful games of the whole tour this season. And the problem for black is if you want to take this knight back, you have to, otherwise you're just a pawn down. If you take it back, your king is out in the open now. Look at white's light squared bishop lined up on the same diagonal. We saw a trade of pawns. The other white knight replaces its fellow here. And Black's pawns, that wall of pawns, have just disappeared. Yeah. And uh, now the bishop has come. Now the queen is going to go over to the h5 square. I mean, look at Black's position. It's in tatters. Yeah, you have an extra piece as Black. You've won a knight in that little process. But what are you doing with your extra piece? Nothing. Black's playing without <laughs> a rook, without a bishop on that left side. Yeah. It's all about that Black king. Yeah. And White has too many pieces nearby. This is just textbook classical stuff. Uh, Prague has clearly studied this type of pawn structure before Duda out of his comfort zone. He's just not going to survive. He moved pieces away. He moved his black rook away from the defence. I just don't understand. It didn't make any sense to me because White's play was so logical and it was so straightforward and direct. You know, it, it wasn't mysterious what he was threatening. And Duda just ignored it and he's paying the price. Yeah, he knew what Prague's idea was, but he gave it even more power by moving the black rook away. The best move might be to bring Black's rook back to the F8 uh, where it stood earlier. I mean, this looks scary. Okay, he retreats a knight. This is logical as well. Knights are the best defenders. But uh, White's bishop can give a check now. Look at Duda. He just hasn't recovered. He, he's still thinking about that last rapid game. Yeah, that's, that's why in chess we need to be mentally stable all the time. Just need to be calm, need to be focused on the position in front of us. We can't think about the past ever. Yeah. And White's, ooh, Yvanka, White's dark squared bishop could come out maybe to hit the black queen, distract the black queen away. That's a beautiful move, David. Don't know if it works. I think it does, but um, ooh, right now it's just black's defences are creaking. Yeah, and uh, I like the bishop move as well because the king has to run to the H line. It cannot run to any other square because it's going to be game over. Black will lose their queen if you yeah. run to the king with the king to F8. Yeah, unfortunately, you're forced into the corner where you, where you will be trapped. I mean, you're going to be trapped in the centre. I think this is just a dead loss position. Yeah, you, there we go. The king finding its only safe square. Now, all Prague needs to do is somehow get his queen to the H line, and that's what he's doing. He's getting ready to swing across on the third rank to the H-file and deliver a deadly check. Yeah, Duda is one check away from checkmate. Wow. I mean, it's, it's unsalvageable. Yeah, it's this... hopeless. 
Exactly. And this is what we talk about. It's impossible to defend when you have no time on your clock. As soon as that peace sacrifice happened, yes, it was good for Prague, but Duda collapsed. He fell apart. And now you can give a check with the white queen. You can even lift the white rook up the board, use the rook to come and start checking. <laughs> That's what everything. I would do. Introduce all my pieces to the party. Yeah, white is attacking with the queen, bishop and knight. You just need one more piece and just to tip black over the edge. And there is a tiebreak party going on right now in the tour finals. Magnus Carlsen should be walking into the arena in San Francisco any minute now to start his first blitz game against Lee Emle. Magnus has chosen to start with the white pieces. And that game will start very shortly and we're very lucky. We're going to be able to follow all the action. We will jump into that game when this one finishes. Here comes Magnus for his very first blitz game in the tour finals. He... He as well needs to shift into the time just being so much shorter. Jan Kristof Duda has not really been able to shake off the disappointment of game four. And he should be losing any minute now. Yeah, the Black Knights are holding everything together on their own. As long as you can win one of the Black Knights or eliminate one of the Black Knights, that will be the end. I'm expecting this move from Prague. There we go. The White Rook captured a pawn, attacking the Black Queen and... OK, he's walked into a pin. Duda is trying to give back material. He's managed to get the queens off the board, but it has come at a heavy price. Uh, he's had to give back his extra piece. So now Prague is just two pawns up. So he's not going for checkmate anymore. He's just going for uh, just a simple approach, uh, materialistic approach, perhaps. And I can't fault him for this. He's taken the risk out of the position. But it's a pity we didn't see that checkmate. The Black King should have already uh, died a really painful death by now. <laughs> And, uh, OK, he's swapping off bishops. Those two white pawns, the white F pawn and white G pawn, uh, those will decide the game long term. But I have to say, Duda is in for a whole lot of suffering. He's not going to last too much longer. And the clock is ticking down. Oh, yeah. He activates his rook, attacks a pawn. That's uh, Prague. He just captures that pawn on A7. And uh, there you go. You see another rook is going to enter the fray. Yeah, and Duda decides he has to fight for the seventh rank. That's where rooks belong. That's where white wanted to infiltrate. And, OK, a set of trades, a set of rooks have left the board, but it's still two-pawn advantage for Prague. Very safe two pawns as well. Black's knights can't really compete. White's bishop is just a great piece, I've got to say. <laughs> Defending and controlling some really important squares. But Duda is alive. Can he miraculously come back in this game? With only five seconds yes. on the clock. Yeah, he makes a trade of pieces. But as David's indicated, it's those two pawns on the right that are just going to decide the game. Yeah. Bishop is under fire. Move it. Retreat that bishop. Anywhere. Somewhere safe. And that's good enough. And now it's all about just advancing those two pawns. And preferably you do it as part of a team. You involve the rook, you involve the bishop. And... Uh, He's definitely attended maths class, Prague, because he knows how to simplify. And uh, he's just cynically just swapping all the pieces off, all the pawns off the board. And uh, yeah, Black, remember, has that weakness on b6. And uh, yeah, OK, Duda now, his knight is just the worst piece on the board, tied down defending. I'm surprised he's still playing, to be honest, because this is hopeless at this moment. Uh, the Black Knight activating. Maybe Duda's only hope to save this game is to, hope, is to hope that the two pawns on the left side disappear, that white's A pawn and black's B pawn get traded off, and then to give up the black knight for those two connected pass pawns that white has on the right side. If we end up with just rook and bishop against a rook, we do know from experience that is a draw. Mm -hmm. So that's the one small chance for Duda, but it's a pipe dream at this moment. And uh, Duda living around the 10 second mark. Yeah, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Moving around the three-second mark at this yeah, moment. Yeah, only three-seconds increment in the Blitz uh, chess. Yeah, and it shouldn't be enough. Duda hasn't lost on time. I'm expecting the clock to go up again after Prague has moved. But Prague is now down to 10 seconds. Could the nerves start to play a part here? Black Knight is getting really active. And uh, Duda is making some progress. He's pushed his pawn as far as it can go. But uh, the problem is you're not going any further. Black's Rook is awkwardly trapped now. You need to reroute that Black Rook. And uh, there we go. Duda's pawn is going to drop the remaining black pawn. And that will spell the end. He saw it, the frustration on Duda's face. Yeah, no way to save this. And uh, he leans back. I think he's about to resign. There it is. We have a result. Prague wins the first blitz game. The second one will start in five minutes. Duda will have the white pieces and he will have to win it. 
to take it to Armageddon. Any other result means Prague wins the match in tie breaks. Rushing off, we only have five minutes now to prepare for the second game. The first Blitz game. Oh, we're gonna hear from Prague. Nice. Prague, you've taken the lead for the first time in the match. You must be feeling good after this tremendous tactical win and good technique. Uh, yeah, there is still one more game, so you have to just focus on the next game. And because it's only five minute break, so I just got to focus. Go focus, all the best. In a good mood, of course. Taking the lead here, Prague. Magnus and Liam, they are playing the first Blitz game in their tie break to decide this match. And already the bar is over to Magnus' side. Yeah, we jump in and Magnus did create a checkmate threat on the last move. Uh, Black's H-pawn was attacked, so he's just moved it forward. I think the reason the computer likes white here, Yvanka, is because white's more active. White's yeah. queen, white's bishop, rooks. Rooks, there. everything is well placed. And uh, take a look at Black's pieces, chained at home. And uh, I'm just thinking that white can just improve the knight and get ready to jump that knight into the black side of the board. Yeah, White's Knight is maybe the only piece that isn't perfect right now, so why not improve it? Magnus, however, goes for a more direct approach. Makes sense in Blitz to create threats. Uh, that black isolated pawn in the center of the board is now not that easy to defend. You have to step back with the Knight to hold it. But uh, the problem for Magnus is, yes, he made that one move threat, but White's Rook on the B5 square is a bit vulnerable to attacks and he's trying to force an endgame. Yeah. Are you surprised by this? Um, no, because it wins a pawn, right? Yeah, it does look like it might win a pawn, at least temporarily. But uh, some of the pressure is off Black's position. So the problem for Black here is if you move the knight, the pawn in the middle drops off. If the Black bishop comes out to block, uh, then White's rook would capture the Black b-pawn. So a counterattack here from, from Liam, ignoring the threat on his knight in order to hit White's rook. But the evaluation bar reacts. Maybe the White rook now just slides up one square. Yeah. Um, Suddenly the dark squares are all whites. Yeah, and if you want to avoid losing that pawn, you just have to grimly hold on and pin yourself, And as we see there. And Magnus, doing what Magnus loves to do, he's just improving his knight. That knight is getting ready to springboard to the c5 square. Yeah, and I think Magnus is listening to music during this Blitz game. I saw him kind of bobbing his head, uh, just seemingly enjoying some tunes, and he's enjoying his position, for sure. As you say, Ivanka, all white's pieces are swarming forward, and black's pieces... Tangled make, up. Yeah, make a sad impression. And not one single piece <laughs> can move. Yeah, Black's knight is pinned and the other pieces are all on the back rank. Yeah. You can I move mean... the Black King, maybe. <laughs> the other pieces, <laughs> yeah, stuck in the mud. Yeah, exactly. And that, that, you know that's a sign of things going wrong when the only piece you can move is your king. And it <laughs> does. And uh, it's an understandable move. And now expecting Magnus to move in to the c5 square with a knight. He does. I think he's going to win a pawn now. There's no way really to stop White's Knight grabbing a pawn on the next move. You don't want to go passive with the Black Rook necessarily in the corner. How can you develop the Black Bishop? It's stuck defending pawns if you can't develop your Bishop, the Rook in the corner. Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is the type of position you just resign against Magnus in a classical game, in a long game. But in Blitz, maybe you get uh, some small chances. Oh, look at that Black Rook. What an ugly piece. It's stuck defending just uh, its own pawns there. How's that Black Rook ever getting in the game? Uh, it's just not. <laughs> it's never going to do that uh, unless Magnus messes up. And, uh, OK, well, Magnus still has the issue of how he's, is he going to break through. Yeah. He probably uh, doesn't even need to worry about that because Black can barely move. So <laughs> if, I were black, if I were white, I would just improve my king. Yeah. Let's play calm. Centralise the white king. You can just push a few pawns forward on either side of the, of the board, to be honest. The one thing you don't want to do necessarily is allow too many exchanges to happen, but black is miles away from ever getting white's powerful knight off the board. That white rook on b6 as well on that left side, it just clamps down on the whole black position. It's looking across the board, it's attacking some pawns. Yeah, this is total domination in terms of the pieces. And uh, Magnus, he's still got quite a lot of time. Uh, two and a half minutes here should be more than sufficient because you can just quietly, slowly play it. Mm -hmm. No tactics here. And we did see someone walking past the camera. That was Prague entering the arena in San Francisco for game two against Duda in their blitz tiebreak. He's in the lead with a draw win. He will win the match in the tiebreak portion. Duda has to win this game. And he's still looking so upset. He has not been able to shake off that loss. Yeah. Uh, 
And it's, it's kind of understandable. I mean, it takes a superhuman strength oh, yeah. just to forget a terrible loss like that. And especially when your mind decides to go, well, it was unnecessary. Why are you here in this situation? Mm. And uh, we haven't seen too many people be able to recover. That's I mean, we true. saw Prague. He lost in the playoffs against Giri after his second loss in a row. Yeah. So I think tomorrow we'll see a, a fresh and renewed Duda, but today I'm not holding up too much hope. But Duda should take solace in the fact that White has won every single game in that matchup so far. Oh. They've played five games, Duda and Prague, and White has won all of them. And now he has White. So maybe if he can get out the opening in good shape, uh, then he can banish those ghosts. But uh, yeah, it won't be easy, as you guys say. Meanwhile, Magnus is taking the slow approach. He's centralized the White King slightly. Now he's pushing a pawn one square. One of White's rooks is getting kicked back now, but. Uh, he's happy to retreat Magnus. There's no way to break that bind that he has on the queen side, on the dark squares. Magnus is actually ready to maybe swing his rook across the second rank, double up on the, def on the B file and uh, win a pawn that way. But he can expand on both sides of the board. I think you can safely just step forward there. Liam still struggling to move. It's just the clock. That's the one Achilles heel for Magnus, uh, potentially. Yeah. And uh, okay, Liam trying to get rooks off the board. He's defended well. It's still very, very difficult here for Black, but uh, he's still alive. That's, yeah. the, that's the first step. It's not pretty, but it's efficient. And uh, I'm assuming now that Liam will hold on to that b7 pawn, step the rook forward again. Ugly chess, but necessary. Yeah, and Black's knight isn't so stable, so there might be some tactics against that Black knight. Uh, there we go. Magnus grabs a pawn. The black B pawn now, if it takes that white bishop, will lose connection with its knight. So uh, this is a nice little tactic. Black's knight was most likely going to drop anyway. Liam tries to give it up for white's central pawn. But now, even if Magnus plays it simple, uh, simply, just takes that black knight off the board, as he has just done, we will see a scenario. It's that good knight against bad bishop. White's knight is on its perfect square. It's just completely controlling that black bishop. Uh, that black white square bishop still hasn't moved once in the game, and it's already moved 30. And there are massive threats against it now. White's rooks are coming in. Yeah, the white rook is threatening to come to b8, another one to d8. It's impossible to defend against them all. And uh, you have to bear in mind as well that uh, black's pawn on a6 is so weak, it's going to fall off. Yeah, in this good knight versus bad bishop scenario as well, even if all the rooks disappear, white has great winning chances, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, that's a dream for black. White's rooks are so much more active than their counterparts. So even if black gets, uh, you know, three or four moves, exchanges off all the rooks, you still have to suffer in that endgame. Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I'm struggling here to find a defense for black immediately, but also long term. Um, this is, again, almost a hopeless position. And Liam coming close to the one minute mark. Remember, he only gets three seconds added per move. So the heat is really on. Yep. And uh, Magnus here, even if he had 10 seconds, I think would feel very comfortable. White's next moves are very natural. You improve that white rook on B2, swing it up the board. He's going to move that one up now. Um, you can even just take a time out, step the white king to a, to a dart square. So there's no checks later from the black bishop. You can push pawns on either flank. You can even get greedy and grab the pawn in the middle. But I wouldn't necessarily advocate that, just because white has so much control. And uh, David, your move. Yeah, this, <laughs> it's not necessarily my move, but it's the move that I thought Magnus would play. Mm. It's so Magnus, that white A pawn stepping forward uh, to A4. And Liam, he's doubled up his rooks for the first time. But uh, before any checks happen, Magnus just steps forward. Has that A move become a trademark of Magnus, just like the H pawn move is a trademark of Simon Williams? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Magnus, I think pushing A4, pushing B4 and H4, Magnus seems to get those in all of his games nowadays. Yeah. It's just, I think, space gaining moves on the flanks. Those are his uh, trademark nowadays. And Yvanka, finally, Magnus gets greedy and grabs a pawn. Yeah. And I was just looking over at the game between Duda and Pragnanda, and you're right, David. <laughs> The player with the white pieces, <laughs> which is Duda, has the advantage, a very big advantage, I have wow, to say. Wow, already? Yep. Yeah, it's been a disastrous opening for Prague, taking a look at that one. Uh, but uh, they're still in the early stages, so we will have time to go over it later. Let's see if Magnus can grind out this endgame first. And uh, at least he has something tangible to show for his strategic advantage, Magnus. He's won a pawn already. Now, if he can get all the rooks off the board, that will signal the end. 
And, uh, OK, at least Black's getting active. I do really admire Liam for defending so actively and uh, so accurately so far. OK, a nasty trick here. If Black's rook on the d file goes back and captures White's isolated pawn in the middle, then White's rook on the b file will swing across. There's a threat of a check to the Black King from the front. And uh, that would be the end. Black's rook, Black's bishop, they're all tied down. So, OK, you had to run away from any checks. But now that bishop, how many escape squares do you have? Not many. One rook to trade. trade. And uh, there you go. Magnus steps forward with his king, protects the d4 pawn. And Liam has to handle the, a, the attack on the a pawn. And uh, Magnus just <laughs> advancing as far up the board with his pawns. I mean, this is just technique to its perfection. Yeah. The best endgame chess player in history, essentially, and that's... I mean, he's showing off all those skills right now. Look at White's pawns on the right side. They were just sitting at home just two, three moves ago. Suddenly, they've propelled forward. They're hitting some weaknesses. And we see the knight and bishop disappear. Magnus had a little tactic there with a little check. He won the black bishop. The white knight is gone. But look at Magnus. He's one pawn up in the middle of the board, that white d-pawn. But he's also guaranteed now to win that black a-pawn. And that will be a two-pawn advantage. And in rook end games, one pawn sometimes isn't enough to win, but two is more than enough. And the M is constantly playing with seconds on the clock here. Yeah, and even 20 minutes here wouldn't help the M. The position is very simplified. Those two white pawns together are just going to start stepping forward. Black also has severe weaknesses on this right side, and Magnus is going to cash in now on those weaknesses. Another check, and that black H pawn is dropping. Two connected pass pawns here. They're just going to march up the board. Hopeless. Wow. And Liam is going to resign any moment. This is just technical. This is very straightforward now. Uh, Magnus would win this in his sleep. Those two pawns cannot be stopped long term. Yeah. And uh, we're going to see a check from Magnus and probably another check. And now the White King steps forward and it is really no chance whatsoever for Liam to save this game. Yeah, we saw something similar from Magnus in his World Championship match in the playoff against Caruana. Uh, when he won with two extra pawns there. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, slowly but surely, you force the black king back, you start advancing the white pawns, then you shield your king from any checks by using the pawns as shelter. Uh, yeah, it's a matter of time in this game. Meanwhile, Duda and Prague, it's very tense. A lot of pieces still on the board there, so Ooh. we will jump over soon. But uh, we're waiting for Magnus to deliver the final blow. He's been a bit tentative here. He's uh, struggling to advance his pawns. Black is doing a good job of pinning one of the pawns on the third rank. I'm surprised Magnus is hesitating like this. Yeah, me too, because uh, the technique, as far as I know it, is kind of called the caterpillar. The pawns move very slowly forward, but uh, as David kind of highlighted, they use the rook is a shield, the pawns are a shield, and uh, the king takes a step back. Yeah. What is Very Magnus confusing doing? stuff from Magnus. You can win very directly. But uh, I think he wants to get his king around in front of the pawns. Uh, it's hard to explain, to be honest. He's going to give some checks to the black king as well uh, to dislodge it. But OK, the white king is checked back away. And now you can start advancing your pawns if you want to. Uh, I don't know if you want to rush, though. I wouldn't rush, but uh, okay, the black king will step forward. Mm -hmm. And the king finds a safe, a safe home on the side of the board. Yeah, this is very sneaky because if Black's rook now goes across and captures White's pawn Girl's on F3, say. then the White rook will just shuffle across one square, check, and the Black king and Black rook are on the same line. So there would have been a forced rook trade. Uh, so that pawn was poisoned. It was a trick. And, and here now, you go. The caterpillar formation is in action. Yeah, just inch forward, step by step. The White king comes forward. If the Black rook gives a bunch of checks, then White's king is going to hide in front of its F pawn. There we go. The pawns act as shelter. And uh, give us a check to the... And I'm expecting the rook to, I was going to say, all the way to the edge, but nope, not necessary. Yeah, the rook is getting ready to block some checks from the side. And, yeah, Liam still going strong, still testing Magnus, forcing him to play it out. Now a check. No. If the black rook captures this pawn, white's rook will go up and distract, deflect away the black king, and then the black rook would have dropped. That was a king, winning king and pawn end game. Uh, but yeah, nothing to be done. White's pawns are almost there now, and Liam does resign. Wow, it's over. Magnus takes uh, the first point in the Blitz tie breaks. Five minutes, and Blitz game number two will start. Liam will have the white pieces, and he will have to win it to take it to Armageddon. Magnus is in the lead after a great first Blitz game. 
he heads straight back to his lounge to prepare for that second blitz game. Second blitz game is going on between Prague and Duda. Prague took the first strike in their blitz battle, but now with the white pieces, bar is over to Duda's side. Is he making a comeback? He looks happier, at least. He looks more focused. Look on the camera. No more shaking of the head. <laughs> no more kind of self-remonstration there. Uh, he is fully focused. And on the board, on the face of things, it looks very complicated, looks very tense. But if we look at the pawn structure, black is a bit stuck. On the left side, it's hard to advance. The black rooks are fixed where they are for now. I think advancing pawns would only create weaknesses. White's king is safe. But it's on the other side where Duda is now pushing that black is struggling. Yeah. There's a clear target, the black king. Definitely. And there we see Duda advance the pawn just to secure the stronghold on f5. I really like this move, actually. At first, I was a bit hesitant. But now, I'm thinking this is perfect strategy because the knight is getting ready to jump in. It does. And after that, the h pawn is going to crack open a line. And let's not forget that there is an incredible pressure along the d line. Yeah, white's rooks are on a semi-open file. All eight pawns are still on the board for both sides, but look at the black rooks staring at their own pawns. Look at the white rooks staring down at one of the enemy pawns. Uh, so yeah, break open some lines and white's rooks are ready to pounce. Looking very, very good for Duda. It's level material, but the computer says plus four. And okay, he jumps in with his bishop. What is this? <laughs> he kicks the black rook into the corner and now he's going to try and trade off his bishop for knight. Black's knight is the only good piece. The, uh, the pride and joy of Black's position is about to get traded off. Yeah. And uh, Bragg allows that trade. There's really nothing he can do. <coughs> Expecting Bishop. Okay, the Queen moves over. Was he going to get greedy and go for those pawns? Yeah, he's playing on both sides of the board, Duda. He's hinting that he might attack the Black King, but when Black isn't ready, he's now going over at those undefended pawns on the left side. And I don't think Black can defend them. If you defend them with a Rook, then White's bishop was actually ready to come in and do some dislodging. So Prague, he's gambling now. He's just sacrificing a pawn. He's trying to go for White's king, but White's king looks pretty safe. You're going to be a pawn down now as Prague, no matter what. So all White's queen needs to do, I, I would just take one square to the left, stop the advance of this black A pawn. Yeah, me too. That's uh, what I have, the eyes on the prize. You know, the action is happening in the center and it's all these weaknesses. And he steps forward with the queen. Yeah, uh, also good, it looks like, but slightly more risky because Black's A-pawn can start motoring. Also allows a pin from Prague. Okay, White's Queen instead is jumping in. It looks like the Black Pawn structure is just going to collapse. Note how all the Black Pawns are on dark squares. They're easy pickings for White's Bishop. One second for Prague. Oh, Ooh. desperation now. This Pawn can be captured, or it can be bypassed, or even more powerful. Look at that White Pawn on C7. It was forking the two Black Rooks. One of them jumps out the way, but when this black rook moves, white's rook's ready to start grabbing pawns. Prague is going to resign. This one's going straight to Armageddon. Wow! Wow! We're going to see the first Armageddon of the tour finals. Uh, Duda makes a comeback here in the Blitz tie breaks. And uh, you mentioned it, David. All the games in this match has ended up with a win for white. So is there any question even what Duda will choose in the Armageddon? Duda should choose the white pieces. Uh, you get an extra minute on the clock and you have the psychological advantage of having won three games with white already today. Wow, it looks like uh, white is in fashion over yeah. there in San Francisco. Wow, they're gonna have five minutes now, maybe only four minutes. Prague decides to stay in the arena to get ready for that Armageddon. Before that starts, we're going to follow Blitz game number two for Magnus Carlsen and uh, Liam Le Magnus in the lead there. It's going to start in a few minutes. In the meantime, I think we can head down to San Francisco. No. Nope. All right. Prague decides to head out and get ready Ooh, for that uh, Armageddon against uh, Duda. Blitz game number two for Magnus should start very shortly. Magnus with the black pieces in that. Liam has to make a comeback in that one. What should he do, Ivanka? He just has to go hard. Go high, hard or go home. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't really have any choice. He has to win. So the only way we've ever seen Magnus lose is when people put him under pressure, when they make him feel uncomfortable. If he does do that, Magnus will be in his element. Yeah. And that's it. 
He's coming here, Magnus, arriving for Blitz game number two. What do you think, David? Will this be decided now or will we see Armageddon in this one as well? It's very likely to be decided. Uh, Liam will have to do what very few people on the planet are capable of doing. And that's striking back against Magnus when he's confident and Magnus looks very focused. We do see Liam start with the Queen's Pawn. His last white game earlier in the Rapids, Liam, wasn't so impressive. He was under pressure the whole time there. But he did win once already today with white Liam. So he will have fond memories of uh, one of their earlier Rapid games. Magnus, meanwhile, playing the Bogo Indian, giving a check, <laughs> swapping off the Dark Square Bishops. Bogo Indian, that's a fun opening name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also incredibly solid what Magnus has done. And he's just saying, hey, I'm happy to give White a very small advantage, but my position, look at it, totally solid. Pawn takes knight is uh, more or less forced. Oh, he takes with the bishop. Yep, and these structures you usually want to capture with pieces in the center. This is similar to what Magnus did a few games ago, uh, where he made that draw against Liam in a long bishop endgame. And uh, Liam now, he's come prepared. He's played very quickly up to this point. Former World Blitz champion, remember? So he's got uh -huh. experience of winning some crucial Blitz games against the world's best players. Also, White is very flexible. White can attack on the C file. There's an open C file. White's rook looks great there. And... Uh, if black isn't careful, there might be some ideas against the black king side. Black's king doesn't have too many defenders. Yeah. There's an immediate threat right now. Mm -hmm. um, Liam can actually move his queen once square along the side and uh, line up the bishop and the queen and also line up the queen and the rook, threatening c7 and h7. Oh, black has two very vulnerable pawns, so I'm expecting Magnus to either protect his uh, C-pawn somehow, maybe move it, or maybe move the H-pawn. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like a comfortable position. Despite the fact the evaluation bar says it's level, it's certainly White who's putting on the pressure. Uh, as soon as White gets castled as well, as soon as the White King runs to safety, it's all about Black's weaknesses. And Magnus down a minute and a half on the clock already, and it's only move 10, uh, move 11. He doesn't look happy. Doesn't look like a successful opening for Black, at least in terms of ease of uh, the position. Okay, he does push that pawn. Yvanka mentioned that pawn was potentially vulnerable. Uh, so a good start, seemingly. Mm -hmm. We see Prague in the background, pacing there. He is getting ready for Armageddon against Duda. Duda has chosen to start with, uh, or play the Armageddon with the white pieces. Remember, all the games in that match has ended up with a win for the player with the white pieces and white uh, pieces in Armageddon. Remind us what that means, David. So Armageddon chess, white will have five minutes, black will have four minutes, so a full minute less. There's no increment, but white has to win. A draw will count as a win for black. And that game will start in about two minutes. Prague is just getting in the mode, pacing back and forth. And Magnus, he is playing now blitz game number two. You said he seemed a little worried, Magnus. Is it likely Liam will win this game? I'm not sure about likely, but it's definitely possible mm -hmm. because Magnus has been forced to sacrifice a pawn and Magnus clearly, by choosing this opening, wants to play it safe, but that wasn't allowed. Liam has found a way to unbalance it. Black's C-pawn was just too weak, so Magnus threw it forward. Now he's getting active with his knight. With best play, it does look like white should have a way to consolidate the extra pawn. Computer says plus one because you're a pawn up, but for Liam, the white king is still stuck in the middle. You're stranded there. Also, white's queen is a bit of a target. Black's rook is going to come to the c-file and start hitting that white queen. So uh, there are certainly some uh, obstacles to overcome. What do you think, Ivanka? Good chances for white? I think very good chances for white. But like you say, you know, he has to navigate this particular phase of the game. Because you can just see a scenario where lines can open and the king is stuck in the middle, as you mentioned. There is the possibility of the bishop capturing the knight, ruining the pawn structure. And uh, this is why Liam has attacked the bishop. Bishop has to take Ooh. one step back. I mean, where are you going to put the bishop now? I look at it <laughs> closely. Yeah, maybe you have to retreat the whole way back yeah. to b7. Uh, Magnus shaking his head. Maybe he missed this move or underestimated it. The bishop certainly is in a bit of trouble. Not too many safe squares. I think you have to be really sneaky, really clever, just to keep this bishop alive. And uh, you have to maybe walk into what looks like a fork. Ooh, you're living life on the edge here if you're Magnus Carlsen. Mm -hmm. It's not really the position that you want. I think the bishop is ultimately fine, but uh, OK, some calculation is needed. And that will cost time. And on the clock, two minutes down, Magnus. 
So two minutes down on the clock, one minute down on the board, uh, one pawn down, sorry, on the board. Uh, computer says he's fine now, but you have to be very careful. Your bishop's almost trapped. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can get greedy and capture white's pawn in the corner there on a2 uh, on that diagonal. I think you will get trapped if you jump in. Yeah. I think you have to retreat, but yeah. Magnus is reluctant. Yeah, sometimes there's just, you have to go back. Two um, minutes though, it's uh, really scary times. So there's still plenty of complications ahead. What is he thinking about? I mean, both both retreats are fine. Yeah, but you have to choose one. Yep. You have to retreat the bishop. He's frozen, Magnus. He spent nearly half his time on this just one move. Whoa. And uh, even if you survive the next few moves, even if you keep the black bishop on the board and don't lose it, suddenly you're facing an uphill battle. Only three second increment after every move. That's not a lot. Yeah. Armageddon has started between Prague and Duda. Duda with uh, the white pieces and Prague with the black pieces in this game. Ooh, when it comes to Armageddon, I have to say that as an observer, my nerves start to jangle yeah. because you know that there's no added time. Yeah. And uh, as soon as the clock starts ticking down, you're just like, OK, oh, my God, uh, you can feel the emotions and the pressure and the tension that the players are facing. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you just pray that the person that you're cheering for is very good with the mouse. Yeah. Both of the two players sitting in San Francisco are in the lead, so to speak. We're in the lead. Uh, Magnus in the lead here. He only needs a draw in this game, but he's struggling, especially on the clock. Prague took the lead in the Blitz. He lost the second one. And uh, now the Armageddon has started. The, the match between Duda and Prague will be decided in this game. What do you think about this one? Will we see another Armageddon? It's certainly possible because Magnus has given up a second pawn. He's now two pawns down and uh, Liam does have a move. So Liam can choose to castle his king at some point, maybe now. Uh, he, can he choose to be greedy? I'm not sure. He does choose to be <laughs> greedy. He's now three pawns up Liam and he's calling Magnus's bluff. Magnus has put the black rook opposite the white queen, but there's no direct attack and maybe no way to profit from that. White is just three pawns up and you can win one pawn back, sure but can you win them all back? Mm -hmm. Unclear. Very Magnus, unclear. Yeah, struggling on time. Three minutes down now, under the one minute mark. Yeah, it just looks like a disastrous opening choice from Magnus Carlsen. a check, and I'm expecting Liam just to sidestep that check with the queen, block it. Yeah, you can block that check. It looks very safe. Force the black queen to make a decision. I mean, if you're feeling very fruity, you can step up with a king, but I would not do anything <laughs> like that. Yeah, you can move the white king, but then you're eternally <laughs> going to worry about uh, getting attacked in the centre of the board. So, yeah, it looks like a very safe option. Just block with the queen. What else could be, uh, could be considered here by Liam? You don't really want to throw a pawn in the way. OK, he does block with the white queen, and now surely the white king is going to castle. You have to run to safety. If yeah. you leave it too much longer, you might come under fire. Mm -hmm. OK, three minutes against less than one minute. He does finally castle. So now black's just two pawns down. You're attacking two pawns, however, yourself. White's pawn in the middle, not entirely safe. Now targeted by black's bishop and knight. Black's A and B, uh, sorry, white's A and B pawns. Those are the potential winners, but they're still a mile away from promotion. And they are a bit vulnerable at the moment. Yeah, and I have to say, those are the pawns that you must preserve. I think the pawn in the middle, you can just abandon. Just as long as you keep your two pawn advantage on the left, White has all the chances to win, and Liam goes for that. And uh, there we see Black capture the pawn in the middle. Yeah, now the White Queen is attacked. She could give herself up for two she rooks. Does. She has done this. So right now, we do see this awkward situation of Queen versus two rooks. It's never clear who that favours. White does have those pawns on the left side, but without the Queen, it might become, in practical terms, more difficult. Objectively, this should be winning for white. The rooks should be able to combine, but it's often hard in blitz chess to uh, coordinate two rooks together. And, uh, okay, Liam moves his rook across, defending his bishop. Magnus was shaking his head there, so he can't be feeling too confident. It's just difficult to attack those two white pawns, but I do fear for Liam somehow. I always hate losing control, queen versus two rooks, because those positions, they turn every few moves. You look at a computer, we'll see the evaluation bar start swinging left and right. Um, it's so hard to fight against a queen accurately. Yeah. And Black will start going for the white king with his queen, knight and pawns. Yeah, clock is ticking for Magnus. Uh, there's so much drama going on right now. We don't want to miss it. Will you guys shout out if we should jump over to the Armageddon, which is just super dramatic. Duda with white has to win it. 
Yeah, that one is a really dry end game. It looks like Duda has a small advantage, but it's all about the clock. Um, we'll I think maybe we can wait a little bit with yeah. the with the Duda Prague game. Yeah. And we'll stick with uh, Magnus and Prague. Uh, sorry, Magnus and Liam. As soon as one of the players ticks around the one minute mark, I think we'll have to jump over to that game. Okay. It's all about the clock. But right now, that game is just slow maneuvering. Uh, neither side breaking through. So Duda and Prague. I think their nerves are just going right now. Looks like Duda's trying to play on the clock uh, for victory. <laughs> Meanwhile, this one, Magnus has started pushing some pawns. Now the knight is coming. <coughs> if the black queen and knight can team up, combine together, I seriously fear for the white king. This is the problem when you are facing the black queen or facing a queen in general. Can you keep your king safe? Right now, it looks fine for white, but the storm is brewing. Yeah. Pawns are flying forward soon. Yeah, I think uh, Liam was a bit remiss to allow the knight to attack the rook like this. And uh, here comes, here comes the attack, as you've mentioned. Yeah, those pawns are stepping forward. White is now forced onto the defensive. Look at White's rooks. They're just not impressive at all. And uh, the E pawn is joined by the F pawn, which will soon be joined by other pawns. Black's knight looking pretty strong as well. Even if it gets kicked back, it's got a clear route. Now it's going to go into the centre, surely. It has to. And uh, it's actually very difficult to recommend a move for Liam because what he wants to do is just get on with the job of pushing those pawns. But he cannot do that. Yeah, as soon as you push one of those two white pawns, the other one will become more weak. And uh, suddenly the evaluation bar says this has turned. No more advantage for white. I think you were right, Yvanka. He could have just kept control, given back a pawn, and kept queens on the board, or at least kept his queen. Look at Black's Knight now, by far the best piece on the board. It's got its tentacles everywhere, attacking a bunch of pawns, but Liam has started to run forward with his guys, his past pawns now. That has left weaknesses behind that Magnus is going to target. Yeah. Bar is now for the first time <clears throat> swinging to Magnus' side. Yeah, and I think it's, it is marking the complete turn in the nature of the position. Liam previously had a three minute time advantage almost, but that has completely disappeared. He's only 30, 40 seconds up on the clock now. Black's queen is really versatile. She can attack those two white pawns on the left. She can also swing across onto the G line and start going for the white king at the right moment. White is completely stuck. You said it, Ivanka. Yeah. Can barely move. Certainly can barely move. And remember, Liam is in a must win situation. He needs to make some progress. And uh, meanwhile, the players are ticking around the one minute mark. And I hear in that's what's Duda happening. Yeah. Pragnanda game. Should, should we jump over? We should jump over. This game might still go for quite a while. Okay. So we have to watch the time scramble in yeah. that Armageddon. All right. We're going into Armageddon between Duda and Prag. Duda started with more time. He has to win this game to win the match. A draw is enough for Prag. A draw is enough for Prague, and I think if this were a classical game, if this were even a game with any increment, this would be a draw. Look how blocked it is. It's the same number of pawns, it's a rook end game, no pawn breaks for either side. But it's a race on time, and Duda's just making moves. At this point, he just has to make random moves. There's no time advantage, really. It's less than 10 second difference between the two. And he has to make sure he does not repeat the position three times because the game will be automatically declared a draw. Ooh. So he has to manoeuvre in a very smart way. And you just saw the players there play <laughs> instantly. Yeah, and uh, I'm just trying to count because the last pawn push was quite a long time ago. And uh, yeah, I mean, here Duda needs to push a pawn at some point. He's got to make sure he pushes White's G pawn, perhaps, for example, before the 50 move rule. Uh, because otherwise the game's declared a draw. Look at this, they're just going back and forth, no progress to be made, and... And there's uh, drama! Liam Lee has suddenly won the second Blitz game against Magnus Carlsen to take that one to Armageddon. Wow, we will show the end of that game a bit later, but uh, look at this time scramble now. Yeah, Magnus, it looks like he blew it. He got overexcited and Duda's smiling now, and oh! he, blund he blunders into a repetition of the position. It's a draw. It's automatically a draw. He blunders into repetition. That is crazy. Prague wins the match in Armageddon with a draw. In that final game, he takes two points against the Iron Christ of Duda to win this match. Incredible ending. Heading out, let's hear from Prague. Prague, you won. What a match this was. Went down to the wire. Joy, relief. What are you feeling? No, finally, I'm happy that Black survived in this game. 
because okay white was just winning uh, all the six games okay this game he was trying to flag me at the end but i i think i was okay. i was fast at least okay i couldn't like move with the pieces maybe you should try f6 and try to flag me but uh, it would have been a time scramble there like uh, like like a bullet but fortunately for me it was just a, like he didn't try f6 and i just could wait uh, normally were you a bit nervous that he might actually try to flag you in this absolutely equal position yeah i think he was trying uh, at the last position but i was happy to see that i got to like we, we were both around like 5 second margin so i thought it's possible that i can flag him i knew he's also an online player so it, it might have been a uh, uh, fun for the audience but not for us uh, but okay for me fortunately it was just a draw Wow, you really kept your control over your nerves in that one. You mentioned that White was so decisive throughout the match. All the wins were with white pieces. Prag, before you went into the Armageddon choosing the colors, was that a thought in your mind that maybe I should pick White? No, I didn't pick. So, like, he was uh, second in the two standing, so he, ha he has to pick every, every time. Um, but actually, I, I didn't uh, rate my chances I in the... <laughs> in the in the arm around because white was crashing all the games like god is getting much better position out of the opening and also i'm down by a minute and every time one of us was getting low on time so it didn't and also there's no increment additionally so i didn't think that i would make it this game but okay i managed to somehow exchange trade everything and uh, get to this rook and name do you feel like if you had to pick the colors you might have chosen white considering there were no draws in the entire match yeah definitely i would have pick, picked white yeah Right, and uh, beating Duda, you've definitely had uh, some history there, lots of fighting chess. How does it feel to finally emerge uh, victorious? I'm also very happy to win a match finally, um, because, yeah, I just, uh, I'm just having a tough tournament, uh, this one. But I felt like my game quality wasn't too bad. Uh, but okay, today I don't think I played uh, well uh, at all, like, I, I was playing decent. Um, but yeah, he just gave me chances in the uh, with the white pieces, so I just took it. In the rapid portion, Prague, you had to play catch up uh, the entire match. I want to ask you when there's a little break going on, and we know Ramesh is here. Give us a little sneak peek into what happens. How do you keep control and your nerves for the game coming up? No, we just try to see what to play for the next game, and um, that's the main thing because to put pressure with the white is important. And uh, yeah. Uh, and I was just like at, at some point I think for the fourth game I had like 20 minutes gap but I was just not in a mood to prepare too much so I just looked at it for five minutes and then started to look at the other games and yeah just try to relax and that's, that's the thing I think and finally will you go to the basketball game tonight to celebrate a bit no not to celebrate just to relax <laughs> um, but I don't think it's the ideal opponent tomorrow uh, <laughs> to have the basketball match today but I think I'm going to watch the match. Say Magnus tomorrow. Yeah. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, it's going to be fun uh, as always and hope to play some good chess tomorrow as well. You're always excited about that matchup. Enjoy the evening and good luck for tomorrow, Prague. Thank you. Look at the reaction from Duda blundering into a move repetition. Can you see how furious he is? He had to win it because it was Armageddon. He had the white pieces. But a move repetition means Prague, with a draw, wins the match to take two points. The Armageddon with Magnus will start very shortly. Yeah, here he comes. So we will show what happened in that game after the Armageddon with Magnus against Liam. Magnus has chosen as well, just like Duda, to play with the white pieces. <clears throat> that means he will have one minute more on the clock and uh, he will have to win the game. Liam Lier will win the match with a draw. Oh, this is an intense way to finish it. What do you expect from Magnus with the white pieces? And Armageddon. Well, he has to be quick. Yeah. <laughs> That's rule number one. Um, I'm expecting him just to play his normal game. You know, he has that benefit of that extra minute and he's very skilled in these type of situation. He knows how to apply pressure on his opponent. And it will be up to Liam Le who has to withstand the storm. No increment, remember, in Armageddon. 
they have the time that they start out with and uh, Magnus will have five minutes, right? Magnus will have five, Liam will have four. So we see the clock times above the players. Yeah. Those will be corrected in a moment. And it's just fast, it's just furious, it's all about the speed. And uh, as we saw in that Duda versus Prague game, it's all about the mouse skills. And uh, we'll see the moves come flying on the board. It's the Spanish <coughs> opening, which we saw earlier today between these two. Magnus allows the open Spanish. If Black captures in the center, he does. But Magnus chooses a different variation than the first rapid game of the day. And uh, this is mainline theory. This is very well-known stuff. White's pawn stepping forward now. Uh, will we see Black capture in a moment on this square? This is, I think, called the Dilworth variation. Uh, it's very, very tactical stuff. Magnus has barely spent any time. Liam's barely spent any time. Uh, I've seen both players have this position in rapid games on the tour. Right now, there was a sacrifice there by Black, but Black has given up two pieces. In return, he got a rook and two pawns. So if we do a count, Black is actually one point up, but White's minor pieces are phenomenal. White's minor pieces are very strong. And I remember a game Magnus beat Hans Niemann on the tour earlier this season with the white side uh -huh. uh, of this opening. Yep. I also remember that game. I also remember Liam Le also playing this with the black pieces against Jordan Van Forest. And the two are still playing into the main line. This has all been seen before. Knight goes to the edge of the board. And uh, the main line is actually for the queen to move one square across the diagonal to threaten to pin the queen and rook. Yeah, I'm really surprised by this decision by Magnus. He's played into an opening. He knows that Liam has studied in depth. Liam has played all of these moves almost instantly. And uh, it's very theoretical. Black should be fine. Black's pawns in the middle of the board look great. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just so complicated, so uh, hard to put a finger on in terms of what the plan should be. Often it's just move by move. And there it's just about pure speed. Maybe Magnus is playing on the clock. But uh, yeah, I think objectively, maybe it would have been a safer decision to play something really kind of strange where he is simply stronger than Liam, especially with the extra minute. And I can tell you that uh, by Liam retreating that night, he's gone into his own preparation. So the, no one had ever played that move before. And Liam, this is his ho home cooked idea. And he moves his king to the edge of the board, getting out of the eye line of the light squared bishop. This is a, I think this is a good blitz approach. Mm -hmm. Oh. Magnus, however, is starting to create some threats. So Black's king is much safer now, but it did cost a valuable move, a valuable tempo. And White's queen, White's knight, White's bishops, they're all perfectly placed to attack those Black pawns in the middle of the board. Uh, all White needs to do, really, is to start improving his knight at the bottom. The White knight next to his king is not doing anything. That's why the bishop steps back. The White knight is going to actually jump to the square that that bishop previously uh, occupied. So, uh, yeah, it's very tense. Does black touch any of those pawns in the center of the board? If you touch those black pawns, you might weaken squares. Uh, so yeah, it's really difficult for Liam. The time situation, still more than a minute advantage for Magnus. So that is already critical. That could play a huge part in the result. Yeah, and uh, Liam facing pressure in the center. He has to defend his pawns. So that's why he steps forward with the bishop. It's a good move. Just breaking the coordination between the rook, knight and queen. Um, Magnus will be itching to give up his rook for this bishop. It's just, I, I've talked to Magnus enough times, he wants to sacrifice, he hates his opponents having nice pawn structures. He's going to be very tempted to use his rook and sacrifice it for the bishop, doubling up black's pawns in the center. But I don't think you should get carried away with anything flashy here. You just need to play quickly, keep the pace. He's still a minute ahead, although that's ticking down now. The white knights can move. You can protect one knight with the other knight, for example. Um, you have lots of ideas here for white, but you just need to trust your instinct. He slowed down. He slowed down. I, I reckon he's uh, considering your move. Rook takes bishop. That's why he's paused for thought. And uh, he's got his music on. But in Armageddon, you shouldn't get carried away. Even if it's a strong move, even if sacrificing here, getting that black bishop off the board, even if it's good, why waste one whole minute of an Armageddon game on that? Just play a simple move. Move one of the white knights. And he's now only got 20 second time advantage over Liam Le. And he has to make a move. I, I think he has to commit to something. You know, I, for me, I would be springboarding with my knight to g5. Yep. Just put some pressure on that bishop. Uh, gosh, 
He spent he's, a minute and a half on one move. It's Armageddon. There's no increment. He's now down on the clock, Magnus Carlsen, and he has to win this game. And then he plays maybe the most natural move on the board. He, he could have played this instantly. He defends one knight with the other one. And uh, now the queens are coming off the board, however. So we saw an exchange. Magnus shook his head. Maybe that was just because of how slow he was playing. It looks like he's still fine on the board. You can trade off the queens if you want to on along that diagonal. The white knight can move away. It still looks like white is stable with his minor pieces. And uh, Liam's pawn on d5 is being attacked, so he has to defend that, perhaps attack the bishop, the knight, sorry. The knight jumps forward, also very good. And uh, Liam has a time advantage over Magnus. That is going to be huge, that time advantage. It could play a huge role the clock because it's such a block position suddenly. It's very similar, actually, in terms of mentality to that Prague versus Duda Armageddon. It's going to come down to a position that's blocked, and it's just about who's quicker on the mouse. And, OK, we do see an exchange of pawns. I'm not 100% sure about that from Liam because now it's slightly less blocked. Uh, he could have maybe just locked things down and played on the clock, but now can you kick away White's knight from the centre? That is the key. Black's rooks need to find open lines. You need to get towards those two white pawns on the left, for example. But how do you do that? If white stabilizes, if white secures his knight in the center, then Magnus is just in control. And now it's Liam's turn to have a think while he considers what to do, and he pushes the A pawn. So he's got the same idea as you, David. He wants to attack the B pawn, but yeah, maybe too slow. It's very, very slow, and Magnus is now going to start jumping forward, attacking a weak pawn, mm -hmm. that black pawn on the A5 square that Liam has just kind of put there as a target. Magnus is going to try and grab it. And suddenly it's Liam. He's playing with fewer pieces, remember. A rook is not as good as a bishop and knight. So uh, black has two rooks, white has three pieces to play with. It's slightly easier the more pieces you have in general, despite what the pawn count is. And uh, Magnus, he's insisting, he's stubborn, he's going after that black A pawn. And uh, now 35 second time advantage. Yeah, maybe the clock will decide this game. On the board, it's still looking good for white, however. That moment where Magnus froze for one and a half minutes, maybe he spent the time well, just uh, choosing a safe variation. Yeah, and Liam now under a minute, 50, 49 seconds on the clock, and he's just struggling both on and off the board. Oh, tricky times, he has to speed up. I mean, regardless of what he has to do. Okay, so he gives up the A pawn, fine. But just uh, keep on making those moves, keep on putting pressure on Magnus. Now, this pawn will be captured, however. Uh, Magnus, I think, is just going to take it back with his own pawn. The one thing that white should not do is exchange a set of rooks now. If you take with white's rook, then you're only left with your minor pieces. Normally, you want one of everything. You, Oh, wow, he really does push his rook forward and capture. Normally, you want to keep pieces on the board, and <laughs> Liam now complicates the issue by throwing his pawn forward. Now, his idea is to go for checkmate. He's going for the white king. I thought he would just exchange rooks. I thought maybe he would be OK there, but... Uh, Magnus finds a nice counter-attacking move. Rather than retreat the white bishop, he's forcing off a trade of rooks. He has won two pawns in the process, so now it's OK to swap rooks. And uh, now that those have left the board, Liam is left with a ruined position. He's down on material, he's down on the clock. 20 seconds, it's not enough. It's not enough, no. He, and look at him, he just moves his king. And uh, white has the dream position. The bishop and knight are coordinating beautifully, and he captures a pawn. I mean, more or less, Magnus can play anything because with 19, 18 seconds left on the clock, there's nothing Liam can do. Yeah, he just lost the speed at the wrong moment, Liam, and a couple of blunders happened where he lost pawns due to the situation on the clock. And Magnus, he's reasserted control. Everything's uh, defended. OK, he grabbed another pawn. It's just, uh, it was like hungry hippos. Magnus grabbed one pawn, another pawn, another pawn, another pawn. All of Black's pawns have disappeared. And Liam, rather than try and race on the clock, he has resigned. Magnus takes the win. Wow. <laughs> what a dramatic match. It ends up with a win for Magnus Carlsen in Armageddon. He takes two points winning in the, the Blitz and Armageddon tie breaks. Let's hear from the leader of the Tour Finals. Magnus, your fifth match win in a row. This one went down to the wire. Were you ever in doubt of today's match win? Um, no, I mean, it was uh, the blitz was really poor. So, um, but uh, I felt in the um, in the Armageddon game that uh, I, I'm not so sure about his choice of opening because I feel like.
generally it's be uh, it's easier to have the uh, minor pieces there in Blitz. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't play it perfectly. Like, also, I, I spent like one and a half minutes at one point calculating a line when I went knight e2 if it goes knight c5, and then he just took an f3 immediately, which is uh, which sort of sort of shocked me. But um, so that rattled me for like a little bit. But felt even after the, even after that position is easier to play for me, and he couldn't really uh, change gears in in time. There has this match been playing with Liam, your first Armageddon of this uh, event so far. Overall, just summarize it for us. Yeah, it was clearly a lot tougher than uh, some of the other matches. So. Um, yeah, it was a combination of him playing good match and me not really finding my rhythm after the first game. So I gotta gotta do better in the last two matches. Is it fair to say that it's a race for second place now? Well, I'm. I can clinch it with a win tomorrow, that's nice, um, but uh, no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. One more question. You've already won the tour, one event to spare. Um, how big a motivation is it to win this last event as well and finish with a bank? Well, I wanted to go perfect, so I can't do that anymore. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I'll, um, I really want to really wanna win the tournament. And are you going for the basketball game tonight? Yes, I am. Uh, who will you be rooting for, the Knicks or the Golden State Warrior? I'll be rooting for uh, the uh, the Warriors, uh, but either way, hoping for um, for an exciting uh, game. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be fun to to see. I mean, the Warriors have been terrible, but a lot better at home than uh, away. So hopefully, they can uh, put up a good fight. And tomorrow you're playing against Prague. That's always a matchup that we're always looking forward to. Your thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, they're, the matches usually end up being really fighting and chaotic, so I'll, um, you know, try to deal with that. Enjoy the evening. Thank Thanks. He's going to get to go to a much-deserved basketball game. Magnus Carlsen celebrating his uh, fifth match win, but this was the first uh, day where he actually gave up a point because he won it in tie breaks. And... Uh, it was dramatic. Time uh, was ticking so fast. So first, let's take a look at this final Armageddon game that Magnus had to win and that he did win. Yeah, there were many highlights, but Magnus mentioned the key moment in his interview there. He tanked, he froze for one and a half minutes in an Armageddon game. That is uh, really risky stuff. And here, eventually, he did settle on his first instinct. He brought his knight forward, defending his own knight, but also attacking this bishop in the center. And he was annoyed at himself because he said he spent the whole one and a half minutes calculating what would happen if black brought his knight forward. This was the best move, defending this bishop in the center, also threatening to jump in. But Liam surprised Magnus here by not playing the best move, by simply capturing the knight. This actually meant Magnus wasted one and a half minutes calculating the wrong variation, but it was a a bad decision objectively for black. White simply recaptured and a queen trade actually favored white. White's minor pieces, especially this knight in the center, were able to stabilize and they overpowered the rooks later on. Never take Magnus into an endgame. That was seemingly the key. Yeah. All right, and that was the Armageddon. Now, before that, Magnus won the first blitz game and then came the second blitz game, which Liam had to win to take it to the Armageddon. We were following the Armageddon then between Duda and Prague, so we didn't get to see the dramatic changes in that game. What happened when Liam was able to win that game? Yeah, and that game, it all spun on one move. We left it when we said Magnus was taking over, Magnus is gonna cruise, Magnus's queen was better than the white rooks, but in this position, just the moment we left it actually, Liam played a very sneaky knight retreat. He dropped back the white knight and Magnus spotted a pawn and he grabbed a pawn, but greed was not good here. He took this pawn with the black queen and as we saw in the game, after knight takes knight, suddenly white's rook was able to stabilize behind the passed pawn and there's nothing to be done. Black's queen cannot fight against the two white rooks and this pawn marching up the board. Magnus was unable to stop that pawn from promoting and just as it made a new queen, he resigned a few moves later. If instead he'd kept the knights on the board, not been greedy by grabbing that pawn, he would most likely have won and avoided the Armageddon. For example, Black's Knight can retreat to stay safe. It can even drop into the white camp to find a safe square and Black would have been in charge here. So a huge turnaround and a reason to never exchange your active pieces for passive ones with these two knights. 
And that mean that meant we did see Armageddon. We haven't seen many Armageddons this season on the Meltwater Champions Chess Tour. Today we had two of them. Duda and Prague also went all the way to Armageddon. Duda chose to play with the white pieces and he had to win that game. It ended with huge frustration and fury from young Christoph Duda because he blundered into a move repetition. I don't think I've ever said that sentence before. How is that possible? What did he do? <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's very rare, especially for the type of repetition that happened uh, in that Armageddon game. We saw both players around the 20, 30 second mark, and uh, it started around here. White, Duda, pushed this pawn forward with a check. This was move 43. And uh, if we fast forward to the final move, move 90, nearly 50 moves later, look at the pawns. Ignore the rooks, but look at the pawns. They haven't moved. The pawn structure is the same. We were about to see the 50 move rule, but with Duda's last move, it was actually a mistake, bringing his rook to d2, because we'd seen this position 30 moves ago. We'd also seen this move position almost 20 moves ago. So even though the position had repeated itself three times, it was spread across 30 moves. Duda had forgotten about that, of course. He was just moving as quickly as possible at this point, but it was a threefold repetition. It doesn't matter when the repetition happened, and the game was automatically declared a draw. Wow, what an ending to that match as well. And let's take a look at the results here from the fifth day in the Tour Finals. Two matches was decided in the rapid portion. Wesley So took all three points against Mamad Yarov and Ergaisi took all three points against Anish Giri. But the two other matches went all the way to tie breaks and eventually Magnus two points against Liam and Prague two points against Duda. So let's take a look at the standings in the Tour Finals with two days left to play. Magnus Cross now has a four-point lead down to Jan Kristoff Duda. There are still six points to play for. Wesley So five points behind Magnus on nine. And Liam, eight points. Chances that Magnus will not win it right now, David. What do you think? Chances are slim, he's yes. a huge favourite. And as he said in the interview, if he beats Pragdananda in the rapid section tomorrow, he's won it already, yeah. he's wrapped it up. So he, well, Wesley and Duda, they will need Prag to do them a favour by taking some points off yeah. Magnus. What do you expect from the weekend coming up, Joanka? A lot of fun, a lot of excitement, a lot of thrillers, and uh, maybe a lot more Armageddons. Yeah, maybe. Let's take a look at the matches coming up uh, tomorrow. Day six in the Tour Finals. Duda now up against Wesley. So Wesley's been on fire over the last few days. Prague against Magnus Carlsen. This is a big one. It's been a big one throughout the season on the Tour. And it's going to be a huge match tomorrow. Liam Le takes on Arjun Ergaisi tomorrow. And Anish Giri takes on Shakriad Mamadiarov. It's been a very fun day of chess. We have also focused a lot on the very new Magnus Chess Academy app that launched today. Magnus, in our challenge, was able to score 39 cards. And in San Francisco, they have been trying to beat that score. And let's see if someone was able to. Christopher has reached the big level 12. This is where he's going to be taking on the other players of the Meltwater Champions chess store in Ace in the Sleeve. Are you ready, Christopher? Yes. What about your warm-up? Are you ready with your warm-up? Are you yes. done with it? Yes, I'm done with my warm-up. Okay, let's go. You've got three minutes to, to uh, break Magnus in this one. Okay. I'm feeling the pressure a little bit, but let's go. As they say, no pressure, but full pressure. First, I need to understand the rules of this, so... Okay, it's a not not too difficult of a start, but I'm sure it's gonna get harder. He's on on the second exercise right now. He's managed to find the mate, not bad. Christopher, it's getting tougher. Yes, it's already getting difficult. I am kind of stumped on this one, and I'm panicking. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Panicking's never good. Yes, I agree. He's got ah. You gotta rush. <laughs> Will he find the checkmate? I am not gonna find it on this one, so I'm gonna just skip it. He's skipping it, that is not a good sign. I'm not even kidding, this is so much harder than it looks. Okay. He's down to two minutes and he's got 27, not bad. Not a bad score at all. Another 12 points to beat Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna skip this one because I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to skip the hard ones so I can solve the easier ones quickly. 
That's some good game strategy right there. How's it going? Going well. I'm just give this one too difficult. Wow, he's at 45 and he's got about a minute and a half on the clock. Going well. Strategy seems like it's working. Oh my god, I think I whatever. Let's just skip it. Just keep doing it. <laughs> What's your score goal? That's not check me. Okay, there we go. Uh 100. A hundred? That would be a world record. Oh my god. Okay, now you're now I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'm getting one hundred. Okay, on the I'm gonna have to skip this Time one. Pressure. It's, it's too Let's difficult. Go. Uh, what is this? When a grandmaster starts stumbling and struggles with this, you know it's a cool app. Okay, nice. I got an easy one. Let's go. Okay, this is also an easy one. Come on, come on. What is this? What is this? Skip? Yeah, skip, skip. I don't know what that is. Okay. Not bad, uh, he's at 72. 72. And that's it, outstanding! Outstanding performance by Christopher Yu. 72 beats the house. Well done, Chris. How are you feeling? Great. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Christopher. Wow, not only did he beat Magnus Carlsen, he beat the high score and the so far world record in the ace in the sleeve. And Ishgiri had 69, but Christopher, you 72. Can you beat that? Download the Magnus Chess Academy app and test out uh, the game Ace in the Sleeve. If you get to level 12, you can try to beat these Grandmasters. It's been such a fun day of chess and it continues tomorrow, round six in the tour finals. We'll see you then. Bye for now.